made by Zephyr Odin Audiobook. Audiobook title, Made to Kill, 01-39, by Zechamp. Synopsis. A humble, maid, in a backwater household, Fayette was resigned to living the dull life of a proper domestic servant, slowly leveling as she cleaned the estate. However, everything changes after she discovers another path in a sudden monster attack. What if she were to take a more direct approach to cleaning the filth plaguing this world? What to expect from this novel? Household skills put to gruesome use in combat. A bit of GL romance. Eventually, guillotines. Eventually, cover commissioned from at Risu Casa underscore Nen. Genre. Action adventure fantasy girls love historical lit RPG tags adventurers aggressive characters alternate world aristocracy confident protagonist dense protagonist different social status girls love subplot industrialization lack of common sense late romance maids nobles quirky characters rebellion romantic subplot ruthless protagonist servants slow romance unique weapon user waiters. Chapter 1, Made, for Battle. Previous. Good job with the cleaning. Progress towards next level, 60%. Fayette sighed as she heard the telltale ding of a system message, about damn time. It had been weeks since she had last made any progress on her leveling, and she had started to get worried about stagnating. The message was however only a thin comfort, at this pace, there was no way she could make level 8 before the year's end. That would make me a laughingstock among the other maids. Should I be changing my approach somehow? Fayette certainly felt that there was nothing wrong with her cleaning skills as she looked over the results of her labor, the now spotless garden patio. The, Lord, had announced that a garden party was due in a few days, and the manor servants had been put into a bustle. Fayette's task was to make sure the outdoors of the estate were presentable. This, made, however would not be satisfied with just achieving, presentable. No. Fayette always strove to be thorough. The wooden board flooring that had been smudged with mud now had a sheen finish. The table and chairs had been cleared of the leaves, pollen and other filth that had littered them, and they too now shone spotless. The dirt path had been evened out to make walking on it more pleasant, and Fayette had even trimmed the nearby bushes to make them more orderly. She smiled with the satisfaction of a job well done. This place was now ready for any manner of event the, Lord, would think up. That however made her grimace. Fayette never liked when her cleaning efforts were ruined by irritating Highborn who did not appreciate her efforts one bit. She was certain that come the morning after the party, this place would be in a worse state than she had found it in. Ah, uh, spilled magical liquors are a nightmare to get off. Shaking the glum thoughts out of her mind, Fayette returned to humming with satisfaction at her handiwork. At least I can enjoy this sight for a bit, nothing beats the feeling of properly cleansing something. Just then, as if to mock her musings, a passing bird left a parting gift. The harmony of the image was shattered by bird droppings splattering on the freshly cleaned table. Fayette stared silently at the droppings for a split second before a seething rage took hold of her. She crumpled her cleaning rag into a ball and threw it towards the bird with all the force of her anger. Curse you, you damned hellion, she shouted, shaking her fist at the bird. Her cleaning rag made a brave attempt at chasing the creature but ultimately fell to the ground limp, after gaining only a few meters of height. Fayette stared hatefully at the bird as it made its graceful escape from the crime scene, far off from her reach. After taking a few deep breaths to calm down, she sighed and went to pick the rag back up. Those droppings wouldn't clean themselves, would they? It's always like this, isn't it? Day after day I sweep the dust, launder clothes and wipe off smudges, but what difference does it make? Things can never just stay clean. Fayette's grumblings went unheard as she went back to cleaning. After she had polished the table again, Fayette set off to her next destination, the ward artifact. The mansion was protected from would-be assailants by complex magical wards. In the past, the cause of such systems had been simple warded boxes, but the relative peace of recent years had seen them be replaced with extravagant works of art. In this mansion, the previous simple ward core had been replaced with one in the form of a lifelike statue of the, Lord, himself. The guests always loved it, but Fayette certainly didn't. Much harder to clean all the nooks and crannies on this one. I really wish we could have kept that old box, the thought of the twat's likeness serving as protector of the manor is hardly reassuring. On her way to the statue, Fayette spotted the, 
Guard Captain, Bernard, talking with some of the, woodsmen, employed by the mansion. They seemed abnormally agitated. Hmm, this looks interesting. Fayette covertly used her, eavesdrop, skill as she passed the men, life at the manor would be excruciatingly tiresome without some juicy gossip every now and then. She maintained a nonchalant expression as she began listening in on the conversation. You are sure, there are monsters lurking nearby? Well, sir, there's definitely something going on. The animals in the woods seemed unusually agitated. I even spotted some owl bears moving to different dens, further away. I need something more concrete to get the, Lord, moving. Did you see any signs of the monsters themselves? Nothing of the sort, sir. It was more the, mood to it. Wild animals have strong instincts, right? They can sense things like that, the coming of a storm. But you don't actually have any concrete findings. No sir, but I've been a woodsman all my life. If the beasties are acting like this, something bad is coming. Fayette saw the, guard captain, scrunch up his face at that, seemingly displeased. I trust your instincts, but this will be a hard sell to the, lord. I'll go see what I can do. Tuning out of the conversation, Fayette thought on what she had heard. She generally trusted the, guard captain's, judgment, the man was sharp. To Fayette, he had always felt like a sturdy shelf that somehow never gathered dust. Well, that certainly seems ominous. Bernard is rarely worried without reason. Hopefully he can persuade the, Lord, to act. Fayette was not too worried about her own safety. The mansion was one of the most well-protected spots in the immediate region after all. It would take a small army to force the way through the wards. She was, however, a bit worried for her childhood friend, Mire. The young, Semstress, was still a resident at the orphanage in the nearby town, which should be safe enough. The girl however had always been keen to wander about in the woods, much to Fayette's worry. I'll have to ask Bernard for details later. Better safe than sorry. Fayette picked up a brim leaning against the manor wall and idly flipped it about in her hand. Lurking monsters huh? It feels like it was just yesterday when we still played at being, knights, at the orphanage. In a flight of fancy, Fayette imagined herself a glorious warrior and mimed a few beats of an intense battle with her broom. Her imaginary enemy was taking quite the beating, and just as she prepared for a decisive killing blow, Fayette heard a cold, chiding voice from behind her. Fayette. Just hearing her name in that displeased tone was enough to send shivers down her spine. In an instant, she activated, maid's poise, and her bearing grew more balanced and graceful. Next. She performed a lightning-fast pirouette, spinning back towards the distinctly unimpressed-looking, headmaid, Clara. Mm. I have finished cleaning the patio and am now on my way to handle the ward core. The cold eyes on the stocky woman did not get any warmer. Fayette felt a bit of disapproval at the woman's uniform. She was not wearing an apron at all, and some parts of her official uniform had been replaced with personal items. It took you all morning to clean that little patio. It only needed a little touch-up, girl. A proper, maid, knows how to prioritize things, the woman said in a cold voice. Fayette kept her face steady, a proper, maid, respected the hierarchy of the household after all, at least outwardly. I will take your advice to heart, mm, she replied with a perfect curtsy. Clara's eyes narrowed, seeming to almost see through the facade Fayette was keeping up. After a moment of deliberation, she shook her head. Back to your duties, girl. You should work on that obsession of yours. Things will never be as clean as you wish them to be. With one last intimidating glare, the head maid turned and walked off back inside the mansion. Once Clara was out of sight, Fayette exhaled a deep breath. She relaxed her posture and leaned against the mansion's wall. Gah, why does she always have to be so bothersome? Is that something that comes with having a few drops of highborn blood in you? Fayette knew that there was sense in the woman's words, but she did not feel too keen on following them. Oh, she could become a fine, maid, all right if she compromised a bit, but she felt it would be left at just that. Becoming a fine, maid. Fayette didn't want to just be fine, even all right and good felt too unambitious. No, she wanted to be excellent, outstanding, peerless. The standard, maid, path could lead her to specialize and become a, parlor maid, or maybe even an, expert maid. Those were standard paths though, 
many others had trod them and many more would do so in the future. Fayette wanted something of her own, something more. She didn't really have any grand ideas on how to do that, so she had chosen a simple method. If she lived as true to herself as possible, surely that would lead to her getting the most suitable class evolutions for herself, would it not? I've always been fussy with detail and being thorough with things is also something I enjoy. Surely there's some interesting class evolution behind that. Though my leveling pace has been so slow lately, is standard cleaning just not working though, right? I did have work to do. Fayette slapped her cheeks to focus herself, pushed off the wall, and set off back to work. Cleaning the grand statue would require a bit of preparation, so she first walked over to the tool shack and fetched a ladder. Next, she carried it over the short distance to the statue and set it against it. This was always bothersome as the statue stood five feet tall and simply had too much detail, the dirt really liked to gather in those creases. Determined to make the statue glow as if it was new, Fayette climbed up the ladder and started wiping off smudges from the top. Her cleaning however could not truly begin before she noticed a concerning detail. Hey, isn't the ward's power gem looking very dim? Fayette stood in a deep curtsy at the door of the manor's main study. Lord, Costelloni himself was seated behind his mahogany desk, while Bernard was seated opposite him. Fayette had interrupted the pair's conversation, but this was not a matter to be ignored lightly. The, Lord, was a girthy man and his oily hands were always leaving prints all over Fayette's hard work. She likened serving the man to emptying an outhouse, something you tolerated because it had to be done. After gaining her, made, class Fayette had dreamed of serving an elegant, lady, and hosting refined tea parties. Sadly, elegant, ladies, were in short supply in this backwater holding, and orphans did not get much choice in their place of employment. The still unmarried, at, 38, Lord, Castella was not quite the employer she had been hoping for. Fayette suspected that his sorry romantic affairs were not much helped by the crass parties he was known for holding. Still, a, maid, needed a household, so she would make do. The, Lord's, face, now in a deep frown, turned to her. So, the power source is a bit dim, what's the issue? Oh, right, I was here to report on that power gem thingy. Am I supposed to say something? Why is he looking at me like I have the answers? Luckily, Fayette was saved from squirming more as the, guard captain, cut in. With respect, Lord, of course it is an issue. The wards cannot be trusted to function properly without full energy, Bernard said, tone a bit frustrated. Evidently, he had not had much success convincing the, Lord, before Fayette's arrival. Look outside, man, doesn't look too dim to me. Lord, Costelloni said, voice nonchalant as he pointed out of the window. Sure enough, the shimmering blue barrier which went around the manor didn't seem any different from normal. Besides, the replacement stone has been ordered and should be arriving next week. Wasn't it supposed to be replaced a fortnight ago? Bernard asked, frowning. Bah, the Sullies were coming over on that day, so I had to delay it. The, Lord, answered. There is no issue as a new delivery was arranged for next week. Girl, you are dismissed. Fayette gave a curt curtsy and turned to leave. Well, not my problem anymore. Though those monster sightings do concern me. Fayette lingered in the hallway just outside the study for a bit. She did not want to leave a matter like this hanging in uncertainty. Soon enough the door opened, and Bernard walked out, face furrowed. Fayette waited for him to walk by her, then smoothly joined along next to him. Sir, how is the matter? Will things be all right? The man turned a side eye to her but did not slow his walk. He always moved with certainty, as if he knew exactly where he needed to be. There should be no issues as long as you lot don't stray into the forest. Yes, the ward may have a bit less oomph to it than usual. It will still hold against any monsters you could encounter around here. Fayette felt a bit of relief at the reassurances, but another matter was still bugging her. What about the town? I've already sent word to them of lurking monsters. It should keep them from wandering outside the barrier for a few days. Not too many adventurous sorts out here. Fayette stopped by the cleaning cupboard while Bernard continued on. Well, that should keep Mire out of trouble. Clear mind back to work. The next day, the tolling of the clockwork alarm woke Fayette up at five o'clock sharp, as always. She generally took a bit more time to get up and dress than the others, 
as she always wanted to have her bed and costume in impeccable condition. By the time she was done getting dressed and making her bed, the thrum of the steam-powered laundry machine was already echoing through the servants' quarters. Seems Claudine got started early with the laundry. Today most busy work had fallen on the other servants, so Fayette had more leeway in what tasks she could choose to undertake. The state of the mansion's library had been bothering her for a while, so she planned to put the time she had today to good use. After eating a light breakfast, the maid headed to her destination. She opened the library's vast oaken doors and revealed a dim room. Dust and cobwebs had gathered quite a bit here, but that did not darken her mood. Fayette knew that soon it would all be shining clean. The library was not huge, holding only a few lines of shelves filled with rarely read books. Fayette sometimes spent her free time reading here. Technically she shouldn't be handling the, Lord's, collections for personal use, but servants deserved some illicit privileges, right? As long as such matters remained discreet, they were fine in Fayette's eyes. She lit the oil lamps in the room and got to work. Her trusty feather duster in hand, she started tackling the upper shelves and the books in them. It was a long process, as in her pursuit of thoroughness Fayette wanted to ensure that no book had one speck of dust left on it. Humming cheerfully, Fayette used her, sweep dust, skill liberally, making good progress. Next, she moved onto the lower shelves. Once those were done, she moved to clearing the dust gathered on the floor with a broom. Fayette found cleaning to be hypnotic in a way, there was a steady rhythm to it. She was completely immersed in the moment, collecting the last bits of dust into one big pile. So immersed was she, that the sound of a window shattering caught her completely off guard. Turning from her sweeping, she saw that one of the room's windows had been smashed, and a short green creature was climbing in through it. She froze still from the shock. Huh? Is that, a monster, here? The creature pushed its way through the window and landed inside on its feet, which allowed Fayette to get a good look at it. It stood about four feet tall, a pointed, lizard-like face, a mouth armed with sharp teeth, hands ending in sharp claws and a tail that was swishing with agitation. Fayette recognized it from the stories, a kobold. The monster hissed, then bounded towards Fayette. Its sharp claws started to glow green with the activation of some ability. Fayette acted on instinct and did the most natural act a, made, could do. She used, sweep dust. The pile of dust she had been gathering was thrown right in the kobold's face with precision, getting the stuff all over its eyes and mouth. The kobold shut its eyes as it was sent into a huge coughing fit, which stopped its advance completely. Fayette did not let this opportunity pass by. She looked over the mess the creature had made, the smashed glass and the dust now flying about everywhere, and a burning rage started to grow within her. Before Fayette knew what she was doing, the tail end of her broom smashed into the kobold's head with an ugly crack. The monster was smacked down onto the ground, but that was only the first blow. Fayette did not let up, and smashed the creature on the head over and over again, each blow denting its skull further in. You bastard, making a mess of my cleaning, I'll show you. After one last blow, the life force of the monster finally ran out and its body burst like an overripe fruit. The skin, flesh, bones and other bits all dissolved into a mess of brownish-red blood, which was sent splattering throughout the room by that final broom strike. Only a dimly glowing monster core was left intact in the middle of the pool of blood. It took a moment for the haze in Fayette's head to clear, but eventually she noticed a familiar ding, which had been waiting at the periphery of her senses. One piece of trash cleared, well done. Progress towards next level, 80%. Wait, what? Party status. Fayette. Class, maid. Level, 7, tier 1. Skills. Housekeeping, 2 fourths. Sweep dust, rank 3, cleaning tool proficiency, rank 2 attendant, 1 quarter. Maid's poise, rank 2 capstone skills, 0, 0. Not applicable free skills, 2 halves. Eavesdrop, Rank 2, Basic Alchemy, Cleaning Agents, Rank 2. 66. Chapter 2, Kitchen Carnage. And thus, the classes were bestowed. Worker, Classes to Work. Fighter, Classes to Fight. Ruler, Classes to Rule. Everyone found their natural place. And the world was in order. Except from the, 
Holy Book of Order. Fayette's mind was abuzz with the implications of the system message she had just received. What? You can gain levels like this, and there's so much progress too. She leaned against the wall, head roiling with dizziness as she looked at the blood which had sprayed all over the room. Does this really count as fulfilling the duties of a maid? Before she could gather her thoughts further, Fayette realized that she was hearing a lot of disturbing sounds from outside the broken window. She bent to peek through and gulped once she saw the outside of the manor. That was a lot of kobolds. A horde of the creatures were currently busy rushing the main entranceway of the manor, while the manor's automated enchantment defenses hurled fireballs at them. The manor was not defenseless even if one got through the monster ward. Still, monsters shouldn't be getting this far in the first place. What happened to the barrier? Fayette turned her gaze towards the approximate location where the barrier should have been and yelped as she saw the destruction there. A huge pool of blood spread out in a curved arc. Did they overpower the ward through sheer numbers? These creatures are crazy. Why are there so many of them? They seemed intent on the main entrance, so Fayette's out-of-the-way window went unnoticed. That first kobold must have strayed from the pack quite a bit to crash through here in the first place. Having confirmed that none of them seemed to be straying her way, Fayette sat down under the window and took some deep breaths to calm herself. She had seen that the kobold horde was attacking from the northwest side of the manor, so at least the town should be safe. That left the more pressing manor. All right, how do I get out alive from this? How fast had the attack happened? Did the guards have time to arm up and gather? Was there organized resistance in the manor? Fayette had many questions, but few answers. She smacked herself on the cheeks to help focus. Right now she could only count on herself. Fayette looked at the smeared remains of the kobold she had killed. She still had a hard time believing it. She had managed to kill a monster, using her meager, maid, skills no less. It was common knowledge that whenever, worker, class people came under attack, they had little hope but to assemble into a spear militia, trying to outweigh the disadvantage in combat skills with sheer numbers. That was not what Fayette had just done. I beat a monster one-on-one -on -one and gained the advantage thanks to my very much so non-combat skills. Then there was the even more pressing matter. And I gained so much experience from it. Comparatively, normal cleaning work is worthless. It was not however the experience gained that was giving Fayette a feeling of rapture. She stared in a daze at the mess the kobold had made in the room, then looked at the silent, dripping blood and the gleaming monster core in the middle of the pool. That monster would never rise up again. Whenever I clean something up, it's going to become a mess again eventually. But that kobold, it's completely gone now. It will never rise up, it will never cause any more death and destruction ever again. Fayette felt a newfound feeling of satisfaction. Never before had she cleaned something so perfectly, so thoroughly. For a moment, she just stared at the bloody remains and enjoyed this new sort of satisfaction she was feeling, until an especially loud explosion from outside shook her out of her reverie. Oh, right. I'm in a bit of a situation here. She shakily rose to her feet, then peeked out the window again to make sure none of the creatures had decided to come this way. Many were being blasted apart by the fireballs, but many more had already managed to make it to the manor and were climbing in through broken windows and busted open doors. Fayette considered making a run for it through the window, but she found the idea risky. She would have a hard time escaping from the creatures if she was spotted running across the open plain. Staying cooped up here seemed an equally bad idea. She did not want to get backed up into a corner if she was found. I think I'll have to make a run for the emergency escape tunnel, even though it's much deeper in the mansion. If I have to fight, I'd much rather it be in narrow, open corridors than out in the open or trapped here. That's also where the others would probably be headed. Still, looking over her equipment did not fill Fayette with confidence. Her current armaments, a broom and a feather duster. Hardly what she wished to take along for a fight of this scale. Though, I did kill that one kobold with just my broom. What else could I do if I really tried to make the most of my, made, abilities? Fayette had some ideas, especially due to her, basic alchemy, cleaning agents, skill, she could whip up some nasty solutions if given the chance. The issue was that she would need materials for that, and those were in her cleaning cupboard, which quite a bit further inside the mansion. Though, I guess I'll pass through there anyway if I'm going for the tunnel. Fayette felt oddly thrilled at the prospect of rushing off to battle. That first kill had given her a taste of fast leveling, 
and she found herself wanting more. Her combat options were however a bit limited. I've kept this mansion too clean for, sweep dust, to be useful in most places. Curse my competence. She checked over her broom to make sure it was still sturdy and was glad to find it so. It should serve to crack a few more skulls before the day was done. The gleaming monster core called to her, so she quickly picked it up and stuffed it into a pocket. Fayette had a fondness for shiny things, unattended gleaming pieces of rock were irresistible to her. Judging herself ready, Fayette silently tiptoed to the door, and cracked it open just a sliver. The hallway seemed empty, but the broken windows revealed that this was not due to a lack of nearby kobolds. She used, eavesdrop, and strained the ability to the limits of its range. The cooldown would be a bit longer, but she judged it worth it. It sounded like a lot of kobolds were moving and fighting near the main entrance hall, but the kitchen to the side seemed quiet. I don't think I can make it through that many of the bastards, guess I'll have to cut through the kitchen. Keeping her footsteps silent, Fayette crept forward to the kitchen door and peeked inside. She found out quickly why she could not hear any sounds of battle from here. The fight was already over. The kitchen was a mess. The dishes on the central table had been thrown all over and the floor was chock full of broken ceramics. Of the soup pots on the stove, only one remained upright with the food still boiling within. One of the cooks lay motionless in a bloody heap against the far wall of the room. A kobold was sitting atop the mangled body, silently chewing on a ripped off arm. Fayette's resolve fluttered for a moment, but she activated, maids poise, and felt her emotions stabilize. Trying her best to channel the disgust she was feeling into anger, Fayette stepped softly into the room and began creeping around the central table. The kobold was too occupied with its meal to notice her immediately, so she managed to get approach it from behind and ready her broom for a decisive blow. Just as she was about to reach the kobold, a floorboard creaked under her foot, and the rest happened in a flash. The monster twitched and swept its tail out, and Fayette's broom was sent clattering onto the floor. Acting on instinct, the maid grabbed a knife from the kitchen top and pounced on the kobold's back, over the lashing tail. She grabbed onto the back of its head and thrust the knife deep into the creature's exposed neck, causing it to roar out with anger and pain. Sharp claws tried to flash back at Fayette, but they were in an awkward position and only managed to graze her forearms. That did not stop her from twisting and thrusting the knife deeper in. The lashing tail sent cutlery clattering down from the nearby tables, and Fayette managed to catch a fork into her free hand. A fork which she then slammed into the other side of the kobold's neck with her free hand. She moved her foot on top of the monster's tail to keep it from thrashing about, which pinned it in place while she tore at it with the cutlery. The monster twisted and raged as it tried to get its hands on her, but Fayette managed to keep the shorter creature under control. It did not last long. With a last decisive thrust using both hands, Fayette thrust her cutlery deeper, and the kobold collapsed in a bloody splatter. Fayette lost her footing and fell to the floor right in the middle of all the blood. For a few seconds she just laid there drenched in red, panting from the exertion and just barely aware of the system messages which appeared in front of her. Another piece of trash cleared, keep up the good work. Level up, you have reached level 8. One skill point gained. You have gained a new skill, cutlery control. Progress towards next level, 0%. 59. Chapter 3, Cutlery Control Fayette stood up from the blood-covered floor and leaned against the kitchen top to steady herself. She grimaced at the bloody prints she was leaving on the surface and pushed herself away from it. She was pretty sure she had never been this dirty in her life. Okay, that was intense. But I gained a level, and a new skill. Let's have a look. She focused her mind on the prompt and a more detailed overview of the skill entered her mind. Cutlery control A maid is always working with cutlery, and with this new skill, it all becomes a breeze. Easily set your cutlery exactly where you want it, how you want it. Setting up for dinner parties has never been easier. Ham, we don't have many large dinner parties here and I'm not generally in charge of them. Wait, no, there's a more important situation here. Can I fight with it? Seems like it's still mainly for attendance work. She did not have time to think more on her skill before she heard rapid footsteps approaching from the hallway she had entered through. Her fight had not been silent, and consequences were on the way. The sight of two kobolds bursting into the room froze Fayette for a bit, but working on instinct she made the correct move. 
she instantly threw both the knife and fork she was still holding at the first of the monsters. She felt her new skill activate, and the cutlery veered with supernatural precision, moving exactly where she wanted them to go. The knife hit the kobold in the left eye and the fork in the right. The monster screamed out from the pain of having its eyeballs shredded apart and stopped right in its tracks, clawing at its eyes with rage. The other one was still moving forward though, now with even more danger in its eyes. There was a table between it and Fayette, but that distance would be covered quickly. Bloody hells, if only I had more cutlery to throw. As she made that thought, Fayette felt, cutlery control, activate again. Knives, forks and spoons from all around the room began to float to her waiting grip. Elated, she prepared to throw them too, but the kobold was smarter than that. It had seen the fate its companion had suffered, so it put one arm in front of its head, keeping its face covered with scaly arms. Damn, it's smart enough to cover its eyes. Fayette tried to throw a pair of forks at the kobold's feet, but the monster activated some sort of shield skill, and its scales emitted a green glow. Her forks clattered against the now hardened surface, not leaving a scratch behind. Fayette backed up while desperately trying to think of a new plan. She ran her eyes around the room and saw spoons, forks, plates, all manner of things spread about, none useful in this fight. She backed into the stove and the sound of boiling water snapped her out of the panic. She turned her head and noticed the boiling pot of soup behind her. Of course. She grabbed the soup pot and hurled the boiling contents all over the cobble just as it rounded the corner. Let's see your hardening help against that. The boiling broth sizzled against the cobbled scales and scalded its face and most critically, its eyes. Now blinded, the creature lost all composure and began grasping around wildly as it roared and screamed. The sound was high-pitched and bestial. Fayette took some distance from the blinded creature and picked her brim back up. The kobold seemed to have no idea where she was, so she carefully got in brooming range and proceeded to smack the kobold on the head as hard as she could. The impact had a satisfying crunch to it and sent the creature splayed out on the floor. It tried to get back up, but it had no chance. Fayette steadied her grip and hammered at it. Then she hammered it again, again and did not stop before it collapsed into a bloody heap, leaving only the gleaming monster core behind. All right, one down. The other one was still clawing about blindly near the room's entrance. It was making a lot of noise, but no more kobolds seemed to be approaching. Is this part of the mansion clear? What are the monsters up to? Fayette took care in approaching the monster and made sure it did not sense which direction she was coming from. Once the monster was in brooming range, she battered it down without mercy. Silence reigned in the kitchen once again, only broken by a ding. Two pieces of trash cleared, nice. Progress towards next level, 30%. Fayette absent-mindedly tried to wipe her broom's end of all the blood while she surveyed the scene, three kobolds slaughtered by her hand. Cracking skulls with her broom had felt satisfying, almost too satisfying. Do I actually have a knack for this? She was surprised at how calm she felt, especially as the corpse of a former co-worker was only a few feet away. True, she had never been that close to any of her co-workers here but they had still practically lived together for two years. Am I really this cold? Or is this just what battle feels like? It's quite different from the stories. As Fayette walked back through the kitchen, she made sure to pick up the monster cores and some cutlery into her pockets. The cores were shiny, and her new skill seemed to have more value in combat than she had expected. The throws may not hold much power, but the accuracy is no joke. I can see a fork to the eye solving many situations. She tossed some spoons around to get a better feel for the skill, then practiced calling them back into her hands. It always took a bit of practice to get used to a new skill. Cutlery control seemed to have two effects. It allowed her to both call cutlery into her arms and send it where she wanted in a radius of about 4 meters. The skill did not seem to have much of a cooldown, at least with how she was using it. Trying to hurl the cutlery a longer distance made the throw lose its accuracy so it seemed to be mostly useful for close combat, or setting kitchenware before a big dinner party. Fayette was rather curious about how the skill would develop at later ranks, would it increase in power, range or accuracy? If she was fortunate, maybe all three. Or maybe that would not be fortunate, specialization did generally lead to more outright strength. Wait, I got a skill point from the level up, almost forgot about that. 
She debated putting the point in her new skill, but decided against it. It was still too new to her, and she did not know whether she really wanted to lock it in with a skill point. She thought over her skills and decided to ultimately put the point in, cleaning tool proficiency. The fight had gotten risky when she lost grip of her broom, and she still felt it was her most reliable weapon. Getting a bit better at handling it couldn't hurt. She mentally assigned the point, and soon a notification rang out. Cleaning tool proficiency advanced to level 3. Fayette felt her grip on the broom grow surer and more practiced. She experimentally whisked it around for a bit and was satisfied to find the act a lot easier than before. Right, that should help a bit. Best get a move on. The wounds to her forearms were not severe, just surface scratches that did not really need extra care. She was honestly more bothered by the damage to her outfit than to her skin. A solid outfit really unsettled her, being aware of the blood splatters all over it felt like a persistent buzz at the back of her head. There were kobolds ahead of me and behind me. Seems like they are just running around where they like, looking for people. Where is the organized resistance? I should keep moving and try to evade them. Her thoughts gathered, Fayette headed to the other door in the kitchen. She opened it, revealing a dining room that had been torn apart by battle. Tables and chairs had been flipped over and the chandelier dropped. Blood splatters all over the walls hinted at slain monsters, but the scattered human corpses had certainly not won this fight. Fayette traced a rectangle in front of her heart, a silent prayer for the fallen. If she had any say in it, she would make those kobolds pay, and she was about to get the means to do just so. Outside the dining room was another battle-torn hallway, but it seemed clear of enemies right now. One of the doors in the hallway belonged to her cleaning cupboard, where she would find what she needed for her plan. Fayette felt her anticipation growing as she crept forward, the broom had been working well enough so far but she doubted it would fare well in a proper two-on-one fight. She needed something more effective, something for larger hordes. She had to hurry, but her alchemy supplies were organized well. If she used the materials liberally and threw in some precious catalysts, she could finish the process rather fast. She opened the cupboard, expecting to see her neatly laid out supplies. Instead, she found everything piled up in a messy clump, crouched above the equipment, shivering from fright, the head maid. Clara. 58. Chapter 4 Armed and Dangerous. The head maid was a mess. Her black hair was in disarray and her face smudged with tears. She was crammed tight inside the cupboard, just barely managing to fit in. The door opening had frozen her stiff, but she breathed out once she saw that the opener was human. Both women stared at each other silently for a few seconds. F. Fayette, is that you? So much blood, Clara whispered, voice quivering. The blood's not mine. Fayette responded curtly. Do you know anything about the situation? Where the guards are? I, I do not know. I was setting up things in the dining room, when suddenly there were explosions and then those monsters burst in. I, her voice quieted as the woman seemed to fall into a daze. I ran and hid. But the others, did they make it? Did you come through the kitchen? Fayette grimaced as she thought of the bodies she had just seen. She knew that finding another living soul here should have made her feel relieved, or at least something of the sort, but no, she only felt annoyed. I really don't have time for this right now. I'm sure they're fine somewhere. Can you get out? I need my tools. Fayette did not wait for an answer and pulled the woman out of the cupboard, just a bit forcefully. Clara was not ready for the force and stumbled out, falling against the wall. She rose up, blinking with confusion. What? Tools, are you insane? We need to hide. Fayette did not respond, she was too busy looking through the cupboard for her alchemical supplies. Clara had disturbed things a bit, so Fayette had to dig through scattered mops, rags and various other junk before she found what she needed, her reagent pouch and concocting tools. The types of cleaning agents one could buy on the market were hardly strong enough to satisfy Fayette, so she had resorted to making most of what she used on her own. After putting a spare point into her, basic alchemy, cleaning agents, skill, her efforts had been rewarded with some very effective mixtures. Fayette began to focus on the skill, but her focus was broken by a hand that grabbed her back. Hey, answer me, have you lost your mind? Clara almost shouted while trying to pull Fayette away from the cupboard. Fayette slapped the woman's hands away and fixed a furious gaze on her. Hey, I need to focus for this, she hissed 
then turned back to the cupboard. What does that have to do with anything? Clara hissed back. Fayette sighed. Some people were just so dense. She did not deign to turn back and continued sifting through her ingredients. I'm a maid, so obviously I need all my cleaning tools if I'm going to fight. That shut Clara up for quite a bit. The woman just seemed confused as she stared at Fayette. What? She finally managed to ask. Hearing no response, she approached. You're serious. You are actually serious, aren't you? You're going to fight, to take on monsters while armed with a broom. Fayette shrugged, then gestured behind her at her vera blood covered broom. Worked well enough so far. For the first time, Clara seemed to take in the bloody garments the maid was wearing, and then she turned to look at the broom. You could make out the dents in it from the use. Clara just looked back and forth between the maid and the broom. Fayette was glad for the piece, she needed it for the work she was about to do. First, she picked up a pair of protective leather gloves from the shelf and put them on. She did not want to get any of the liquid she was about to whip up on her skin. She had learned that lesson the hard way. Next, she took out a bucket, filled it with water from the still working tap, then began mixing in the various ingredients. She felt her alchemy skill guiding her along the process, making sure ingredient amounts were precise and the timing was right. Some of the missing blanks were filled in by the skill, making her concoction a lot more potent than mundane methods would. At some point Clara had shuffled behind her. She was looking at Fayette's work with something akin to curiosity. The process did not take long, in total lasting a bit under half a minute. Fayette had chosen a mixture that could be whipped up fast, a crisis was underway nearby after all. It meant using some of her harder to find ingredients, but that really did not matter right now. As the last of the bubbles fizzled away, Fayette looked with satisfaction at the bright blue liquid. What are you doing with that? Clara asked from behind her. Fayette carefully stored a bit of the liquid into a glass bottle, then held it up. This is what I like to call my all-purpose cleaner. Should do fine work against kobolds too. Fayette put the bottle in a pocket, then picked up a mop from the wall and dipped it in the bucket. She tested the mop against some of the blood streaking through the hallway, and nodded with satisfaction at the hissing reaction. Clara stared at her as if she was some kind of strange, alien creature. You're really going to charge in there to fight, aren't you? With a mop of all things. Fayette cut an unusual figure as she prepared to set off, a maid outfit strewn with blood, mop in one hand and a bucket in the other. She looked back at the head maid, defiantly, head raised high. So what if I am? I'm not going to hide away or something like that. I'm going straight for the escape tunnel. There was something in her gaze, that reckless confidence usually only possessed by heroes setting out for battle. Without another word, she turned and began walking forward. After a moment's hesitation, Clara followed. Fayette peeked her head out of the corridor and looked into a formerly beautiful sitting room. The room did not have any occupants, but Fayette used, eavesdrop, to make sure the vicinity was safe. It was not. She heard kobolds shuffling about just behind a bend, that would be the main reception hall. Things had gotten quieter everywhere, and she did not like the implication of that. Still, she thought she heard some sounds of fighting, but there were too many kobolds in between. She shifted her scan to the servants' passages and was surprised to find them clear. Looks like that'll be an easy path forward. Where are we going? A whispered voice asked from behind her. Fayette groaned internally. Did she really have to constantly explain herself? She walked into the room and went to a door disguised as a bookshelf. Mansions like these couldn't have the workers be visible, could they? She opened up the door, revealing a mostly undisturbed passage. This should be the safest way forward. It's not that long to the escape tunnel. She pointed into the passage. You go first. Clara backed away. Why me? Are you using me as monster bait? Based on her expression, she seemed to be imagining scenarios in which Fayette gleefully pushed her into the waiting arms of monsters to secure her own getaway. This time Fayette groaned audibly. No, half-wit. I'm securing our back. She demonstrated by mopping the floor nearby, leaving a healthy dosage of her, all-purpose cleaner, behind. Do you want to walk on that? Clara looked at the lightly steaming liquid for a moment and needed no further convincing. She walked into the passage and Fayette followed behind, steadily mopping the path behind them. Clara seemed nervous as she walked in front, twitching at every creaking floorboard. 
Fayette understood the concern but wished she would just hurry up already. The servants' passages were meandering routes which had been added to the manor as an afterthought, so it was not a short path to walk. After rounding another corner, Clara turned to Fayette. Say, we're in a tight passageway and you are obstructing our only way back. Wouldn't it be pretty bad if there was like a monster lurking ahead or something? Fayette looked at the sizzling path behind her. Ah, yes, that is certainly true. Her, eavesdrop, ability had come off cooldown again, so she quickly used it to check ahead. No signs of monsters in the paths, don't worry about it, I've made sure there are none ahead, she shrugged and prodded the, head maid, along. Clara seemed skeptical but did not protest, so they continued on. They walked in silence, occasionally hearing the shuffling of monsters through the walls. Fayette felt her anticipation rising as she closed in on her goal, the escape tunnel should now be just on the other side of the wall. She could hear the sounds of battle, but the sounds quieted down just as she began to hurry up. Did they win the battle? Fayette poked at Clara with her mop to speed her along, and soon they were at a doorway. Fayette pushed to the front and carefully cracked the door open and saw that it was the human side that had won the battle. So far at least, she had heard a lot more kobolds along the way. She heard Clara sigh with relief next to her and opened the door further. The sight made her stop. The hatch for the escape tunnel had been opened. There was however a distinct lack of escape happening. 51. Chapter 5, Hold the Line. The room was in chaos. A ragged group of, guards, and servants were arrayed in a spear formation, nervously watching the main doorway. The, guards, were steadily holding their weapons at the ready, but the servants were just barely staying on their feet, leaning on their spears with exhaustion. There had been a fight, and there had also been casualties. Corpses lay in front of the formation, drenched in a vast pool of blood. The enemy had been fought and pushed back, but Fayette could hear the shuffling ahead. More would be coming. She took in the haggard formation, then swished her eyes towards the escape hatch right behind them. It was open. Lord, Castella was nervously pacing by the hatch, watching as two, guards, were lowering an elaborate chest down. He did not look like a calm leader at all. He was looking around with agitation, eyes wild. Fayette could hear him nervously muttering to himself, but couldn't make sense of the words. Bernard was standing by him, rapier at the ready to guard against any threats. Fayette felt a surge of anger that he was not among the formation. What the hell was going on here, were lives being sacrificed for the sake of some box. Fayette began to walk forward and her steps echoed into the room. She did not know what her plan was, but she knew she couldn't allow whatever this was to continue. She felt at the mop in her hand, grit her teeth, and looked at the harangued, Lord, what if I just... She did not have time to finish her thought, as the, Lord's, head twitched to her. There was a moment of fear in the look, but it gave way to recognition. He looked at Fayette and Clara, some calculation passing behind his eyes. Ah, excellent, more of you survived. Fayette felt her anger bristle at the flippant remark, but she did not get the opportunity to give a tongue lashing. Footsteps sounded ahead, a lot of them. The, Lord's, gaze twitched to the doorway and his mutterings grew more frantic. No, too risky, too risky, I have to, he patted Bernard on the shoulder. We're leaving, oath sworn guard, dot. The, guard captain, fell into step behind him and the, Lord, began to lower himself down the hatch. Fayette was disbelieving, did the man truly intend to just, leave, while leaving everyone here to secure his back. Hey, what the hell are you, she began, but the man turned and gestured towards Fayette and Clara. You two, join the rest. Secure retreat, hold the line, dot. A power settled over her, and Fayette felt her objections die in her throat. Her steps changed direction, and before she knew it, her gaze had been torn from the, Lord. She tried to resist, but it was like a vast invisible current was guiding her along, not allowing any deviation. To her horror, she realized that she was walking right into the spear formation. She had never heard of or felt something like this. Could a, ruler, skill just, command people, just like that. It felt surreal, like she was just an observer in her own body. A throbbing in her head filled her mind with an urge to get in the formation and stay there. Inside her mind, Fayette trashed and raged, but the compulsion was stronger. She inevitably found herself walking to stand amongst the others, Mop pointed towards the door. 
The kobold steps were getting closer. She tried to turn her gaze from the door, to shout at Bernard to stop this, to curse the Lord to do anything, but it was useless. A horde of kobolds turned the corner. The corridor was instantly crowded with the short creatures, the horde led by a taller one standing in the middle. Its eyes gleamed with savage pleasure, and it pointed the horde forward, staying at its rear to direct them. As soon as Fayette began to think of fighting the enemies in front of her, she felt the compulsion strengthening her, like a mountain was holding her in place, steadying her footing. It felt wrong. She saw the guards stand straighter and steady their hands, turning into a formidable iron wall. The skill fit like a glove for the warriors, something natural, something that was right. The skill did not suit the servants, they looked like a mockery. Oh, the compulsion forced them to stand straight and hold their spears steady all right, but they had no skill with the arms, their bodies had not been trained for this. Gangly, maids, and cooks, brandishing spears did not seem too intimidating against the approaching horde. It looked like a sick joke. Fayette did not even have a spear, she had her mop. The head maid, standing next to her had picked up a spear from somewhere, which she was nervously looking at. Did the skill register my mop as a spear equivalent? Probably better this way honestly, with my all-purpose cleaner, I can. Fayette's thoughts paused as she felt at the mop in her hands. In her two hands. Where was her bucket? She tried to tear her gaze away from the approaching monsters to search for it, but the compulsion seemed to be intensifying. As everyone readied their spears, Fayette felt like she was becoming one part of a whole, she felt the mass of the others pulling her along. What the hell? This is idiocy. This is what I made that stuff for. With a bucket full of the stuff, I could have. Fayette did not have time for more cursing, the horde was on them. The kobolds rushed into the spears, headless of the danger as they lashed out with sharp claws. The waiting, guards, responded with skills of their own. Spears glowed with power and strength, misses turned into hits, some even conjured ethereal shields for protection. The servants meanwhile could only hold their spears steady and pointed forward, they had no skills for this. The kobolds did not seem afraid of Fayette's mop, they kept their eyes only on the spear lashing out from beside her. Big mistake. Fayette felt satisfaction as she landed a hit on one's face, spreading the liquid all over the monster's eyes. It screamed as its face began melting down, which allowed a spear to take it in the neck. It was a good kill, but more came. There was something to fighting as a unit that made you lose yourself in it. Fayette thrusted and parried, mind not registering anything except her mop and the monsters in front of her. She was not completely reliant on prodding with the mop, Fayette had some other tricks to play too. She spread the, all-purpose cleaner, on the floor in front of her, but the monsters endured the burns on their feet and continued on. She tossed the odd fork to distract a creature, but again it was only a distraction. The fight felt like it had lasted an eternity, but it could not have been but a few moments before Fayette realized the grim truth. We are not winning this. One by one, people were getting caught out. The, guards, were expending their protection skills, and once they ran out, the formation began to crumble. The servants had been mostly kept up by support skills from the guards, and once those ran out, so did their luck. The guard, standing on Fayette's left, took a slash to the gut and fell down. A stable hand was dragged out of the formation, screaming as the monsters pounced on him. Bit by bit, the line was thinning. Fayette knew she needed to do something, but her feet were glued to their places, stubbornly holding the line. Hold the line, hold the line, hold the line. The compulsion in her mind shouted out. Fayette's mind roiled with fury, gathering up a storm. No, this is stupid, these orders are bad. Does a servant really have to follow if their master gives idiotic orders, orders that will doom them? No, I refuse, I refuse, I refuse. Fayette lashed out, pushing all her willpower into resisting the compulsion, and suddenly, she felt it break. She felt the world around her rushing back into focus as she broke through. She no longer felt like she was one with the formation, and the assault on her senses almost made her tumble. Suddenly the smell of death, desperate screams and fearsome monsters felt more real, more close. There was no longer any ability coating her, shielding her from the reality of the situation. Fayette steadied herself with, maid's poise, and felt control return to her legs. She ran back. It was a frantic scramble. 
Her absence in the formation would cause trouble, maybe even death, but she had to do this. The maid tumbled out of the formation, right next to her bucket. It had been waiting right there the whole time, just a few steps away. Fayette crouched over it and took out a glowing piece of blue metal from her pouch. It was a brittle thing, leaving crumbs in her hands and pockets as she fished it out. When she had experimented with it previously, she had been careful with the dosage, this time she would not be. She tossed the whole thing in. The mixture began to foam and bubble, and a yellow gas started streaming out. Fayette took a step back from the bucket, then hefted it up using the shaft of her mop. Best keep the stuff as far away from her as possible. She readied herself for a throw, then swung the mop over her shoulder, catapulting the steaming bucket over the battle line. It landed right in the doorway, on the head of the leading kobold. The liquid drenched it, it screamed, and then the gas began spreading. Don't get the gas on you, Fayette shouted out as she rushed back to the fight. She no longer felt the skills binding her, so fighting in the formation no longer felt as stable and sure as before, but the formation was not much of a formation anymore anyways. The kobolds in the back tried to get away from the gas, but the ones in the front didn't give way, and the back line was soon covered in it. Their scales began to scald and blister, and their screams were silenced by the bloody vomit frothing forth from their mouths. It did not take long for them to collapse onto the ground, dissolving into puddles of blood. The kobolds at the front felt the pressure from behind them lessening, but did not realize that something was wrong, they were too focused on the fighting in front of them. That suited Fayette fine. Push them in the gas, but don't breathe it in, she shouted as she prodded one of the creatures into the cloud. The remaining fighters clued in quickly and began pushing monsters back against the spreading gas. If there was one thing that blasted skill was good for, it was something like this, boxing enemies in. The rest of the fight was surprisingly easy, so easy it made Fayette even more furious. The monsters fell to the gas before they realized the full danger of the situation, falling back as they didn't realize just why the pressure behind them had let up. Soon not a single kobold was left standing, and there was a moment of silence in the room. The survivors stepped back and eyed the cloud nervously but the issue was resolved soon. The one other remaining, maid, pointed at the cloud, and used an ability. Clear air. She then collapsed onto the ground, breathing raggedly. The gas began to dissipate away, and everybody breathed in a sigh of relief. The battle was over. That's a lot of cleaning, nice combo. Experience shared with party. Level up. You have reached level 9. One skill point gained. Progress towards next level, 80%. Fayette collapsed onto the floor and looked at the survivors. Some had survived, many more were dead. Clara's corpse was splayed out on the floor, guts spilling out of her open stomach. Many of the guards had survived, but it was not them who Fayette focused on. As she looked at the trembling, maid, and cook, who were all that remained of her fellow servant staff, she felt the rage inside her condensing into something colder. Her eyes were drawn to the escape corridor's entrance which had been right behind them the whole time. She thought of the Lord, who had thoughtlessly tossed her away like a piece of trash, who had taken control of her body. There would be hell to pay for this. Party status. Spoiler. Fayette. Class. Maid. Level. 9. Tier 1. Skills. Housekeeping. Two fourths. Sweep dust. Rank 3, Cleaning Tool Proficiency, Rank 3 Attendant, 2 fourths. Maid's Poise, Rank 2, Cutlery Control, Rank I Capstone Skills, 0, 0. Not Applicable Free Skills, 2 halves. Eavesdrop, Rank 2, Basic Alchemy, Cleaning Agents, Rank 2 Unspent Skill Points, 1. Collapse. 55. Chapter 6 Resignation The survivors were a ragged bunch, nervously catching their breaths. One, guard, who seemed to be the most fine of the bunch had the energy to mumble a skill. Sense trespasses, dot. He looked around for a few seconds, then sighed with relief. The manners clear. Those were all the rest of them. Everybody who had still been standing instantly collapsed onto the floor with exhaustion. Can't believe it. We actually made it. That gas trick really. Caroline, Caroline. Everybody started babbling, 
caring little for whether anybody was listening to them. Some were taking things better, while others looked on slain friends with sorrow. Only one remained silent. Fayette slowly rose to her feet with an eerie calm about her. She stumbled to a maid, who was staring into emptiness with an empty expression. Hey, can you hear me? The maid snapped out of it and looked at Fayette with a dazed expression. Is that you, Fayette? It's so much. She began to shiver, so Fayette grabbed hold of her shoulder. Hey, focus, can you use that cleaning skill of yours on me? The woman snapped back to attention once again, then looked at Fayette, confused. What? Oh, I suppose, cleanse, dot. Her touch sent all the blood and grime on Fayette sliding right off, and Fayette nodded thanks. Thanks, keep it together, okay. Fayette turned to the guards in the room and clapped her hands to get their attention. Hey, I'm going to go tell the Lord, what happened? You can all stay here and rest. She had a professional smile on her face, just the type of smile a maid might have as she attended to guests. It sent shivers down the guard's spines. Sure, go ahead, one eventually said, and Fayette set off. She had work to do. The day's cleaning was not done. She jumped through the hatch into the narrow and dark tunnel. She had cleaned this place a few times over her three years of service, so it was not unknown to her. The other end of the tunnel led to a forest clearing about two kilometers away, an ancient safeguard for situations like these. The more she mused on it, the more Fayette realized just how pointless the slaughter had been. The tunnel had a collapsed switch at the other end of it, so there was no need for a grandstand to guard the back. Unless there was some box or whatever that had to be shuffled through first, of course. I bet he's just waiting at the other end with a hand on the switch, ready for when that dratted box of his gets through. I best hurry up. The long walk through the tunnel put Fayette into a particularly brooding mood. She had not had time to really consider the situation as a whole before now, and the questions that had been building up inside her were finally released. Can a ruler really just order their underlings to die, just like that? Is this what the divine providence of rulers is? To receive such a mandate of command as birthright, what does that do to a man? Fayette had never liked, Lord, Costelloni. She had always felt somewhat offended that she worked so hard to keep the mansion in a pristine state for such a man, especially as she knew how handsy he was with some of the servant women, before there had been irritation and distaste, but now she could only feel hate. However, a subtle fear still lurked in the back of her mind. Could she, a humble, maid, truly raise her hand against a, Lord? Her class had an inherently subservient relationship with his, though she had not felt anything as direct as the compulsion skill before. The memory of being controlled, compelled, forced to be an observer in her own body, it still lurked fresh in her mind. Can I even raise my hand against him? If I succeed, will I be smote down for my defiance? He has been chosen as a ruler, while I had to choose the path of a worker. The scriptures are clear that the natural order is not to be disturbed. Still, how could Fayette possibly stay her hand after what she had witnessed? She gripped her mop harder as she fixed her determination. Damn the consequences. If the heavens will smite me down for this, let them. Fayette knew that she had to be careful with this. The man may be a tad pudgy now, but he had served in the military. She needed to be able to catch him off guard to have any chance. I've got one free skill point now. I think I have to put it into maid's poise for this. Keeping my emotions and movements under control is probably the most important thing for this. Maid's poise advanced to level 3. All right, that should help a bit. The maid could feel her movements getting smoother, and the calm smile on her face became even more professional. Fayette walked a bit further, and eventually spotted two guards ahead. One was dragging that damned box, while the other was keeping an eye to the back, spear raised. His eyes widened as he saw who was coming through the tunnel. Fayette smiled broadly. Hey, the fight's won. We defeated the kobolds, hooray. She walked over to the men, and they watched her with apprehension. On began to speak, expression a bit guilty. Did you really, win? How did you manage, without burn her? Fayette smacked him on the back. Ah, it was fine, it was a tough fight, but we made it. I'll just head forward and tell that to the, Lord no need for you two to hurry ahead. Take a deserved rest. She started shuffling past them. It's just the 
Lord, and Bernard up ahead, right? Yeah, they went forward ahead of us. Fayette smiled at the men one last time, then headed forward. Bernard might complicate things, but she was sure she could manage something. The men had been close to the exit already, so Fayette only had a bit more to walk. She set down her mop against the wall, did a final brush off on her uniform to get the last bits of dirt off her, then started slowly walking towards the entrance. After getting close, she raised her voice and cried out. Excuse me, M Lord, are you out there? The kobolds have been dealt with, there were a lot less of them left than we thought, and we beat them back easily. She could hear shuffling from right outside the entrance, and then a large man appeared at the entrance, holding a rapier in her direction. Fayette responded with a disarming smile. After a moment's examination, a smile came on the, Lord's, face too. Ah, excellent, excellent news indeed. A pleasant surprise, he said, putting the rapier away. Fayette walked towards him and noticed to her frustration that the man was the cleanest person she had seen since the attack had begun, not a speck of blood or grime on him. She managed to feign a normal expression as she approached. The, Lord, walked back from the door to a pleasant forest meadow, and Fayette followed. She scanned the surroundings but saw no sign of Bernard. M Lord, are you safe out here? Isn't the, guard captain, guarding you? Fayette asked, careful to make her voice seem concerned. HM, you do not need to worry, he just went to secure the perimeter for a moment, should be back soon. Fayette's smile widened. Could this really be, a chance? I'll have to be quick with this. How many of the servants survived? If the kobolds are truly gone, they will have to be put to work at once to fix all the damage. The, Lord, asked, leaning against a tree. Seeing that the man did not hold a speck of concern for the dead, the calm anger in Fayette sharpened further. Before it had been a cold lake, but now it had frozen over. Fayette felt like she could cut the man to shreds with only the edges of her fury. I don't think he's being wary of me at all. He just, doesn't even consider me a potential threat. The moment felt dreamlike to Fayette, the calm clearing, the man sitting right there, defenseless, the chirping birds, it removed all traces of nerves she had felt. It felt like a moment of destiny, an opportunity provided just for her. She took out a cleaning rag and calmly started applying some, all-purpose cleaner, from her bottle to it. M Lord, a bit of grime seems to have gotten on your outfit. May I clean it off? She asked, making her best effort at a deeply concerned expression. The man raised his eyebrows at that, but a sly smile soon appeared on his face. Yes, sure, go ahead. It is good that you were one of the survivors, perhaps I'll reward you later. Fayette did not hear the man's words, she was already moving with a calm purpose. The cleaning rag went towards the outfit. She wanted to swerve it up to his face at the last moment, but suddenly there was a strange resistance in her arm. It just wouldn't move up. What? Is my class resisting an attempt to harm my employer? No. I refuse to accept him as my employer. This is no longer my household. I resign. She felt some change go through her, and the, Lord, shifted too, eyes widening. It was too late for him though. The resistance holding Fayette back was gone. Without hesitation, she swerved the rag right into his face. The, Lord, stood stunned for a split second, caught completely off guard. Then the sizzling liquid pain on his face began to register. He tried to open his mouth to scream out, but Fayette reacted by dragging the rag down, and pushing it whole inside his mouth. Muffled screams turned into quiet gurgles, and blood started pouring out his mouth. Fayette backed off as the man lashed out wildly with his arms. His eyes were already ruined, reduced to runny goop. The rest of his face was not doing much better either. He used some sort of skill, and a bottle of a red liquid appeared in his hand. Fayette narrowed her eyes. Oh no you don't. The, maid, drew a pair of forks into her hands, then aimed. She threw the forks off with the assistance of, cutlery control, and they moved straight to the potion holding arm. They pierced the skin, and the man dropped the potion bottle. He stumbled forward from the tree, grasping around desperately. Fayette circled behind him, then gathered all the power of her rage into a kick between the man's legs. She sent the kick out, and a sickening crunch sounded out. The man toppled backward on the ground, bringing his head conveniently right in front of Fayette's legs. She could no longer keep silent. You, sick, bastard, she shouted, 
accenting each word with a kick. I'll make sure no one recognizes your corpse. Think you can treat us like dirt and not suffer for it, do you? After another kick, she felt felt a satisfying snap from the man's neck. It wasn't enough. She let herself drown in the lake of anger, and the kicks kept coming. The man's head was tossed about wildly and his struggling gradually ceased. On some level, she kept waiting for something to stop her. Divine lightning, guards, Bernard, some defensive talisman, some elite, lord, skill, anything. It was all just going so well, it was so easy. But nothing came, so she did not stop. Kicking the man's head felt good, cathartic even. She did not know how long she kept at it before she finally backed off, leg sore. She noticed the distinctive ding she had been hearing a lot more often lately. A piece of trash taken out, keep it up, level up, you have reached made level 10. Congratulation. One skill point gained. New free skill slot unlocked. You have gained a new skill. Disarming smile. Progress towards next level. 15%. Wait, really? Even this? It was all too much. The encouraging message from the prompt was the final straw. And it sent the maid over the edge. Fayette's smile broke and gave way to laughter. 58. Chapter 7 Confrontation the system was rewarding her for this, even calling the man trash. Was this really happening, or had she lost it? The feeling was however unmistakable, gaining a level always sent a certain rush through your veins, and Fayette felt it. Is this a joke? I was rewarded for smiting one of their chosen, rulers. He was treated no different than any of those monsters. Her laughter began to grow hysterical, and she had to struggle to stay standing. It was just all too much. The message even cheerfully suggested she keep it up. It took her a full minute to calm down and look at her handiwork. The, Lord, lay as a mangled heap in a pool of blood, a complete mess by all measures. Still, Fayette could not help feeling like the sight was the cleanest, purest thing she had seen in a long time. The man would never again bring harm to anyone or sully anything. The permanence to it felt oh so sweet to Fayette. Usually after she got done with work, a vague nervousness would be in the back of her head, reminding her that soon enough she would have to return and do it all over. This was different. She did not have to think a second about this detestable man ever again. She was free. Ah, I could get used to this feeling. Is this what, maid, work should really be? Maybe I should. Before she could fall further into her reverie, a rustling in the woods nearby shook her out. The, guard commander, walked out with a blank expression on his face and a rapier pointed towards Fayette. Oh, right. The consequences. Standing over the bloody corpse of a, Lord, with lots of that blood on her shoes, Fayette knew she was in a rather compromising situation. She briefly considered making up some excuse, but she realized it would be futile. There would be no excusing this. Instead, she chose to own it. She turned to Bernard with no hesitation and leveled a judging gaze at him. Yes, I killed him. What are you going to do about it? She said with a slight smirk. Should have been done much earlier, would have saved a lot of lives from being pointlessly wasted. The, guard captain, did not respond, merely keeping up his silent stare. His outfit, a light officer's armor decorated with the yellow of the house and the deep red of the country, had few creases or smudges on it. It was an outfit that had not seen much battle today. Fayette started to get angry. And you, you are a strong fighter aren't you? If you had been leading, they could have held a narrow corridor like that forever against a disorderly mob of kobolds, but you weren't there. She shouted with growing anger and pointed a fork at the man. So many died in your place. It all just felt like such a waste to her. This was not how a proper household should work. Guards protected the non-combatants, not the other way around. The thrill of killing the, Lord, was starting to fade replaced by the realization of the scale of what had been lost. You should have done what I did long ago. The way the man kept his silence and maintained that infuriatingly placid face started to really grate on Fayette. With a growl, she threw a fork at the silent man using, cutlery control. Why are you silent? The, guard captain, easily flicked the fork down with his rapier, then looked down at it. A skill related to moving cutlery, definitely a, made, skill, he muttered to himself, then raised his gaze at the corpse. And a corpse murdered with a cleaning rag, his eyes shifted back to Fayette. 
you did not renounce your class after all, but did that as a maid, didn't you? He slowly lowered his rapier down, no longer keeping it up warily. What? Fayette responded, stunned. She quickly traced a square over her chest, warding herself from the evil talk. That was what you were worried about. The man did not look dismayed at all by the situation, he just turned to Fayette, still with that infuriating calm. Many people in situations like these cannot resist temptation, and are led astray. His gaze grew even more cold for a second. They have to be put down early. A murderer can level very quickly. Fayette just felt confused. This really was not the conversation she had been expecting. She looked down at the battered corpse under her. This, oh this, she said, gesturing at the corpse with a fork. Why would I need to stop being a maid to do this? The system even praised me for doing it. I gained a level. She finished, throwing her arms out. For the first time, some doubt entered Bernard's gaze, slightly fraying the calm. That is, unusual. I have not heard of, made, classes leveling through combat before, though similar things do happen with some other, worker, classes. He thought for a moment, then continued. However, you should know that it does not matter who a, fighter, kills, as long as they fulfill their profession, they are under the touch of grace. Do not take the encouragement as truth, as justification for your actions. Fayette had not known that. All the stories always told of fighters leveling through righteous crusades, but did it really not matter at all? Then why am I leveling from this? I understand the monsters, as cleaning the devil's creatures is surely looked upon with favor, but killing a lord. Deep in her thoughts, she almost missed Bernard walking past her. Shaken, she looked at him with confusion. What? You're just going to let me go, not going to do anything? Fayette asked, disbelieving. Slowly, she lowered her fork down. Bernard looked towards her, expression not moving one bit. I was a guard captain, in the employment of Lord Costelloni. He explained, then nodded towards the corpse. That is no longer the case. I am now free to do as I will until I seek my next place of employment. So you walked away from that battle just because you were in his employ? Fayette asked. Was that really all it took? He leveled a calm gaze at her, not seeming shaken in the slightest. The bonds of a ruler and their fighters go much deeper than mere servants. Surely you felt some of it today. It is much more for us. Sod off with that. I managed to struggle through. You could have done it yourself when he was off guard. You can detest me if you want to. There are many more like him, many much worse. Getting started on that, his facade lifted for just a second, and Fayette thought she saw, regret. It is not an easy path. He finished, returning to the calm. At that moment the man seemed different from his usual sharp self. The weariness in his voice belied a different truth, and Fayette realized that she had misjudged him. What she now saw was an old dusty piece of furniture, stored away in a backroom far off from any meaningful use. Fayette could not find the energy to keep being mad at the man. She knew her words would be meaningless. What are you going to do now? The kobolds are all gone, Fayette said. She was getting confused about this whole situation. What is this conversation even? You said the manner should be mostly clear. Best we head back and make sure the others know the Lord died in a sudden kobold ambush. Make no mistake, this whole kobold stampede was no accident. Your little stunt will probably go unnoticed if it seems like the Lord died in the attack. Ah, true that. Will that really work? She asked. Her adrenaline was fading, and she was starting to realize that she really did not have any plan at all. Bernard scoffed. They won't doubt my words. Besides, most will still be in shock. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter much what's said to the LOT. The man's cold outlook sent some shivers down Fayette's spine, but the words made sense. The man turned back without another word and headed back into the tunnel. Fayette stayed behind for just a moment. She had been gathering momentum all day since the attack began, and now it at last had come to a stop. She felt exhausted in all possible ways. The forest was pristine, lively birds chirping about in the trees without a worry. It was quite a contrast to the bloody corpse laying in the clearing. Fayette sighed, then grimaced as she noticed that she had gotten blood all over her outfit again. Shaking her head, she finally addressed the last system message, which had been waiting to enter her thoughts. D. 
disarming smile, the smile of a charming maid sets hearts at ease, calm nerves, ease apprehensions and dispel suspicions. The right smile in the right place can solve many of life's challenges. I'm really not sure how to feel about this one. Shaking her head, Fayette started heading back to the mansion. She got to the tunnel entrance, stopped for a moment, then turned back. She hurried to the tree and collected the healing potion that had fallen there. Satisfied, she once again started heading back to the mansion. Wait, why am I only taking this? Surely he's got some other good stuff on him. It's not stealing after all, I'm just cleaning away stuff that he won't be needing anymore. It's a, maid's, duty. She ran back one more time to frisk the, lord's, clothes for any valuables. Handling a dead body was a bit unpleasant, so she made sure to put her working gloves on. Ah, I really did a number on him. How much blood can you get out of one man? Still, he had plenty of good stuff. She didn't dare take his signet ring, as getting caught with that in her hands would be quite bad. She did pocket some of the coin he had on him, a girl could always use a few spare lever. He also had some curious magical trinkets on him, but she didn't dare touch them. They looked far too dangerous. Fayette was a bit disappointed at his lack of jewelry. Do male fashions really have to be so austere? I could use a few necklaces or whatnot. Determined to take something valuable along, Fayette was pleased to find a small orb in his pocket. It was perfectly spherical and glowed with a calm green. It was clearly magical, but as it was not attached to any device, Fayette felt it would be safe. She had always had a habit of collecting interesting rocks for her alchemy purposes, so she decided to tuck it into her rock pouch. She deserved some severance pay, right? 51. Chapter 8 More Severance Pay Fayette walked back through the tunnel, but stopped once she noticed a particular annoyance. That damned box had been left right there, unattended in the middle of the tunnel. She considered trying to pry it open, but the thing seemed sturdy, it would probably be beyond her. Shaking her head, she continued on. Just what is inside that blasted thing? Now I've gotten all curious about it. She found the mansion in a state of bustle. The survivors had grieved for their time, but once Bernard had returned with the news, more practical matters had come to the front. No one was in charge of the place anymore, a mansion full of riches and treasures. It would be shame to just leave it all there, right? Someone had to take care of it all. A silent agreement had passed, and the survivors had come to a unanimous decision. It was time to loot the place for all it was worth. Fayette was a bit late to the party, having spent some time going over the Lord's, belongings. She even had a suspicion that Bernard had hurried back so fast just so he could secure first pickings. Not that Fayette could have stopped the, guard captain, from taking what he wanted, she did not quite dare oppose the man. The mansion still had plenty for her anyways. A lot of the manor's valuables were behind locks only the, Lord, could open, but Fayette had figured out methods to clear a few. She knew from experience what types of locks the different storages used, and a few of them were not too difficult to break into. An idea on how to break into one particular storage had come to her as she was leaving the clearing. After frisking the, Lord, she had cut off the fingertip of his right thumb. Now she fished out the fingertip from the napkin she had stored it in. With it in hand, she went to a certain corner in the manor's master bedroom. She cleared the dust on the wall a bit, then pushed the fingertip onto a wooden panel that looked just like any other piece of the wall. Ordinary in all ways except the frequency with which Fayette had to clear oily thumbprints from that spot, that was. A magical glow began to shine out from behind the panel, and Fayette watched with anticipation as it came off wholesale, revealing a small space inside. I never did find out what this place actually held. Hopefully this is the secret treasure hoard or something. Instead of the mountains of money she had hoped for, the insides held only a plain leather bag. Fayette however was not disappointed as she recognized what she was looking at. A. Bag of holding. Fayette took it out full of excitement, then pried it open. It was her first time actually using one of them, so she was surprised to see only a black void within. Puzzled, she tried to peer through, but no light could penetrate the barrier. Fayette did not see any other options, so she thrust her hand inside and felt around. She could feel a lot of flat pieces of wood and rolled cloth, but not any obvious treasures. Confused, she pulled one of the pieces out, revealing an abstract painting depicting some confusing scene of geometric shapes. Fayette grimaced, 
then investigated more. She pulled out more things from the bag, but all she found was more paintings. What is this? Was the, Lord, collecting ugly paintings? Or are these for some illicit trade deal? There's no way it would fly if a, maid, just showed up trying to peddle a mountain of paintings like this. Still, the bag itself was valuable and useful enough on its own, anything inside would have only been a bonus. Fayette took the bag and affixed it over one of the many pockets on her apron. I'll call this my, apron of holding. She used the same fingerprint method for a few other choice spots and managed to find herself a few, potions of healing, valuable finds indeed. Usually only, rulers, mags, and particularly influential hunters could have access to those. Oh, potions of minor healing, were plentiful enough, but the difference in potency was so stark that it was almost insulting to consider them the same class of item. She also cleared away a good chunk of money, enough levers to last her for quite a while if she was patient with it. She had to be careful though, suspicions of thievery would be troublesome to handle. Fayette longed for a good cleaning session just to get all the grime off her, but could not get herself to use any of the bathing facilities at the mansion. It just felt wrong to clean oneself in a place so sullied with blood and death. Instead, she lightly splashed some water on herself from the washing basin to get the worst of the blood off, further washing would have to wait. Fayette stopped to look over a rack of swords as she walked from the washing basin back to the manor proper in search of more loot. In a way the swords called to her, she had found out today that she did have a certain aptitude for killing. Fayette didn't think she could be just any normal, maid, ever again. She experimentally picked one of the swords up and swung it about, but it felt all wrong. Fayette was still a, maid, after all, and what kind of, maid, would brandish swords like this? It did not feel right. She set it back down, then walked off to the nearby cleaning cupboard from where she chose a particularly sturdy broom. It felt a lot better in her hand. Compared to the sword, she felt, complete. It was almost as if her class itself was thrumming with approval at handling the tool. I have skills that can make use of a broom, so perhaps it is natural that this is what I should use. Experimentally, she tried putting it inside her brand new, apron of holding, and to her joy she found it fit quite snugly into the bag. This is so handy, now I can bring all my cleaning tools with me wherever I go. Filled with excitement, Fayette crammed almost half the cleaning cupboard into her, apron of holding, before she remembered that this was perhaps not the most urgent thing to loot. Oh, right. Money and magical tools and stuff. She jumped off and went back to work. Bernard had been rather methodical and fast in his looting and the other survivors had chosen to leave the place together with him. Their looting had been frantic but bountiful, they even found an additional survivor. One of the, cooks, had hidden himself in the freezer, and apparently, the cold-blooded kobolds had not been too keen on venturing inside the ice-cold room. The man was shocked to find the mansion in utter ruins with the vast majority of the servants dead, and only managed to stare around blankly in shock as the others had continued with their work. They left soon afterwards, all as one group. Fayette however didn't go with them and lingered behind. Soon she was alone in the desolate mansion. She did not really find much else of value she could take with her. The others had been thorough. A lot of the stuff was set with distinctive heraldry, making fencing it off discreetly a tall task. Much of the wealth of the manor was also in cumbersome objects, glorious chandeliers, fine mahogany chairs and elegant crystal vases not really something she could spirit away. Walking through the lifeless and destroyed halls filled Fayette with a melancholy. She had spent three long years cleaning these corridors. Seeing the shredded wallpapers, broken flooring and lifeless corpses made her realize again just how much had been lost. In a way, she felt strangely possessive of the place. Soon word would go out, and some other fool would be sent here to man the place. New servants would be brought in, the halls would be repaired and then redecorated to fit a new image. Fayette, did not like that idea. Did some random guy who had never even been in the place before really have more of a claim to ownership than she did? She began to feel annoyed. Annoyed that the place had been reduced to such a state, annoyed that some fool would take it all. She looked at the corpses that had been left here, and she also felt annoyed that not everyone would get a proper burial. Not all families would have the coin to arrange one. An idea bloomed in her mind. Maybe I should do a proper send-off for the place. Just burn it all down. Fayette honestly found the idea rather inviting. 
the feeling of throwing down a torch and walking off to a new future as the old one burned behind her, it spoke to her. She was a bit of a romantic with things like this. Enthralled, Fayette set off and began gathering a variety of flammable materials, liquors, dry firewood, newspapers. She gathered it all and began building a grand pyre in the main entrance hall. She poured down a trail of oil from the pyre to the outside of the manor, then turned to look back at the mansion. Normally at this time, the oil lights outside the manor would be swaying in the wind and a soft light would shine out from the windows, hinting at the life inside. Now all that remained was a hollow husk, silent and lifeless. Even the birds seemed to be avoiding the manor, not making one bit of sound. Only the soft autumn wind rustling through the trees woke Fayette from her reverie. She shuddered as she felt the cold touch on the back of her neck. Resolved, she lit a match, then tossed it onto the end of the oil trail. Flames lit out and, in an instant, advanced inside the manor. Fayette could hear all the flammable materials inside roar to life and saw a bright orange glow shine out from the windows, a last, brilliant gasp of life from a dead husk. Without waiting, Fayette turned around and walked off. It was time to head to the village, see her friend, get freshened up, and then get rested. After that, what should I be doing after all this? She did not know what the future would bring, but of one thing she was sure. She would never again carelessly subordinate herself to a ruler. That feeling of being controlled, stripped of her will, she did not want to feel it again. Can I ever again trust someone with that kind of power? I won't be naive again. In a way, her class felt a bit incomplete right now. A maid, without a master, without a household, something was missing. When she had first gotten the class, Fayette had dreamed of serving a beautiful lady, attending to elegant tea parties and dressing her master in fancy clothes. Reality had been different. Something in that dream still called to her, but Fayette shook it off. No, it would be too risky, wouldn't it? I'll need to think about this. Can a maid go about things alone? Without a master, I'll at least give it a try. Fayette felt at the broom in her hand and knew that she would not be an ordinary maid anymore. The broom felt different than it had just this morning, heavier. She had a feeling that her future would involve a lot more cracking skulls, and in a way, she was looking forward to it. By all measures it had been a horrifying day, but despite that, Fayette found herself smiling. The lives she had ended, the pyre burning behind her, the blank future she was facing. It all felt so clean. Party status. Spoiler. Fayette. Class. Mate. Tier 1. Level. 10. Skills. Housekeeping, two-fourths. Sweep dust, rank three. Cleaning tool proficiency, rank three attendant, three-quarters. Maid's poise, rank three. Cutlery control, rank I. Disarming smile, rank I capstone skills, zero, zero. Not applicable free skills, two-thirds. Eavesdrop, rank two. Basic alchemy, cleaning agents, Rank 2 free slot unspent skill points, 1. Collapse. 49. Chapter 9 Interlude, A Plot Gone Awry. An hour or so later, in a meadow some distance from the manor, a lord was waiting. This lord was rather different from Lord Castella. Lean, muscular, military, face rife with anticipation and ambition. A plot long in the making was finally being unveiled and he was ready to bring things to a clean finish. The horse under him was as restless as he was, tired from the long ride and wait. The Lord kept waiting for word to come, for an all clear, so that the operation could begin. Rustling sounded out from the other side of the meadow, and a knight rode into the clearing. Elated, the Lord rode forward, but the words brought were not the ones he had been expecting. My Lord, there's trouble. The manor, it's burning down. The knight shouted out, words just barely audible midst the clanking of his armor. The lord pulled at his reins and brought his horse to a stop before it could get properly started. He looked at the knight, confused. Wait, what? What did you just say? I said, the manor is burning down. Something's gone wrong. The lord's face fell into a deep frown. What? Why the hell is the mansion burning down? The Knight, brought his horse to a stop and sighed deeply. He would have liked to know too, to be honest. 
things were just really not going according to plan, Lord, I'm not sure, somehow the kobolds broke through, and there seems to have been a massacre, there was nobody alive in the vicinity, man or kobold. The, Lord, closed his eyes and let the truth sink in, things were going to get very complicated, weren't they? It was supposed to have been a simple plot, a horde of kobolds would be led to the manor, depleting its defenses of energy. Once the exhausted defenders went to rest, a strike team could easily break through the remaining wards and secure the target. After all, there's no way a mansion with proper defenses and competent defenders would fall to a simple kobold horde, right? It just doesn't make sense. The, Lord, muttered, these types of defenses should easily be able to handle such a number of kobolds. The, Knight, breathed in, this next part would be troublesome, my, Lord, there may have been foul play afoot, our plot might have been compromised. The, Lord, narrowed his eyes, go on. Sir, we actually found the remains of, Lord, Castella near the site, as well as our target. The, Lord's, face brightened up, but that's great news, if the old bastard has kicked the bucket and we have the target, things should be fine. He stopped, face furrowed, though, you said there were complications. Yes, that's the tricky part. The, Lord, was not killed by kobolds, but by man. His face had been melted down using some vicious acid mixture, and, the, knight, took a breath in. The command seal was taken from him. The artifact itself was found, locked securely in a nearby chest, but the command seal was nowhere to be seen. The, Lord, was silent for a good while, taking in the news. His face grew shaken as he finally comprehended what was going on. What? Only the command seal? But that would mean, no, it doesn't make sense. Why take only the, unless, no, who would bother to? Are there any other clues? The, knight, nodded. Sir, we surveyed the outside of the manor, and the power gem in the ward core seemed to have been completely out of energy. One that size shouldn't have been drained so much, so we suspect something was done to sabotage it. The acid, the sabotage, these are signs of a professional at work. That's not all, we just finished our survey and new clues were found. A new voice said, the, Lord, and, Knight, turned as another horse rode into the meadow, this one carrying a, mage. His long sleeves swished in the wind, revealing the barest hints of the expansive tattoos covering his body. What have you found? The, knight, asked. The, mage, brought his horse to a stop, then searched through the many pockets in his robe, until he eventually found a test tube. It contained a liquid with some fine grains of metal in it. He held it out proudly, but only two confused looks answered him. He scoffed. I investigated the area for mana residue and found indicators that a major alchemical reaction took place earlier today. The expenditure was not insignificant, some major ingredients were used. He tucked the test tube back in and looked the, Lord, in the eyes. It is highly likely that a, mage, was involved. There's ignis residue in the air. The, Lord, furrowed his brow. Lord, Castella is not known to employ people with such talents, this might be our perpetrator at work. Troublesome, but not surprising. For someone to have found out and set up such a thing, they would have to have major backing. Some major faction is setting themselves against us. The, mage, nodded, then continued. That's not all, I just got the results for our fingerprint scan. The, lords, corpse and the power gem had the same fingerprints all over them. The, lord, bristled and narrowed his eyes. That settles it. This is definitely no accident. We'll have to find where the leak was. I'll not allow us to be taken advantage of. Should we send out a search party? The town is quite nearby. The, knight, asked. The, lord, thought for a moment, then shook his head. No, our assailant is too prepared. They wouldn't choose someone under level 30 for something like this. Catching them after a head start of ours, it would be futile. Showing up in town so soon after an event like this, it would only serve to implicate us. A needless risk. He turned to the, mage. Can you locate the command seal? If we can do that, we'll be fine. The, mage, nodded. It can be done, though I will have to return to my lab to perform the ritual. The seal is intrinsically linked to the artifact, and that link won't be undone easily. If we make haste, I can have the divination done in a week, 
and we'll get the general location of it. Doesn't this seem strange? The knight asked, worried by the news. If the link is so easy to trace, they have to know it too, right? It seems like they want us to seek them out. The lord nodded, an invitation. He started to turn his horse around, and the other two rode to follow. The lord's face was dark, but also calm. He was no inexperienced level 20 newbie anymore. He had experience and honor. If he was given an invitation, he would accept it. We ride back immediately. It is an obvious trap or provocation of some sort, but the only way to deal with such things is to jump right in. A slap to the face like this, it cannot go unanswered. Whichever, Lord, thinks they can poke at me, I'll show them. They'll learn. They all will. 50. Chapter 10 The Sauna and the Semstress. If Sauna, spirits and tar don't help. The illness is deadly. Old Gaulian saying, the walk to the town was not a long one, and Fayette soon the familiar silhouettes. Today, the town was surrounded by a dimly glowing blue field. Fayette approved. Good, if they've put the wards up, they've probably been alert. Things should be fine. The walk through the woods had been a bit unnerving, normally the woods felt familiar and safe, but the day's events had Fayette jumping at every shadow. She was glad to be back in safety. Fayette did not feel like being subjected to the stairs that walking through town in her bloody get-up could bring. Word from the others would have been brought in, but she did not want to deal with any of that. She ignored the main path and began circling around the fields on her way to the orphanage. She felt a cool chill as she passed through the ward. There was a bit of resistance to the membrane, but once it recognized her signature as one keyed to the town, it faded. Fayette stepped through and arrived outside the orphanage's hedge fences. The orphanage was a dreary building at the edge of town. Once, it had been a fashionable winter manor for some, Lord, but after a few decades of disuse, it had fallen into disrepair. It had been too much of a bother to repair the place into fit shape, so it had been reproposed to serve as a home for the needy. If you really squinted, you could still see some remnants of the grandness that had once graced the place, but it did not hold up to closer inspection. The paint was flaked off the walls and few windows were intact. Fayette walked through the gates and saw that her friend, Mireille, was waiting for her. The young, semstress, was pacing by the entrance, brown hair in a tangle and face furrowed deep in worry. Usually there was something of a skittish fox to her face, but now it showed only concern. Fayette only had a split second to take in the sight before she was noticed. Her friend ran over and the maid was instantly engulfed in a crushing hug. As Fayette felt Mireille's messy hair brushing against her face, she felt that familiar urge to start tidying it up. Her fingers twitched from the instinct, which served to snap her out of the shock. Ah, Mireille, sorry, I didn't know you were waiting here, she said, before relaxing and returning the hug. Mireille brought her head up and looked the maid in the eye. Faye, you idiot, of course I would be. After hearing what happened, the others said you were safe, but you took so long in coming. What were you doing? Fayette had not really considered such things and started to feel a bit guilty for spending all that time building an elaborate pyre. She had been a bit out of it. Those events were the type to put a girl in a certain type of mood. I'm sorry. It's been quite the day. It was crazy. I was just sweeping some dust, doing proper cleaning work like I do. Then blam, a kobold just crashes through the window. Fayette felt her mind relax and the words began pouring out. Without realizing it, she had been waiting for a chance to tell someone about her experience. And then I killed it. Me. I whacked it in the head with a broom, and it died, just like that. It felt so, simple, so sudden, and I even leveled from it. I had to go through the manor, but there were more of them, so I just kept going, I kept going, and they kept dying, to me. Faye, Muriel tried to interject, but her words passed right through the, maid completely unnoticed. And then I found the others, but the, Lord, the bastard, he, Fayette felt a spark of indignation, and her grip tightened. He did it, he forced us to stay and fight, in a stupid spear line, and ran off. I managed to pull off that one gas trick, you know the one, I told you about it. The monsters died, then I went to the, Lord, and I killed him too. Just like that. The system even congratulated me. Then I got all mopey and decided to burn the place down, and then. 
Fayette realized that she felt a hand desperately tapping her on the back and was pulled out of her babbling. She finally registered a desperate, strained voice. Faye, Faye, Fayette, you are crushing me. She realized that her grip really had gotten quite intense there at the end, and pulled back, blushing lightly. Released, Mire backed off and took a few deep breaths to gather herself, then turned to address the blood-soaked, maid. Faye, you are babbling, and about some things I'm pretty sure you should not be saying out here in the open, she said, pointing a decisive finger at Fayette. Ah, true that. Murdering nobility is something I really should not be shouting out to the world. Mire, however was not done, she walked closer, and poked her finger at Fayette's face. Second, you are a mess. I know how you are, if you are walking around looking like that, there is no way you are going to be able to calm down. Fayette winced back, then took a proper look at the, semstress. She was dressed in a practical outfit, a simple and loose grey dress. At least it had been a plain grey dress. Now it was decorated further by streaks of red. Fayette cringed at the mess she had made. Yeah, I really do need to get clean. Mire withdrew her finger, then gestured towards a building separate from the main orphanage, where a chimney was busy billowing out smoke. Don't worry, I've made preparations. Let's go get you washed up. That was the best thing Fayette had heard in a long while. She smiled brightly, a very different smile from the ones she had worn so far this day. Mire, you are a lifesaver. She shouted out, grabbing her friend back into a crushing hug. Gya, don't get any more of that blood all over me. Fayette could have gone for a bath, but such facilities were not for the use of meager, workers, like her. Here in the countryside, humble folk made do with a simple sauna, but Fayette had no issues with that. She had always enjoyed the practice. It felt like it was not just the physical grime she was clearing away, there was something more to it. As she stripped herself bare of the sullied clothes and ran some lukewarm water over herself, Fayette felt like some more symbolic taint was being washed away along with the blood. It had been a day of killing and death, but once she was seated inside the hot room, Fayette at last felt that it was over. She sighed as she felt the hot steam run over her skin, it was like a dark veil that had been covering her senses was finally being cast off. She picked up the ladle and threw some more water on the stove. The water sizzled pleasantly as it turned to steam, and Fayette sat up straighter to make sure she felt as much of the heat as possible. After she felt it pass, she slunk back with a sigh. What a day. So, feel any better Fay? a voice asked from beside her. I can't even imagine what you've been through. Fayette looked to the side but saw only Mireille's vague outline. It was a dark room with the only light being the dim flickering of the fire, which revealed little. It almost felt like she was speaking to some disembodied voice in the darkness. It was a nice feeling. Fayette had always found that being bare in the hot darkness made it easier to form her thoughts. Normally she was not much good at articulating things. It all still feels like a dream to be honest, Fayette said softly, voice but a whisper. She felt that if she just closed her eyes and let herself fall asleep, she would wake up back in the servant's quarter, just like any other day. Being caught up in it I felt so full of fire and fury, I actually held my own in battle. Fayette began to recount everything that had passed, with a more calm mind this time. Mire did not interrupt, letting the, maid, get all her feelings out. The tale was accented by the occasional sizzles of steam from water being thrown on the stove. A long moment of silence followed once Fayette finished. That thing with the command skill, it is disturbing. I've always thought that there was more to classes than they told us, but to think something like that is possible. Mire said slowly, thinking over her words. I understand why you're wary of becoming a subordinate. Honestly, now I am too. Mire picked up the ladle and threw some water onto the stove. I am however curious about how you leveled so much through combat. I wonder if the same could apply to a, semstress. I'm not sure how it works to be honest. Bernard said something about similar things happening to other, worker, classes, but he did not give any details. Fayette replied. She closed her eyes in thought. It just felt, right, like it was something I should do. Maybe that's just the type of, maid, I am, one with a more, direct approach to removing filth. Mire handed the ladle over to Fayette and leaned back on the bench. You say that like you plan to continue fighting. You are a free, maid, now, 
what are you going to do for work? We can probably get the orphanage to let you stay for a bit, but I'm not supposed to be staying here for much longer either. Fayette threw some more water on the stove while she thought. What did she want? She had always been a bit ambitious, and the rapid leveling had been pretty thrilling. What would such a path look like? She could hardly just become some wandering vagrant. She closed her eyes and tried to pass her feelings as the steam rose up. Making the world a cleaner place by hunting down monsters did have an appeal, and Fayette did not feel her class resist the idea. I do think I have some talent in that. I managed pretty well in all the fights, didn't I? You know Mireille, I've never wanted to be just an ordinary, maid. I've always wanted to be something of my own, get an uncommon class upgrade, then a rare one, then go even further, past level 50. The, maid, opened her eyes and leaned forward, looking at the fire roaring in the stove. The holy book says that one's leveling pace is determined by challenge, danger and following their class's path. An ordinary, maid, just doing her job and following orders, they'll probably get a common upgrade at 15 and start stagnating, never getting much past 35. Not unless you have some interesting specialization, or are constantly changing up what you do, seeking new challenges. She turned her gaze to Mireille, and the only thing visible in the dark were her eyes which reflected the fire burning in the stove. So, I was thinking, what do I have to do to become a person who could go far? I think my actions today are enough for an uncommon class up at 15, but what about the next one after that? So, Mireille began, rolling the ladle around in the bucket. You don't want this fighting thing to be one-off. You want to keep at it. But really, is that the way of a maid? What do you think the purpose of a maid is, Mireille? Well, cooking and cleaning I suppose, attending to the master's needs, and organizing practical matters. Fayette shook her head, that is what a maid generally ends up doing, but not really the purpose of it all. Why do they do those things? What is the objective? I don't think I've though about it like that. I have, Fayette said, even before today. A maid is linked to a household, and her purpose is to make sure that household works as it should. Food, laundry, cleaning, those are things a household needs so that it can function. A maid is someone who ensures that things at the household work as they should. Ensures that when things need to happen, there are no obstructions. Mire threw some water on the stove and let the sentence hang as the steam sizzled forth. Eventually, she hummed thoughtfully, I see where you're going with that. Is that why you got class progress from the killing today? Your targets were obstructing the proper working of a household, as you would put it. The maid nodded in agreement. She had been thinking on the matter after the fights were over, and she had come to the same conclusion. So, if I want to progress with my maid class properly, I'll need to keep doing that, but will a normal household be enough? There's only so much you can do. So, here's the thing I was thinking. She took a deep breath, and turned to Mire. She held her hands out, what if, she stretched her hands out to the sides, I were to take like a really big household, I could be helping out everyone. She let the sentence hang, and the room fell into a long spell of silence. Eventually Mire sighed. Faye, are you sure you're right in the head? Did you take any hard hits? Fayette bristled back, folding her hands in. What? What do you even mean by everyone? Everyone you meet, the country, the world, really? You alone? Shouldn't you start off with something just a bit simpler? Something like, I don't know, a village, a city or something like that. Honestly, even protecting a manor seemed to be quite the job. Mire picked up the ladle and started twirling it around in the bucket watching the waves it made in the water. We are small people, and the dual monarchy is a big country. I get what you're saying, but grand dreams are just that, grand dreams. Think about something more practical, once you walk out of this village, what are you actually going to do? You want to fix things, how can you do that? What's the first practical step? Fayette turned to look back at the fire. Something practical, huh? Well, I'll need something that I can use to kill monsters at least. That's the easiest thing to think of. After that, we'll see. Still, that really only leaves one choice then. I think, I'm going to try and join the Hunter's Guild. Mireille audibly groaned. Gah, I knew you were going to say that, she said. 
and I'm sure you will actually do it. Fayette blinked, what, is there some issue with me becoming a hunter? Not really, it's just such a, you know, it's what all the boys with some skill at arms think, like, if there's a list of things to do to go off on an adventure, that's always the first step, woohoo, let's join the guild. What, you think it's too cliche or something, you have a better idea. It's not that, it's just, you're doing it because you want to get lots of levels, right? You're probably planning on rushing off without any further planning, aren't you? Fayette threw some water on the stove and paused as she listened to the sizzling of the steam. Am I supposed to do something first? She heard a groan from beside her. Mire began to rise up but winced back down as she hit the hot steam near the ceiling. Grumbling, she prodded a finger at the maid. You. You've just found out that you can level by killing monsters and lords, but just how far does that go? Is your theory about the purpose of maids correct? Does hunting wild rabbits count? What about bears, owlbears, anything else? She prodded again. Have you really planned out your combat options, practiced fighting at all? Have you formed a leveling plan? Classing for combat is not to be taken lightly. Will they even let you join the guild? You are a maid. Dot. Test experiment. Practice. Mire accented each word with a poke to Fayette's cheek. Fayette gulped. I really didn't think about anything like that. She decided to try out. Disarming smile. Well, I managed fine with the kobolds, right? She said, a proper, maid's, smile on her face. Mire was not fooled. She knew Fayette too well for that. The, semstress, grimaced, and leaned back into the bench. All right, tomorrow you are coming with me. You are going to be figuring this stuff out. 47. Chapter 11 Dressed to Kill It was not much trouble to arrange for Fayette to stay at the orphanage for a bit, she still remembered all the personnel after all. The caretakers were understanding about her predicament, and so she headed off to sleep after a light meal. Fayette spent the night sleeping in the same bed as Mire. The place was too cramped to have free beds for weary travelers, but Fayette could make do. It was nostalgic, she had forgotten how loud some of the younger children could get before bedtime, but it didn't mar her rest. She drifted off to sleep peacefully, dreaming of adventure. Fayette woke up late the next day to the sight of Mire busy at work fixing up all the tears in her uniform's apron. The woman was a level six, semstress, so she had decent enough skills already. The needle swished this way and that with supernatural grace, leaving little indication there had been frays in the cloth at all. Fayette looked over to the side and saw the bright sunlight filtering through the window covering. Must be almost midday as the kids aren't around. When have I last overslept? Sloppy of me. Mire's already gotten to work, and here I have been sleeping. I can't believe you're struggling to make ends meet with skills like that, Fayette said, yawning, as she dragged herself out from under the sheets. Mire looked over from her work. She only needed to physically hold the needle for really precise bits, most of the time it floated through the air on its own. A perk of her skills, though Fayette did not honestly see the use of it. Just bad times to be a, semstress. With those new sewing machines coming about, there's no way for someone as low level as me to get any employment. At least in any reasonable manner, Mire replied. I don't know what I would do if I couldn't find, maid, work, Fayette sighed. What? You're planning on heading out to be a hunter, is that really, maid, work? Fayette hopped off the bed, I mean, I'm a, maid, so if I go and do it, then of course it's, maid, work, what else would I be doing? Mire had stopped sewing and was looking at Fayette with something akin to fascination, that logic is completely circular, it makes no sense at all. The, maid, stretched her arms, hey, it makes sense to me and that's all that matters. The, semstress, sighed and went back to repairing the outfit. Well, if it works for you, maybe I should consider something similar. Finished with her stretching, Fayette began making the bed, she had standards for this sort of thing. Mire looked over from her work and furrowed her brow. By the way, should I even be repairing your, maid, clothes? Are you really planning on going monster hunting in a skirt and apron? Fayette turned back, horror on her face. What? You want me to wear pants or something? No way in hell, that would be absolutely scandalous. Hey, language. 
Fayette turned back to folding the sheets and rolled her eyes. The girl is 17 and still sticking to orphanage rules like that. She really needs to get out of here. Sooner the better. I'm a maid, so obviously I'm going to be wearing a maid's uniform. That's that. Haven't you heard of the saying, the right clothes for the right job? Fayette nodded her head. Of course, a maid uniform is the right clothing for every job after all. Mire shook her head and lifted up the apron she had been repairing, showing how it no longer had any tears on it. Well, I'm pretty much done with your precious uniform now, so do give it a try. It was a right mess, I actually got a level up from repairing it. Oh, nice. Did you get a new skill for level 7? Mire grinned and eyed Fayette's figure, covered only in a thin chemise. I got a very useful skill indeed. It's called, take measurements, dot. Suddenly Fayette felt as if the, semstress's, gaze was piercing, and she shivered. Wait wait wait, what exactly do you think you are measuring? Don't worry, I already measured you up much earlier. You are certainly growing in all the right places. Don't worry, I made proper adjustments for your clothes. Hey, don't use skills like that on me without asking. The, semstress, made her best attempt at an innocent expression. I was just repairing your outfit out of the goodness of my heart, and I didn't dare wake you from your rest. She batted a few innocent eyelashes at the maid. It was only for the sake of the clothes, all right? Fayette groaned and went back to folding the bedsheets. Fine, fine, have it your way. Just ask me next time, all right? Fayette finished making the bed, and Mire put the stack of mended clothes on top of it. Fayette looked over the clothes, curious. Her apron and bodice had taken the most damage, but she could not find any traces of the damage anymore. It was almost as good as new. Do be a bit careful with them from now on, Mire said as she followed Fayette's gaze. Mend, doesn't make fabric out of nothing, so it's all a bit thinner than it was before. Should still be good for a while though. Fayette nodded her thanks, then began putting the clothes on. First, she pulled on her stockings, and fixed them in place with garters laced just below the knee. Next, she took up her corset, and started lacing it down from the front. It was a snug fit, quite a bit more comfortable than it had been just yesterday. All right, maybe I'll forgive her using that, take measures, skill. This is comfy. Next was a white petticoat, and then the black wool skirt over it. The weather was starting to get colder, so the thick wool was welcome. With that done, all that remained was putting on her black wool bodice, tucking it into the skirt, then putting on her apron. Now her basic outfit was complete. That is quite a lot of layers for something you plan on moving a lot in, Mire said, observing the process. Do you have my collar and headwear somewhere? They weren't with the rest of the clothes, Fayette asked. What, are you planning on putting them on today? I thought those were only for formal occasions. Fayette sighed. This was a conversation she had gone through quite often at the manor. Look, I can't just leave an outfit incomplete like that. I just like having everything on at all times, the complete set. Mire quirked an eyebrow at that, but offered no further questions. Well, the rest is in the box under the bed. They hadn't really suffered any damage at all anyways, they were fine with just a wash. Fayette pulled out the box and smiled as she saw the missing pieces. She quickly set the collar on her bodice, then tied up her hair into a quick knot and put on headwear. At last, she felt complete. She did a few experimental stretches and found that it actually felt a bit easier to move around in than before. Hey, this actually feels different, less resistance to movement and stuff. I'm not a, semstress, for nothing, you know. You could have told me about that magical bag in the pocket though, almost broke a needle on it. Ah, sorry, slipped my mind. Well, nothing to it. Put your boots on, we've got a busy day ahead of us. We do. After a quick breakfast the pair set off towards the forest. Fayette could not help herself from staring at Mire as she gracefully moved through the trees. She was another person who always moved decisively. She did not miss any steps or stop to look for the way. No, she just moved on, steadily. Fayette was a bit clumsier, stumbling over the odd stump here and there. Still, she managed to keep pace and did not fall behind. Much at least. Hey, 
I put some buttons in your skirt so you can pull it up for ease of movement. Makes it a lot easier to move around, Mire said as she watched Fayette's skirt catch on a branch, causing her to stumble over another stump. Fayette got back her footing and glared at her. Hey, I'm not going to start flashing my ankles around or anything, all right? A proper skirt is kept at a proper length. Mire rolled her eyes. Well, have it your way then. I guess you did manage to make it work yesterday. Today, the semstress had focused on practicality with her clothes. Her brown skirt flitted a lot more freely than Fayette's, and she was wearing a loose button-down blouse as her top. Fayette however was resolute with her choice of outfit, she would not be dissuaded by some branches and brambles. They stopped every now and then to check over the many traps the semstress kept here. Her work with strings and threads was good for more than just sewing, especially when aided with a basic trap setting skill. Small snares made from durable, but near invisible thread were set all over the forest. Food at the orphanage would get samey without some personal additions every now and then. So, what exactly is the purpose of this? Fayette asked. She had been so busy scanning the forest for any possible threats that the matter had completely slipped her mind this far. You said that you gained experience from every kill you had, didn't you? We are going to test how much what you kill matters. For example I do get small amounts of experience from working with these snares, and of them working, but have never gained any from killing the animals like you have. You had your theory, let's test if it's true. Who knows, maybe you'll get experience from all killing? Wait, you mean? Yes, it's exactly as you imagine, Mire responded before Fayette could form her thoughts. Look, we've caught one here, she said, pointing out the next snare. A large hair was caught in it, struggling against the knot it had gotten caught in. Mire smiled, then turned to Fayette. Looks like we'll be eating some extra meat today. Kill that, and we'll see if you get any experience. 43. Chapter 12 What exactly counts as cleaning? Mire eyed the hair as it struggled in the snare. She licked her lips, then pushed Fayette towards the struggling animal. All right, let's see how far you can take this cleaning thing of yours. This is pretty different from killing monsters, Fayette responded, eyeing the hair with just a bit of apprehension. Mire shrugged. Eh, hey, they are pests for gardens are they not? It's worth a try. Fayette still wasn't completely convinced. She had never come along on these hunts of Mire's before, but she was a new woman now. A prospective hunter wouldn't shy away from hunting. The maid took up her broom, redded it, then slammed it right at the hair. She missed. The hair had managed to kick itself just a bit off the path of the hit. Fayette narrowed her eyes, taunting her, was it? Well, she had a lot more broom to give. She took up her broom, then hit again. This time however, she did not stop, no, she kept hitting. The first strikes were still misses, but then she got the creature, right on the head. The next dozen hits were a lot easier to hit. So were the dozen after those. Fayette only stopped when she felt a drop of blood splash against her uniform, which made her recoil away from the creature instinctively. Though, creature, was putting it a bit generously, little more than bloody pulp remained. As the haze in her mind cleared, Fayette realized that she may have gone too far. She turned to Mire and made an attempt at her best, disarming smile. Hey, I got it. The semstress was staring at the remains of the hair with a complicated expression on her face as if she couldn't choose between fascination, resignation and disappointment. That you did. The creature was plenty dead after the first strike. She turned her eyes to Fayette. I don't think the next twenty served much purpose. Also, after a display like that I really don't think that smile will work. Hey, you've got to make sure it's dead, alright? I'm just being thorough. Monsters are easy, they just go pop when they're done. How am I supposed to tell that this thing is dead? Fayette said as she pointed at her handiwork. Mire turned her eyes back to the bloody pulp. How indeed? I think it was a bit of a clue when it stopped moving. Hey, you never know if it's playing dead, and waiting for a chance to escape or something. Always be thorough. Mire shook her head and turned to walk away. I don't think we're going to be making lunch of that, I'm impressed you managed to mangle it that bad with just a broom to be honest. Besides, we've gotten sidetracked. Did it work? Get any progress on your leveling? Oh, yeah, that was the reason I was hitting it. 
Fayette closed her eyes and tried to focus on how her class was feeling. She did not hear any system notification, but maybe that just meant the experience gain was too small to be noted, or maybe it was taking its time. No, I don't think that's it. This just doesn't feel right. There had been that certain feeling of cleanliness, that satisfaction that she had felt with the other kills, but she did not get the same feeling here. It did not feel like she was cleaning anything. Was that indeed the key? The maid opened her eyes and looked at the remains. This hair was in its natural place, running about in the woods. There was no disorder here, no grime or wrongness to be cleaned away like there had been with all those others. Hairs moving about the woods is part of the natural order, so it wasn't an issue. Maybe if they were invading a garden en masse, I might change my perspective. Would I then gain experience? Probably. Nope. I don't think I got one bit of experience for that, Fayette finally said, exhaling the breath she had not realized she had been holding. Well, to be honest I expected that. But as you said, there is no harm in being thorough, Mireille admitted, walking on. Come on let's go, we've still got more traps to clear. What, more tests? Yes, but not for you, for me. I want to try a few things too. Suddenly more interested, Fayette followed while wiping the blood off the end of her broom. Goo, is that a bit of skull lodged in there? Why can't everything just dissolve away like monsters? Cleaning afterwards would be so much easier. The pair continued their forest stroll and checked out more traps. Most were still empty, so Mire just gathered the threads to take along. You're taking them all away. Why? Fayette asked, curious. Well, the caretakers have been dropping hints for quite a while, I'm going to be leaving the orphanage soon. No sense leaving these here. Oh, right. You are leaving. You could leave them for the other kids or something, couldn't you? What? These are my snares, good material. I'm not leaving them for someone else. I guess that's fair. Where are you going to go? You told me there's no work in these parts. Where else? The city. I have to at least take a look at what the offerings are like in Pologne. If all else fails, I can always go apply for a class change. Fayette grimaced. She had always found the idea unsettling, to just, change what you are. You shouldn't be so quick to change, you're not even level 10 yet. You wouldn't be getting the leveling bonus for the new class. The woman turned back and gave her a severe look. It's still more efficient for me to change right away, at least until I gain a few more levels. Well, Mary the, cook, she's dead now. I heard her say that the lines for appointments have been packed lately. It could take long for the church to get to you. Mire turned back forward. That is true. Look Faye, it's not like I want to change my class or anything, alright? I do like being a, semstress, but you need money to live. Fayette felt at her pockets. Mire, I got a good bit from the manor. I could. No, Mire answered instantly, not letting the, maid, get started at all. I'm not relying on handouts to live one bit more. Fayette sighed, the girl could be particular about the strangest things. It would be just for a bit, you wouldn't have to. No, I'll do fine on my own. Let's just end this conversation, alright? Look, the next snares actually have prey. That they did, two hares had been caught right next to each other. The, semstress, eyed her catch with a gleam in her eyes, then took out some needle and thread. Perfect, I wanted to test something like this. What exactly are you testing? Fayette asked, cautious of that gleam. Mire did not answer. She approached the hares, then threw her sewing needle at them. Sorry about this, quick stitch. The needle began to glow, then pierced the fur of one hair, taking a long thread with it. It exited, then moved to the other one and repeated the process, zigzagging between the two, then tightening. The hares cried out and struggled, but it was futile. Fayette winced as the two struggling animals were stitched together in a flash. Mire had a thoughtful expression on her face as she looked at her work. Sorry good animals, but it was a necessary test. I'll let you out of your misery. She approached them and snapped their necks with practiced ease. She turned to the wide-eyed, maid. Look, this is how you don't ruin your dinner. W what was that about? You sewed them together. That I did. Mire answered as she began untangling the now stitched together animals from the snares. You talked about how you fought using your, maid, skills, 
so I wanted to see if I could do the same. Worked surprisingly well to be honest, guess there's not much difference between leather and skin. Counts as material for needlework all the same. I guess that makes sense. Did you gain experience from it? Not the act of killing itself, no. Guess the whole, breed a bunch of animals and power level by killing them, plan is off for the both of us. There was such a plan. Mire ignored her. But I do feel the rest is treated just like any other needlework, the more challenging it is, the more experience you get. She turned to Fayette. I imagine the danger factor from trying to sew a monster's legs together would prove for very effective leveling. Fayette's eyes widened. Are you thinking of becoming a hunter too? The woman shrugged. How good is the pay? Fayette blanked out for a second as she thought. Um, I don't actually have any idea. What? You're thinking of becoming one without any idea on what the pay is like? I'm sure it's going to be just fine. You are too cavalier about all this. All right, next thing, we are going back to the orphanage and going over your skill leveling plan. The pair bickered along for quite a bit on their way back to the orphanage. 45. Chapter 13 Skill Planning Session After they had returned to the orphanage and taken their catch to the kitchen, the pair headed out to the field outside for some practice. A few kids came to loiter about and watch, but Mirai chased them away. She seemed to be a bit of an authority figure, as the kids didn't approach again. So, how exactly does a, maid, fight? Mire asked, arms crossed. If you're going to run off and be a hunter, you have to have plans for dealing with all sorts of monsters. Fayette suspected she was doing her best impression of some of the stricter orphanage caretakers while they were giving lessons. Well, I've got my, sweep dust, skill, I did manage to get one cobbled with it. Fayette wanted to demonstrate, so she set her broom on the ground and activated the skill. All right, watch this. Fayette swept the broom back and forth on the dry ground, sending a nice cloud of dust flying. Mire stared blankly. Fayette realized that this did not look very impressive at all. Um, that was not all of course. It's at rank 3, so I can do a bit more. If I really push on the skill. Fayette concentrated, charging up the, sweep dust, instead of releasing it immediately. Dust from the ground began to be pulled to the broom, resulting in a roiling mass gathering around it. Judging the dust cloud to be sufficient, Fayette finished the skill with a whisk of her broom, sending the dust cloud flying forward. She stood back with just a hint of pride. See, that is plenty useful in a fight. Puts the skill on a bit of a cooldown, but it is worth it. Mire, however still did not seem too impressed. So, there's weapon number one for you, throwing some dust at the enemy. Good for a distraction I suppose. Fayette was mildly offended. What, that's plenty useful. Surely this next one. I've got, cutlery control, which also helped me take out a cobbled. Watch this. Fayette picked up a few forks and knives from her, apron of holding, and proceeded to throw them at a nearby tree using, cutlery control. They moved accurately right where she was aiming but only one managed to pierce through the bark, most just bounced off wholesale. Mire's voice remained skeptic. So, your next combat technique is throwing some kitchenware. How exactly did you kill so many kobolds with skills like these? The maid had to slump a bit. Well, I either distracted them with something like that and then whacked them dead with my broom, or I used my special cleaning agents. Your alchemy skills are definitely nothing to sneeze at. That is true. Besides, you have to have some fighting instincts and strength behind you. No ordinary girl with a broom could batter foes down like that, the semstress said, face scrunched up in thought. Still, how much do you have left in alchemy supplies? I imagine you used up quite a bit. Well, I can get the stuff needed for more, all-purpose cleaner, pretty easily, but I can't really use that gas reaction thing anymore. I used all of that shiny stone I had. I'm not sure I can find more of that. A suspicious I turned to Fayette. How did you find that original piece? It clearly wasn't anything ordinary. The maid began fidgeting. Well, you know how nobility are. Mags are always carrying around weird stuff, and sometimes they drop that weird stuff while passed out at a party, and don't come to collect later. Surely, it's not wrong of me to collect them. Faye, are you sure that's how proper? 
made etiquette works. I thought you were very particular about that kind of thing. You practically confessed to robbery. No, it's no such thing. He didn't come back looking, so he probably didn't even miss it much. It's just safekeeping really. Look, let's just get back to the battle training. This is battle training, right? I also have, maid's poise, which helps me stay balanced, and, cleaning tool proficiency, dot. She twirled her broom in one hand. That skill is why I'm fighting with a broom, I can't handle a sword after all. Mire nodded, good thinking. You should probably max out both of those skills, they sound like solid combat options and could upgrade to something good when you class up. Hmm, that's true. They are both at rank 3 anyways, so it wouldn't take much. I've got one skill point free right now, should I put it in? Mire nodded. If you just keep it around, I imagine you'll put it into something weird at the behest of a stray thought. Put it in now, and you can get used to it better. Fayette nodded, and focused for a moment. Skill up, cleaning tool proficiency has reached rank 4. She twirled the broom around in her hand, and it felt even easier than before. She wouldn't be losing her grip lightly. All right, done. What's next? Mire thought for a moment. You got to level 10, right? Do you have any plans for your new general skill slot? Fayette nodded. Yeah, I've been thinking on getting something combat oriented for it, but I haven't really been able to choose. I've been keeping my general skills at rank 1 so I can try them out while having the option to swap them out easily. Maybe you should do something similar. What kind of skill do you think I should pick? Well, I've talked with the guards around town on this topic before. A lot of them recommend the danger sense skill as it helps guard against surprises. Staying alive is always the number one priority and surprises can be nasty. Do you have it available? They said a lot of people unlock it through combat. Fayette closed her eyes and focused, just a moment, I'll check. She thought of getting a new general skill, and instantly her mind was filled with the options she had unlocked. Free skill slot available, listing options happy smiley. Cutting board. Dallying about. Dancing proficiency. Danger sense. Dark vision, lesser. Determined will. Fayette's mind was filled with options, and she focused on the one she was looking for. She noted to her satisfaction that she did indeed have the skill unlocked. She thought of taking it. You have gained a new skill, danger sense. Danger sense, the world is full of danger, but with this new skill you can sense it coming. Get forewarning on attacks, traps and other dangers outside of your notice. Noticing ambushes has never been easier. All right, I have it now, Fayette said as she opened her eyes, though I don't feel any different. Suddenly Mire threw a needle right at Fayette's face, and the maid felt a new kind of alarm go through her. She moved her head out of the way just in time, though the needle did stop midair, a good distance before it would have hit anything. Seems to be working fine, Mire said as she called the needle back into her hand. Fayette took some deep breaths to calm herself from the sudden shock. Hey, don't scare me like that. The semstress raised an eyebrow. You wanted to see if it was working, didn't you? Now we know. I don't think it would have worked if I had warned you in advance. Fayette knew the woman wasn't lying, but still felt a tad bitter about it. She gave her a proper mean glare as words didn't seem to work. Mire did look a bit apologetic. Well, all right. Sorry. Let's move on then. Didn't you also have one other new skill? Some charm type thing? Fayette nodded. Well, yes. Disarming smile. I'm not sure how I feel about it to be honest. Not really the type of skill I generally use. It should ease people's hearts or something like that. Hey, don't neglect such a useful sounding skill. If you don't use it and don't put skill points in it, it might change into something else. Mire tapped her head thoughtfully. Let's have you use it while reserving inns and the sort. We could get some discounts. Fayette paused for a moment as her thoughts churned. Wait, we're going together. Mire looked at the maid for a good few seconds, completely stunned. What, you were planning some sort of expedition of your own? I need go to Pallone to look for a job, you need to go there to register as a hunter. Of course we're going together. Oh, right. The closest hunter's guild is over there. 
Where exactly was I planning to go? Well, more importantly. Fayette rushed to embrace the semstress in a crushing embrace. You're coming with me. No, stop. Let me go. You've got it the wrong way. I'm not coming with you. You are coming with me. The semstress corrected as she struggled away. That confused Fayette enough to release her. Wait, there's a difference. Of course there's a difference. You haven't planned for this at all, have you? I have. I've already sent word that we'll be going with the next grain shipment blimp. It'll be leaving in two days. Ah, true. Going with the blimp is the smart move. Don't tell me you were planning on walking the whole way. Fayette stayed silent for a few seconds. No. The look Mireille gave her was not one of respect. Will you really be fine as a hunter? Can you even be left to wander the city? I've been to the city plenty of times, you're the one who has never left this place. The argument went on for quite a while, but it was not a serious argument. Fayette was feeling happy, she had gained a traveling companion. Walking the forest path all alone would have been so troublesome. New party member acquired, Mirai. Class, Semstress, Tier 1. Level, 7. Skills. Needlecraft, 2 fourths. Quick Stitch, Rank 2, Needle Control, Rank 4 Tailoring, 3 quarters. Adjust Garments, Rank 2, Mend, Rank I, Take Measurements, Rank I Capstone Skills, 0, 0. Not applicable free skills, two halves. Basic trap setting, rank I, lesser enhanced endurance, rank I unspent skill points, 1. 36. Chapter 14 Interlude, Mireille's Three Secrets. The days passed fast, and soon it was time to leave for Pologne on the blimp. Mireille however was feeling a bit nervous. She eyed the gangplank to the blimp with apprehension. The blimp was getting ready to leave floating just a few feet off the ground, a few feet higher than Mirai had ever been. She took a deep breath, closed her eyes, kept her hand on the railing, then walked. It was only ten steps, but it was still nerve-wracking. Finally, she felt her foot hit Blimp's wooden deck. What's taking you so long? It's only a blimp. Are you nervous? A voice asked from behind her. The semstress opened her eyes and looked back. Of course I'm not nervous, you just have to to. She looked at the deck she was standing on, then up. She pointed up. You have to make sure the balloon is in good condition when you step on a blimp, you know. It's part of my class. What, really? Is it in good condition? Fayette asked, suddenly eyeing the balloon with wariness. Good, looks like she bought it. Mireille turned to examine the balloon. Firm leather, and tight seams. Nothing looked out of place. Everything seems to be in order, let us proceed. First secret, Mirai really wasn't as cool and composed as she strove to make herself seem, but she would never let Fayette see that. She had her pride to maintain. She made a brave effort of stepping forwards, but still found herself clinging to the railings along the cabin wall. She did not like the loss of control. The solid ground beneath one's feet was one of the constants in this world that you could trust. She did not like handing over that trust to any artificial ground, if it were to fail there was little she could do. Gee, the wind got your hair all tangled again. Give me a moment, Fayette said as she followed her in and began tidying up her hair. The familiar, comforting touch managed to ease her nerves, and Mireille felt herself relaxing. The others at the orphanage had always found Fayette's fussy habits tiresome, but Mireille had never felt that way. She had always felt it was rather calming, really. In fact, her hair had not gotten tangled up by the wind at all. That was secret number two. Her hair was not actually that tangly by nature. Rather, she always made sure to mess it up just a bit whenever Fayette was around. That girl grew nervous whenever there wasn't anything to clean up. All clear. Get ready for takeoff. A voice shouted out. Mirai clung to the railing tighter as she felt a lurch in her stomach. Hey, it's your first time flying, right? You should really go take in the views. The first time is always special. Fayette said as she finished getting the tangled hair in order. I suppose you're right. Mireille sighed. There was truth in that, she had to admit. It wouldn't do to hunker down like some scared mouse. She pushed herself off the cabin wall and walked to the bow of the craft. A vast horizon spread out before her. 
Mireille felt her breath catch as she saw the familiar terrain spread out below her. She could almost make out some of her favorite spots in the woods, and seeing them all from this perspective reminded her of how small it all was. It's such a vast world out there, and here I have been, stuck in this small corner all my life. She turned to look at her friend, who was looking at the landscape, a bright smile on her face. It was the expression of someone setting out on an adventure, an expression of freedom. Mire envied it just a bit. Can that girl really become a hunter? I don't think things will be as simple as she thinks. Mire had to admit that there was a certain appeal to the path of a hunter, it was not a symbol of freedom in stories for nothing. No superior to bind you, no schedule to adhere to, no hometown to trap you. That was how it went in all the stories. Secret number three, Mire was actually tempted by the career of a hunter. She knew the stories were exaggerations, and reality would disappoint, but still, there had to be a grain of truth there. The stories had to come from somewhere. But would it really be like that? I can't imagine it's too different from any other organizations. Even the orphanage manages to devolve into a mess of bickering factions at times, what would a powerful guild look like? Still, it's not like my path is much better. Still, she was not like Fayette, she wouldn't rush to a new path without carefully considering the alternative. These days, it felt like everyone was heading out to the big cities. There had to be some sort of reason for that, right? She would see for herself before forming any judgments. But, she would add the path of a hunter to the list. It needed investigation too. A. Semstress, had limited options these days. She hoped that pay in the city would be good enough to get some savings going. But that was not a sure thing. Opening her own boutique would take a lot of levels and funds, things she did not have yet. Based on the news, even level 25, semstress, classes were not that in value, especially if they held the wrong specializations. A sewing machine needed no levels to work, and could match lower level classes easily. When someone then got actual specializations that worked with the machine, the output of a normal, semstress, was just not comparable at all. I really ought to give the man who invented those machines a piece of my mind. Hey, what are you spacing out for? Here, I've got sandwiches. Shaken out of her brooding, Mire turned to look at the sandwich her friend was offering. She gave it a good, dubious stare. It's been quite a while since I've tasted your cooking. She narrowed her eyes. Something was off here. You're a, maid, aren't you? Why haven't I tasted your cooking for so long? Ah, well, there were other people for that at the mansion, so I never got to do any cooking there, Fayette admitted, blushing slightly. She steadied her expression, then pushed the sandwich over. Still, I am a, maid, after all, and cooking is a, maid's, work. From now on, I'll be doing the cooking for us. Well, all right then, Mire said as she took the sandwich, white bread with some chicken in between, by all measures, it looked like quite the delicious sandwich. Fayette bit into her own one with relish. Ah, that hits the spot. They never did get the seasoning right at the mansion. I wonder why the cooks never listened to me. The maid seemed to be enjoying hers well enough, so Mire decided to give her own a try. She brought it to her mouth and gave it a good bite. Her eyes instantly watered. Spicy, so damn spicy. Is this why they never let her cook? Does she actually enjoy this? Mire brushed the tears out of her face and looked at her friend. Fayette seemed to be enjoying the meal a lot, at least based on the smile on her face. The Semstress, realized that she was in trouble. She just said she's going to do all the cooking, and I don't think I can get her to budge on that. She can get very particular about her way and views being the only right ones. I'll be in danger if I let things go on like this. I'll have to act. She spun her mind into overdrive, letting the thoughts whirl and knit a plan into form. She had worked on Fayette's uniform just a bit before, and she knew the spices were probably somewhere in there. She had her plan. First, a distraction. Hey, Fayette, look, is that a spilled drink on the deck over there? She shouted out while vaguely pointing at a random point on the deck. The maid instantly perked up. What? Cleaning work? Where? And turned to look to where Mire had been pointing. Next, the heist. Needle control. A needle with some thread attached to it started to silently creep towards the maid's apron. Mire felt the cloth make contact with her needle letting her skills work on the threads within. She closed her eyes to focus. Adjust garments, take measurements. 
She was very familiar with this piece of clothing, so it was not difficult at all to get a mental picture of the various pockets and pouches around it, and how the things inside those pockets felt. The subtle ways in which the cloth was weighed down let her search for her target. Hmm, this one, maybe, a small packet, with something grainy inside. The pocket isn't being weighed down much by it, could be her spice stash. The needle moved through the apron like a viper hiding in the grass, slipping through seams and openings. Mireille moved it carefully, taking care to not alert the maid. Eventually, she felt it near her target and managed to hook a thread through the packet. A few quick shortcuts were made and closed with adjust garments, allowing her to pull the packet back right through the clothing, into her waiting hands. The openings closed behind as the packet moved, leaving no traces of the thievery. She confirmed that it indeed was a packet of spices, and quickly hid it into her pocket. Wow, that was some superb needlework. Keep up the practice. Progress towards next level, 30%. Mire was pleased to hear the messages. Interesting, looks like offensive needlework has some good potential indeed. She generally got levels from anything in which she used her needlework, the class was rather loose about that. However, finding new challenges for a semstress was difficult, and she often had to get creative. The whole process had taken only about four seconds, and Fayette was none the wiser. Her face was one of confusion as she tried to find the spilled drink. Mire used the extra time she had to tangle her hair up a bit, now that she had awakened the girl's cleaning instincts, it would be best to give her something to work on. Eventually Fayette turned back. Mire, I don't see anything. Where is it? Oh, don't worry about it, I guess I was just seeing things. Gosh, look, your hair's gotten all tangled again, let me fix that. Mire leaned back into the familiar hands as they began the usual ritual. I guess it would be a shame if she just ran off somewhere far away. How much do they pay hunters anyway? I guess I do really have to consider that seriously. Besides, can I really leave this girl alone? The airship traveled on, and a few days later, arrived at the city of Pologne. 32. Chapter 15 Welcome to Pologne. First demonstrated in 1698, the steam engine was initially dismissed as a curiosity due to concerns over fuel requirements. However, with the later introduction of the magical refinement process, the potential for widespread commercial use was finally discovered. This would later lead to excerpt from History of the Modern Era by Magus Boags. The city of Pologne was situated on a low ridge between two rivers, just a bit upstream of their intersection. It was a changing city, little remained of the trading hub that had been there just 50 years ago. Houses spread out haphazardly from the more orderly city center, and the huge factory district was full of pipes billowing out thick, black smoke. Fayette grimaced as the errant wind brought some of the smoke to their descending blimp. The smoke stunned her eyes and sent her into a coughing fit. I swear this place wasn't quite this bad the last time I visited, it's only been a year, she managed to say in the midst of her coughing. She waved the smoke away from in front of her face and cast a hateful glare at the factories responsible. Shouldn't someone be in charge of cleaning this stuff out? What kind of person just lets their grime float away? Mire walked beside her, holding a handkerchief to cover her nose and mouth. I imagine it would be very convenient if all trash just floated away. Wouldn't that make a maid's work easier? You could just toss everything out the window. Fayette looked at her friend, exasperated. You are thinking very short-term here. It's like when you clear old, decrepit furniture to the attic. It's not like that stuff is going to just disappear, right? It's still up there, some poor, maid, is going to have to deal with it eventually. Mire was staring at Fayette as if she was a whole new human being. I honestly didn't know you put that much thought into this stuff. Fayette glared at her, hey, I'm not a, maid for nothing all right. I trust your judgment related to clothing things, so you should trust me with cleaning things. Mire quirked an eyebrow. You trust me with clothes? Didn't you just go on a whole spiel against me with your whole, maid, outfit obsession? That's different, eh? Maids, work uniform is a, maids, business. I doubt others would understand. Mire shook her head and turned back to the city, ah, oh, whatever. I won't argue this further. Still, this is not quite how I imagined the grand city of Pologne to look, 
Mireille said, enunciating those last words mockingly, quite different from the paintings and stories. Well, we'll be landing soon enough. You'll get a much closer look. Trust me, the smoke is only the beginning. Soon enough the pair had landed at the airship docks and got the pleasure of dealing with customs. It was a bothersome process, but not arduous. Their class licenses were in order after all. Soon they were walking to the city proper. The airship docks were at the edge of the old quarter, so the initial impression of the city was of grandness. Picturesque stone buildings were lined with elaborate engravings. Streets were busy with rushing carriages and smartly dressed pedestrians. Mire looked at the buildings curiously. The stone was distinctly blackened, giving the district a gloomy feel. I think I've seen a painting of this very crossing back at the orphanage. Shouldn't all this stone be grey? You can thank those for that. Fayette answered, pointing at the stacks of rising smoke. I think they clean up the facades every now and then. Or at least they used to. Come on, let's move. The semstress seemed a bit out of it as she followed Fayette. The streets were crowded, they had to squeeze between street peddlers and pedestrians. Quite different from the sparse countryside. It is quite something, isn't it? Fayette said, with just a twinge of smugness. A country gal like Mire, of course the big city would be a bit much for her. Do not worry, for your big sister is here to help. Mire seemed to sense the internal gloating, at least based on the skeptical gaze she gave to the maid. So, you've been here before, right? Where to? Securing lodgings is our first order, right? Well, we can of course go to the usual place. We'll just have to head this way and we'll soon be at the Grand Hotel Bella I. Fayette suddenly stopped, right in the middle of turning to the street. The Grand Hotel what? It sounds like a lovely place. Shan't we go? Mire asked with an innocent voice. Fayette coughed awkwardly. W.L. It might be just a tad outside our budget range. She turned away from Mire, suddenly deeply interested in studying an elaborate stone fountain. I was part of the, Lord's, procession the last time I visited. So, you know, the establishment I was at last may not really work. Mire laughed. I was expecting something like this. Well, nothing to it. Let's go search for a good inn. Do you have any leads? Not really, but this district is definitely too expensive. We'll want to head down to the, worker, district. Getting out the old district wasn't a long walk, as though the old district was grand, it was also small and dense. It was a quick change, one you could almost feel in the atmosphere of the place. Or maybe it was just the smell. Stone was replaced with red brick, and the streets got even less clean. Ragged people started lining the streets, trying to peddle wares or services. I'm a level 8, apprentice blacksmith. I can sharpen your knives for a good price. Level 14, semstress, here, clothes need any mending. You'll get it cheap. These were but a few cries among many, the sides of the streets were absolutely packed. Some were managing to make deals with the passerbys, but many more were left hanging. Fayette felt her eye twitching wherever she looked, the whole place was sending jitters down her spine. Just the smell was enough to annoy her, but what got to her more was the general disorder. A proper household was in order. This place however, one could hardly expect a disorderly realm to have an orderly, lord. Where are the, maids, is nobody sweeping the streets? There weren't this many beggars last time. Is the, lord, of this place a complete incompetent buffoon? She almost felt an urge to pull out her broom and start cleaning the streets personally, but she held back. Other matters came first. Doesn't seem too promising, Mire said, eyeing the crowds with calculation. It wasn't this bad last time, I wonder what's changed. Fayette responded. We really are lacking up-to-date information, Mire said thoughtfully. She ran her eyes by the street and noticed a newspaper hawker. Just a moment, I'll go buy us a newspaper. She ran off, and a moment later was back, newspaper in hand. Let's see here, she mumbled as she scanned the headlines. Unrest in colonies, tea shipment destroyed, tax hikes necessary to deal with growing debt, war with Burgundy at an end, church assures that class change processes will be sped up. Wait a minute, Fayette interrupted. We were at war, and now it's over. Mire went back to the headline in question. Doesn't seem to be anything too major. Some minor skirmish maybe. It says a few towns are now in our rightful hands, 
but not much more than that. Ha, huh, strange. Hard to imagine that some parts of this country are at war with how things are here. Mire eyed the beggars lining the streets. I'm not so sure about that. Now in a more affordable district, the two started looking for a proper inn. They however soon ran into an issue. They wanted to have a proper, cleansing bathing session after their journey, but inns with bathing facilities were a lot more expensive, even here. Fayette would have been fine with paying the fare, but Mire was strongly opposed. The, semstress, made a strong argument, why not just save the money and go to the public baths instead? Fayette agreed it was a good plan, so they set off. It was a bit of a walk to the nearest public baths, they had to walk quite a bit closer to the northern riverside. The northern river was adjacent to the, worker, district, while the southern river hugged the old one. They soon found a promising place, and headed in. It was a nice establishment, with a combination of sauna rooms and heated bathing pools. The two paid the entry fee, then spent a good amount of time lazing about, getting rid of the strain of the journey. It was nice to take a bath after a long journey. The sun was starting to set by the time they were out. Mire stretched her limbs lazily as she walked back to the streets, skin still letting off some steam into the air. Ah, that really did hit the spot. Let's head back to that one in we marked, shame it's a bit of a walk back there. Fayette looked at the side streets thoughtfully. I'm pretty sure I passed around here on some errands quite a bit on my last visit. Going through these side streets should be a bit of a shortcut. Really, they seem a bit sketchy to me. Bah, that's just what the city is like, you know. Do you really want to walk the long way? You're right. All right, let's take your route. Fayette took the lead and began weaving through the streets confidently. The crowds gradually got thinner, the vagrants shabbier, and the buildings dirtier. Mire was groggily following Fayette, dazed from the warmth of the bath, but soon started having doubts. Fay, you do know where you are going, right? I think the streets have been going a bit to the right for a while now, haven't they? Fayette stopped, and looked back. I'll be honest, I have had no idea where we have been for the last five or so blocks. What? Why didn't you say something? Well, I'm saying something now, aren't I? I was still holding out hope. Mire groaned, and looked at the street crossing they were standing in. All right, I think if we head to the left from here, we should get back to the bigger streets. Fayette nodded, but before the pair could leave the crossing, they were interrupted by a gruff voice. Excuse me missus, it's not good to be lost in streets like this. A shabby man dressed in rags walked out from around a corner, dragging a wooden club behind him. Everything about him was filthy, except for his shiny bald head. Another man followed him, wearing a bizarrely clean top hat, which made for a strong contrast against his tattered tunic. The man grinned, revealing teeth like a broken piano. Don't worry ladies, we'll escort you. Don't know what disreputable folk are around these streets. Fayette flinched back from the stench the two men were emanating and felt at the broom in her, bag of holding. The clubs they were holding at her and their threatening poses told enough. Gah, I knew these streets were in disorder, but this. She had been expecting better, but so far, the city had disappointed her. A skyline marred by thick smog, filthy streets lined with sickly beggars, and now back alleys crawling with leering thugs, a place truly filled with filth. However, she remembered the resolution she had made. If she wanted to truly become a superior, maid, Shouldn't she strive for a truly ambitious cleaning job? Would cleaning out a whole city fit the bill? As Fayette looked at the looming vagrants in front of her, a new resolve brimmed within her. The, Lord, was not keeping proper care of his city. Well, a new Lefri, maid, had conveniently just arrived. She gripped her brim tighter, and made her decision. She had a city to clean. A, hey, maid, really has to do everything herself. 33. Chapter 16, Keeping the Streets Clean Fayette examined the two dirty men blocking her path, with a frown on her face. She didn't feel cowed, the kobolds had been much more fearsome than these two. Still, she was irritated that such folk could run amok in the streets. Her first target for cleaning had been found. It's not proper at all that the streets are infested like this. Why, if a, maid, let rats run about like they owned the manor, she would be dismissed before the sun was out. Who is in charge of public order here? 
She glanced to her side and saw that Mire was also in a guarded pose, with her left hand concealing a needle and thread and right hand in a pocket. They locked eyes briefly, and Fayette nodded to her. Mire nodded back. They were both ready. The men meanwhile were getting frustrated at their silence. The man with the hat had been holding a club at his shoulder, but now he brought it out to his front, and pointed it at Fayette. He narrowed his eyes, and spoke with a husky, slimy voice. Hey, what's the hold up ladies, come along now. Fayette looked at him and the rusty nails lodged in his club dismissively. She had seen proper fighter classes in action, and this man's pose was far from what she had seen them display. This was just a thug, not a thug. Fayette decided to dub the man with the top hat as Hatman and the man with the shiny bald head Eggman. The men briefly shared a glance, some signal passing between them. Fayette saw their bodies tense up, ready to move. Not something she planned on allowing. A proper, maid, is not reactive. Fayette acted fast. She felt at the broom in her, apron of holding, and pulled it out in one smooth motion. She let the momentum carry the broom into an overhead strike, aimed right at Hatman. He only had a split second to react, but managed to pull the club in front for a block. The impact sent him stumbling backwards, wide-eyed. What the hell do you think you're doing? He sputtered. Fayette was not the only one acting. Mire pulled her right hand out her pocket in a flash, throwing a cloud of something red at Eggman. Pocket spice attack. The powder covered his face in red, and he stumbled back, clutching at his eyes. Meanwhile, Fayette let her broom strike continue down behind her, hitting the street, and started channeling, sweep dust. The past days had been hot and dry, leaving the streets coated with a blanket of loose dust. It made for good ammo. Fayette's broom gathered the dust into a swirling vortex, and she readied herself for a decisive thrust. Hatman looked at Fayette's broom and his eyes flashed with doubt for the first time. Hey, wait. Fayette did not. She thrust her broom out, and the cloud of dust was sent right into the man's face, blinding him. Having secured a moment to breathe, Fayette checked that Mire was handling the other man fine, and she seemed to be. A thread was linking her right hand to the man's clothes, which seemed to be constricting his movements while the man struggled against them. Fayette focused back to her own quarry. All right, she seems to be fine so far, but it's safest if I finish this quick. Hatman was stumbling around blindly as his eyes watered, unable to manage any guard at all. Fayette took it as an invitation. She steadied her footing with, maid's poise, and twirled her broom around in her hand, readying the tail end for a strike. She pulled it back above her head, then brought it down, slamming the broom right at the man's head with all her force. The hat crumpled under her blow, and she felt a satisfying crunch as her broom hit the man's head. He crumpled down onto the ground, limp and unmoving. Now, Fayette was nothing if not thorough, so she did not leave it there, no. She hammered at the man's head with her broom, and then also stomped on it a few times for good measure. She smiled. Good, didn't even get much blood on me this time, I'm getting better at this. Suddenly, she heard the other man scream out, and Fayette flicked her gaze over. Mire seemed to be trying to stitch the man's left arm to his torso, but her thread was not strong enough. The pain sent the man into a rage, and he ripped right through the shirt that had been constricting him. His enraged shout was a guttural, primal thing. It sent shivers down Fayette's spine. Mire flinched back as the man suddenly rushed at her, and Fayette acted. She stepped forward, bringing her broom down on the man's shiny, bald head. Seeing the man threatening her friend gave extra strength to her blow, and the strike hit home. The man's expression turned blank, and he too fell to the ground, crumpling down like a sack of flour. Fayette smiled and moved to hit the man a few more times. It rather reminded her of cracking open an egg. Mire watched the, maid, with her eyes wide, and eventually managed to force out some word. F Fayette. I I think you've killed him. Two pieces of trash cleared, well done. Progress towards next level, 35%. Fayette stopped her broom mid-strike, and brought it down to the ground instead. She leaned on it and inspected her work. You're right, I just got the notification. It's harder to tell with these. Kobolds just go splat while he still stays like that. I don't think I even see much blood. Fayette, you've killed him. Fayette turned her head, confused. Well, yes, of course I did. Mire was still staring at the man. Her voice was a hiss, with an edge to it. Fayette, 
they're dead. The maid raised an eyebrow, is that bad? Mire took a deep breath and finally turned to look at her friend, Fayette. It's just, she shook her head, then grabbed Fayette's hand. We need to leave. Come, let's go, quick. She started pulling the maid with her along the streets, almost running. She peered nervously at the nearby windows, looking for anyone who might have been watching. Fayette was feeling confused. What's the issue here? Of course I killed him. A hey, maid, can't let rats just run off, can she? You have to be thorough with these things or they'll spread. Aren't street rats the same? Mire shook her head. Fay, it's not. It would be bad if we were connected to these bodies. Put that broom away. There's blood on it. Fayette slowly nodded, then slid the broom back into her apron of holding. Why would it be bad? They attacked us, right? It's just. All right, Fayette, imagine you are on a trip to a manor with your liege. There's some party going on or something of the sort, and your liege is there as a guest. Fayette nodded. I'm following so far, I've been an attendant a few times. So, if you see skittering rats in there, is it all right to handle them yourself? Fayette thought for a moment, then shook her head. No, it would be very rude to the maids of that place. At most, you could inform them discreetly about what you found. So, if you just went and started clearing out rats on another maid's territory, they wouldn't be happy, right? Fayette started nodding, then paused. She stared aimlessly as she thought, then turned to Mire. You can't be saying it's similar to this situation, right? They attacked us. It was self-defense. Okay, it's not a perfect analogy. Sorry, I can't make perfect, maid, analogies for everything Fay. I'm a, semstress, not a, maid. Hey, calm down there. I don't think you want to be shouting. Mire took a few deep breaths, then sighed as she turned a corner on the streets. Sorry, you're right. In a way you could be correct. It was self-defense. Things might be cleared out officially, eventually. She turned to Fayette, but there would be questions, and things could become very complicated. We're strangers here, Fayette. Those men might have been part of a gang or something. They might have family and friends, people who care. If word gets out, those people might come looking for us. Fayette pulled her hand out of the semstress's grip and frowned. What should I have done then? Just scaring them off would have probably been fine. If we show we're not to be messed with, people should steer clear. Those didn't seem to be the determined type. Are you sure about that? They would just vanish to bother some other people after us. Besides, your guy came at you swinging, seemed determined enough to me. Mire flushed and turned away. Well, yeah, I handled that a bit poorly. I saw that you had knocked your guy out, so I tried to restrain him. Only, messing with his clothes wasn't quite enough. I didn't expect a few stitches to set him off like that. I got too into it. Too into it, that's one way to put it. Look, I was just curious on how it would work, okay. Won't exactly find live target practice too often. You're still thinking about taking the hunter path. I think you did well in that fight there. You could have potential. Mire clicked her tongue. Well, maybe I'll consider it as an option, okay. I did actually get good experience for my class from that. Probably because of the danger. I didn't even do that much needlework. Though, I'm not locking in anything. This city, it doesn't feel too good, but I still want to check out how work here could be. I won't count anything out just yet. Fayette sped up her pace until she was right by Mireille's side and looked at her with a smug smile. Just be honest and say you can't bear to leave your dependable big sis. Dependable. You're the one who got us lost in these slums. I should be the one worried for you going out alone. I handled those two well and good, didn't I? Look, let's just find a place to rest and get some sleep. I really was not expecting to end up in deadly combat today. Ah, fine. Although she had poked Mireille's argument a bit, Fayette had to admit her friend was right, wandering vagrants couldn't just go around killing people without proper authorization. Hem, that will make cleaning this city a lot more difficult. Maybe my original objective could solve this. If she did not have permission to go around killing things, why not get that authorization? She had originally come here for the Hunter's Guild anyway, 
and getting a hunter's license could solve her issue. Many thought of hunters as little more than wandering vagrants, but they truly were not, because of one key difference. They actually had permission to wander around killing things, it was practically their whole job description. Fayette could imagine all the sweet experience she could get on official hunting requests. Her path to becoming the ultimate, maid, had never felt clearer. Become a hunter, and then get to cleaning, simple. The two walked in companionable silence for a bit as they got back to the more populated streets, and soon they were again walking among the red brick buildings. Fayette was thinking back on the fight and trying to figure how she could have handled it better. Then, she suddenly remembered a curious detail. By the way, what were those spices you threw? Mine have been missing for a while. Mireille's silence was answer enough. 31. Chapter 17 To the Hunter's Guild The Etruscan Republic showed no hints of decay even in scriptures from as late as the year 5 BS, which makes its downfall and the subsequent millennia of Dark Ages even more tragic. Truly, the system was not gentle in its coming. Downfall of the Etruscan Republic Part 1 Eventually Fayette and Mire managed to find an inn for themselves. It was in the grimier part of town, a slightly dilapidated place that could really use a thorough cleaning. To some that may have been a demerit, but Mire had seen it as an opportunity. She was traveling with a maid, after all. There were benefits to that sort of thing. With some snappy negotiation, the semstress managed to negotiate a nice room for a very affordable price on the condition that Fayette would do some cleaning work at the inn, something she was all too eager to do anyways. Fayette generally did not trust the cleaning work of others as much as her own, so it was a calming thing being able to clean for herself. They had arrived at the place at sunset, and it only took the maid two hours of work to tidy up their room and the inn's general facilities to passable standards. The innkeeper, a foxy-looking lady, was rather pleased with Fayette's work. Fayette decided to use that good wall and ask for permission to use the kitchen. She had had a bit of a talk with Mire on the topic of spice thievery and personal property. Retribution was in order. Fayette was not one to shirk from a challenge, so she was determined to convince Mire of the glory of spice. She worked hard to make the best dish she could. In fact, her cooking efforts were so serious she was interrupted by a notification after finishing her dish. Keep up the hard work with the cooking. Progress towards next level, 45%. Fayette was surprised by the notifications. With all that had happened recently, she had almost forgotten that experience could be gained through more, ordinary methods. She took the notifications as proof of her growing cooking prowess. Her dish was a type of curry made using her own special spice mix. The dish had come in from the colonies, and rapidly gained popularity among the richer households. Fayette was happy at finally being able to cook some herself, and eagerly ate her own portion. Mire was less pleased with the dish, but she knew that she had wronged Fayette with the thievery, so she persevered. As night finally fell, the pair collapsed in their beds with full bellies, exhausted from the long day. The next morning, the pair were having their breakfast in the inn's common room. Fayette was looking through the newspaper that Mire had bought the day before, while the semstress was sipping on some tea. So, what are your plans for the day? Mire asked after finishing her cup. Fayette set the newspaper down and thought. She only really had one thing she wanted to do in the city, so she saw no point in dallying about. I think I'll go to the Hunter's Guild right away, no point waiting around. Mire looked at her friend with some concern. Are you sure this is going to work out? Will they take you seriously? Eh, hey, maid, trying to become a hunter can't be a common thing. Fayette scoffed and brought out a pouch from her pocket. She opened it and revealed a gleaming array of shiny gems. I got these monster cores off the kobolds, they should prove I'm not playing around. If I can hunt monsters like these, can they really deny me from being a hunter? I don't think they accept hunters based on the bounties they show off. Make sure to take your papers with you, alright? It's not like in the stories, it's a proper guild, a proper organization. Guilds have rules and procedures, that they have to follow. You're going to want to be prepared. I have my class license, and I don't think there's much else they could want. Hunters are hardly the type of folk who look into employment records, now are they? They wouldn't be so known for accepting outcasts if it was so difficult. Mire still did not look convinced. 
Are you sure you're going to be able to handle this? I can come advise you if you want. Fayette gave Mireille a look. She really didn't appreciate the patronizing tone. I hardly need you watching over me for everything. Okay, I'll handle things fine on my own. Besides, don't you have your own things you wanted to look into? Mireille sighed, then nodded. I had a talk with the innkeeper, and she said she knew some people. She was pretty happy with your cleaning yesterday, so she promised to make introductions. Well, good. I'm glad it's helping you out. Don't get into any trouble on your own now, all right? I can't always be there to bail you out. I really don't think I'm the one who is likely to end up in trouble. The pair chatted for a moment longer, before heading their separate ways. Fayette knew where the Hunter's Guild was, but she had never actually been inside the place. She was feeling just a bit nervous about going to the place, but that nervousness was a small thing compared to the excitement she felt. She was finally taking a step on her new path. The day's events had only strengthened her conviction. Yes, she had gained some experience from all her cooking practice, but that had been the product of days of work. Meanwhile, she only needed to whack a few thugs on the head to get a whole load of experience for it, it was just so much more efficient. I really do have to get to cleaning this city. I'm getting close to level 15 too. I think it's almost guaranteed I'll get some uncommon class options. What I'm doing can't possibly be classified as common, now can it? She hastened her steps, and eventually found herself in front of a tall wooden lodge. It was a bit of a departure from the surrounding architecture. The buildings around it were all tall stone buildings with elegant facades, while this place alone maintained a rustic feel. A two-story timber lodge which almost felt like it had been taken from the middle of some untamed wilds and plopped right into the middle of this bustling city, it was a bit incongruous. Fayette approached the doors and flung them open. She did not stop to gawk, she wanted to be taken seriously after all, and stepped in. The inside of the place looked like a mix between a tavern and a government facility. Maybe it was a trick of the light, but the place seemed to be divided into two distinct areas. One side was dark and gloomy, a mess hall for hunters staying in the city. Gruff men were sitting around tables having hushed discussions. It was the early morning, but Fayette still spotted some tankards of ale. The hunters were varied in build, but uniform in bearing. There were no fancy, mags, or, knights, here, this was a place for people who could treat the wilds as their second home. Dark cloaks and armor, a mix of mismatched gear scrounged up from who knows where, and rusty weapons in dire need of maintenance. Not much of a glorious sight. Fayette thought the lot of them could have used a thorough wash. The other side of the hall gave a very different impression. The morning light was hitting the place just right, illuminating the clean floors, neat reception tables and orderly notice boards. Fayette nodded with appreciation, this side was more her style. It did not take her long to spot the maid, cleaning the place, a wisp of a girl sweeping the grime and spilled food away as the hunters ate and drank. She faded into the background in that distinct way servants did, unless the observer was also in the field of course. There was a certain kinship between maids, Fayette had never met the woman before, but she instantly got a picture of the circumstances. The woman took notice of Fayette, and gave a nod. One professional recognized another. They didn't need words to have a small conversation. Fayette nodded her head at the messy hunters and her meaning was clear, with a bit of contempt showing on her face. Hunters, am I right? Always making a mess. The other, maid, rolled her eyes. You can say that again. She then shrugged her shoulders. Still, work is work, right? Fayette nodded back, then gestured towards the reception desks. Keep at it. I'll head to my own affairs. The wispy girl also gave Fayette another curt nod, an acknowledgement, then went back to her cleaning. It was a short conversation, having taken place in the space of a few glances, but they were both professionals. A. Maid, would not engage in idle gossip. At least not too much. Fayette walked towards the receptions on the other side of the room. Nobody took notice of her walking into the room, not until she walked to the reception on the right that was, the one marked as, Hunter Affairs. A few laughs sounded out in the room, and the bored-looking, receptionist, a scholar-like woman with thick-rimmed glasses, turned from a stack of papers to grimace at Fayette. The woman pointed at the other reception desk. Excuse me, miss, requests are handled at that table. Fayette got a bit annoyed at the flippant dismissal, 
but she held her tongue. She knew that servicing customers could be a grating job, and she needed no enmity with this, receptionist. Amiability would be key here. If complications arose, she wanted to have a helpful, receptionist, not an annoyed one. She activated, maids poise, and tried to look as dignified and serious as possible. Then I think I am at the right desk. I am not here to post a request. I am here to sign myself up as a hunter. 28. Chapter 18 Customer Service Nightmare The receptionist had already been turning back to her papers, but Fayette's words managed to rouse her back. The woman blinked her eyes and took a proper look at Fayette for the first time. She took in the very proper, made, uniform, Fayette's bearing, and at last fully registered her words. She instantly shifted to business mode, her next words curt and precise. You wish to sign up as a hunter? May I see your class license? Fayette took the license from her pockets and quickly looked it over to make sure things were fine. Class license. The dual monarchy of Gallia and Albia. Name, Fayette. License type, worker class. Parents, unknown. Base class, maid. Date of birth, the 6th of May 1767. Issued, the 6th of May 1781 Parish of Castella. Blood signature, Fayette. Valid until level 30. Yep, everything should be in order. Satisfied, she handed the slip over to the receptionist. The woman took a quick glance at it then turned to examine Fayette. The maid felt a shudder as the distinctive feeling of an appraisal skill went through her. It had been a while since she had gone through one of those. Seemingly satisfied, the receptionist handed the license back. Your information seems to be in order. Which party are you joining? I will need to ensure your vouching is in order. Do you have the recommendation written down somewhere? Fayette felt confused. Oh no, this is going to become bothersome, isn't it? Um, I'm not joining any party, at least yet. I don't have any vouching either. Is that necessary? Can't I go at things alone? The receptionist's face blanked for a moment, going through that distinctive despair one goes through when realizing they have a difficult customer at hand. It was only a moment, and she soon continued as if no pause had come, voice curt and professional. Miss, non-combat classes are only allowed to become hunters in a support capacity. We don't manage cleaning services or anything of the sort. This is the Hunters Guild, and we handle hunter requests. Fayette frowned, then pointed at a slime cleaning request on the nearby quest board. You don't do cleaning jobs. Then what do you call that? Cleaning sludge from a river seems cleaning enough to me. Um, I see your point, the receptionist admitted, then smiled awkwardly. Still, sorry, but I have to follow regulations with these things. We only serve hunting requests. Fayette felt irritation bubbling within her and almost slammed her fist on the table, but she held it in. She had recognized the look on the woman's face. It was a very common one for maids, too. The, I have to deal with a difficult customer, face. Fayette knew she needed to be cooperative to have any chance here. She slowly took a few breaths to make sure the anger was out of her and made her case. There was zero hesitation in her voice as it rang out. Sorry, but I'm not trying to join in a support capacity. I want to become a proper hunter and I want to hunt proper monsters. Her calm voice seemed to pierce the noise in the room, making the place fall silent. Many strange gazes began falling on Fayette from the hunter mess hall. The receptionist's face in turn held confusion, and just a tinge of despair. But, you are a, maid. You need to have a combat class to become a hunter. That's how the rules go. Fayette smiled smugly. She had actually thought on this argument beforehand and prepared an answer. She started making her point, voice filled with confidence. Who says a, maid, isn't a combat class? Do you have proof? I'm a, maid, and I've fought plenty. Maid, skills are great for fighting. It's not like there's a big book of all classes that says a, maid, isn't a combat class, right? The, receptionist's, face slowly turned from confusion to sympathy. She measured her words, laying out a slow judgment. Actually, we do indeed have a big book on class classifications which says just that. The, big class classification text. It's very explicit. A, maid, is a, worker, class. 
Fayette stumbled as her arguments melted away into nothing, and she looked at the receptionist with shock. You do? There's a book like that. The woman nodded. Yes, we do. Would you like me to fetch it? I can double check the classification for the maid class if you want. Fayette closed her eyes and sighed deeply. It was a worst case scenario, and I was so confident I could get them with that. Why is there such a book anyway? Who wrote it? Can't be anyone sensible. They just didn't meet the right maid. She turned to look at the receptionist. Fayette had been patient and amiable, and she could see from the woman's sympathetic look that she was no longer being classified as an annoying customer, just a difficult one. I guess I'll see if we can work something here. No, I don't think bringing that book out is necessary. I'll take your word on it. It's just, is there no way for me to become a hunter? She took out her bag of monster cores and appended it on the table. I wasn't lying about being able to hunt, all these, I too. The receptionist looked at the cores rolling around on the table and interrupted Fayette with a wave of her hand. Miss, rules are rules. Please don't go dumping your stuff on the tables, we can't change the rules on a bounty basis. Ah, sorry, Fayette said and quickly tucked the cores back into her pouch. How terrible, I've made a mess. In a last ditch effort, she even threw in a disarming smile, though her expression was plenty disarming enough on its own. Still, is there no way? The receptionist took a long look at Fayette's earnest expression, then thought, finger on her lip. She turned to look at the papers around her and began to dig under them, fishing out a thick book of rules. She shuffled through it, until she eventually stopped on a page. The receptionist carefully examined the page, going over it several times, then smiled. She turned back to Fayette. Well, it would be a bit irregular, but there is technically a way. Fayette instantly brightened up. She stood straighter and leaned over the table, full of enthusiasm. Really? There's a way? Please calm down. Yes, there is a way, but it is a bit. The woman gave Fayette another appraising look, then drew out some papers from a cupboard. This is a technicality, as there is no rule forbidding it. You are technically able to join on a junior hunter license. It's something intended for children who haven't unlocked their class yet. A relatively safe introduction to hunter work until they come of age and get their class. Fayette frowned. What exactly does relatively safe mean here? The receptionist dug through the pile of papers she had taken out and selected one which she placed in front of Fayette. You would only be able to take on missions of the safest danger rating, and only ones inside the city. Are you still interested? Fayette turned to look at the paper, which seemed to be a list of rules and regulations for junior hunters. It was a big list of things they were not allowed to do, and Fayette felt a tad angry that she was being reduced to this. I'm being put on the same levels as children under 14 years, just because a maid isn't a combat class according to their stupid book. Still, it was something. Was it better than nothing though? Fayette was not sure. She turned to the receptionist. If I find the junior hunter thing doesn't suit me, is there anything stopping me from just giving it up? The receptionist pointed to a line on the paper. Junior hunters are not held to any obligations. You would be free to go as you will. Fayette still wanted to be a hunter, and though this was far from what she had wished for, it was still a step. Not a big step but a step nonetheless. At least I have some sort of license with this, it shouldn't stop me from doing any cleaning requests. Those are what I really wanted here anyways. She took the paper. All right, thanks for being patient with me. I'm in. Where do I sign? Those are the rules, not the joining form. Please don't sign anything. Oh, sorry. Fayette handed the paper back, and the receptionist handed her a new form. It took a bit more fiddling with the papers to get Fayette's forms in order. Ordinarily, permission from a guardian would be required, luckily, Fayette was of age. She marked herself in as her own guardian. Another mix-up came as the receptionist found out that Fayette didn't actually live in the city and was only staying at an inn. The junior license was intended for locals mainly, but on closer inspection of the rules, the receptionist found that the segments on travel and such were relatively loose, allowing just enough wiggle room for Fayette's form to go through. Eventually, the paper was signed, and the woman headed upstairs to verify it with the guildmaster. 
Fayette paced around in a circle anxiously as she waited, fearing that even with all her effort, the form wouldn't go through. The maid, working in the guild gave her a look of solidarity, and they shared another silent conversation, mainly mocking the dirty habits of stereotypical hunters. Fayette was just getting into it, miming the drunken steps of a fool who had drunk more than they could take, when the receptionist returned. Fayette instantly fell into maid's poise and approached the desk, hope in her heart. The receptionist smiled at her and handed Fayette a slip of paper and a copper emblem. Congratulations, you are now officially a junior hunter. Fayette nodded her thanks at the diligent receptionist and took her now proof of guild membership in hand. This receptionist was a bit of a stickler for rules, but she handled things in the end. I hope she gets plenty of experience from this. With a license in hand, Fayette needed to choose what to do with it. One of her options would be to join up with some other party, but she wasn't feeling too keen on that. She had considered it briefly, but one look, one whiff, at the hunters arrayed at the other side of the room dissuaded her of the notion. They were simply too unclean. They were a grimy sort, and Fayette didn't think she would have much luck trying to whip the lot into cleaner shape. There was no way she would be joining a party of people who failed to meet her basic cleanliness standards. There was of course another issue, Fayette wasn't naive, not completely at least. She doubted she would get to fight much if she joined one of the parties. If some party were to accept a maid as part of their group, they would probably have certain expectations on what a maid would do for the group. Fayette had no objection to handling cooking and cleaning, it was part of her duties after all but she still wanted to primarily be a fighter. However, such musings could be left for later. Fayette now had her very own junior hunter's license, and she was keen to put it into use. She walked over to the mission board and began perusing her options. There were many different types of requests posted, requests for caravan escort, notices about dangerous monster spottings, all sorts of interesting jobs, none of which Fayette was allowed to accept, of course. She turned her gaze downwards, to the bottom of the board. Now, how can I most efficiently start cleaning up this dumpster of a city? The first notice that took her attention was a rat removal mission. Apparently some neighborhood in the city was having issues with a rat infestation, and a mission had been put forth. There was a bounty for every rat corpse verified, and though not large, it wasn't an insignificant sum either. Pest control eh? That sounds right up my alley. However, as she read further on, she noticed that even this mission was marked with a danger level beyond what she was allowed. Seriously, rats are too dangerous for me. Give me a break. I've handled plenty of rats back at the mansion. I'm sure I could handle this. HMPH. Maybe I could take it anyway somehow. Grumbling internally, Fayette turned to the next mission down. This time she first checked the danger rating and noted to her satisfaction that this one was within her means. A persistent mission for slime removal. Ha. Huh. I think I should be able to manage that. Still, why is there a persistent mission for something like this? A city shouldn't have slimes just popping out of nowhere. There's monster wards to keep them out, right? Apparently, the river on the northern side of town had a bit of a slime infestation problem. The creatures were constantly washing up on shore, and people were needed to clear the pests away. Fayette felt a bit unnerved that monsters could just pop up like that inside a city. Still, it seemed to be the best mission so far. Can't get much thorough cleaning done with dirty water, this should be a good start. Fayette decided to give it a go. It was time to start cleaning the city. 27. Chapter 19, Cleaning Some Sludge. Fayette was walking through the city towards the northern river shore. As she walked, she gazed at her brand new hunter's license with some measure of pride. All right, it wasn't a proper hunter's license, it was only the junior version. It rankled Fayette to be dismissed amongst the children, but this would do for now, she would think of something when its use ran out. This mission took her to the worst parts of town, so Fayette made sure to stick to the more populated streets. She didn't want to cause too much trouble again. It was not an area for the wealthy, and it really showed in the buildings. There was no stone or brick here, only cramped one-story wood shacks. The streets still did not seem any less busy than the other districts, which made Fayette a bit concerned. If the houses are this much smaller, but the amount of people seems to be the same, just how densely are they living? Fayette kept her eyes trained to the front, 
as otherwise the persistent dirt and grime everywhere would have annoyed her too much. That, however, made her focus on the people. There had been beggars in the better districts, and they were here too, but something was different. These beggars were not hawking out their trades or appealing to the passers-by, they were just sitting about listlessly with glazed over eyes. Many seemed downright sick. I guess the ones with more energy would go to the places where business is better. A quick walk later, Fayette finally made it to the river shore. There was a sort of buffer zone between the water and the city proper, with a sort of rocky beach in between. A few street urchins were watching the waters with strange poles in their hands. Fayette walked over to the river, and winced back from the stench. It smelled. How can they mess up a river this bad? She turned to look upstream and saw the distant factory district. Tall chimneys were spewing out endless bouts of smoke, and many of the factories seemed to be built right by the riverside. Gar is nothing enough for those places. They have to billow out smoke to the skies, isn't that enough for them? Are they doing something to the water too? Fayette was brought back from her musings as she noticed movement on top of the water. It looked almost like a wave, but on closer inspection, something was different. First, the wave was tinted a lot darker than the rest of the water. Second, it was not moving with the flow or the wind, but was steadily approaching the shore. Fayette took a few steps back and pulled out her broom as a slime slithered on shore. It looked like a grayish pile of goop, but there was an order to it. It slowly started slithering closer. Fayette smiled, cleaning away living stain seemed like very proper, made, work. All right, I can see why the danger rating for this is so low. That thing is barely moving at all. Now, I just need to kill it and take the monster core along. So far, Fayette had approached combat with a single strategy, hit the enemy on the head until it died. It was a simple stratagem, but a very effective one. She had no reason to doubt it. Fayette raised her broom for a decisive strike, and slammed it at the slime with all her practice strength. The strike hit the slime, the slime compressed, and the strike bounced right back. Fayette stumbled backwards, and looked at the slime with a new respect in her eyes. It managed to stand my blow, not even a, lord, managed that. Still, that left Fayette with a conundrum. She needed to kill the slime and take its monster core, but her usual method did not seem to work. She took some distance from the slowly advancing slime as she began to think of a new plan. Wait a minute, I do have another method of attack. I haven't used it as much, but it still should be somewhere around here. Fayette began rummaging through her apron of holding, and eventually pulled out her all-purpose cleaner. She still had a bottle full of it, about three quarters full now. If I need to clean a bit of spilled sludge, surely this will do the job. She changed her broom for a mop and applied the cleaner liberally on it. Then she slowly approached the slime, and touched it with the mop end, making sure to maximize cleaner contact. A sizzling instantly sounded out and the slime started squirming. It was an unnerving sight. Spasms went through the grey liquid in waves and the creature started backing away from the deadly mop. Fayette smiled at the good results she was having, and thrust the mop further out at the slime, making sure to get every bit of her cleaner on it. The slime backed away further, almost back into the river now. Fayette was smiling with victory when something concerning happened. The slime started changing color. It started from the portion closest to the mop. Gradually the grayish goop was being pushed back, replaced with a clear blue that was distinctly familiar to Fayette. She pulled her mop back in a panic. Is it becoming an all-purpose cleaner slime? Fayette backed away as the transformation continued, making the slime squirm and spasm about more and more. Just as the transformation seemed to be finishing, an especially strong spasm went through the creature, and it fell back into the river. Fayette watched as it was swept along with the current and kept her eyes on it until she was sure it was far beyond city limits. All right, hopefully that won't become a problem. Fayette sighed as she stepped back, slime removal duty really wasn't starting off as well as she had hoped. However, before she could mope about further, a clear voice interrupted her. Excuse me, are you hunting slimes? Fayette turned to the voice and saw a young dark-haired woman who was carrying a bag of groceries. She had her hair in a long braid and was wearing the clothes of a simple working woman. Fayette saw no reason to hide the truth. Yes, I am a hunter after all. The woman's gaze traveled up and down Fayette's prim, maid, uniform, and her expression became one of doubt, even concern. Is this something your master put you up to? 
Fayette shook her head. I have no master anymore. I wanted to become a hunter, so that is what I did. The woman's doubt was replaced with interest. Is that really something you can just do? Maids, don't have real combat skills do they? Can you manage as a hunter? Fayette held her mop out with pride. You hardly need those so-called real combat skills to fight. Normal skills and a bit of cleverness can bring you quite far. The woman sighed. I wish I had the confidence for something like that. We've been having a rat issue, but no hunters have accepted our quest. It would be nice if I could tackle things like that on my own. This time it was Fayette whose face turned interested. You know about the rat problem? I was having a look at that mission. Do you know who posted it? Oh it was a whole bunch of neighborhood folk, my mother included. The problem has only been getting worse though. Fayette saw an opportunity. She looked back to the river, a filthy, slime-infested stream next to it, grimy streets lined with sickly beggars, and behind it all, high, atop the ridge, the factories which set the backdrop of the city, billowing out endless streams of smoke. She saw a futile effort. It was a mistake to start with this. Even if clear out slimes here all day, it won't matter at all as long as I don't deal with the source of these slimes. If one starting point proved a dud, why not try a different one? The rat mission seemed like a promising start. Rats carry grime around and people say they spread diseases, would they work as a start for my cleaning? A thorough cleansing effort needs a sturdy foundation, so why not start by clearing that foundation of rats? If the guild wouldn't let her take the mission, why couldn't she just directly go to the people who had posted the mission in the first place? She stood straighter and gave the woman a proper curtsy. I am the hunter Fayette, miss. I might be interested in taking the mission, but I would like to do it outside, official channels. The woman smiled. She seemed to want to answer her curtsy, but her hands were a bit full with the bags, so she settled for a curt nod of the head. I'm Elise, a laborer, at the textile mill. I can take you to talk with my mom if you want to. Fayette agreed eagerly and set off to follow the woman. They chatted a bit as they walked, with the conversation mostly being Elise's questions about Fayette's exploits. She seemed very interested in Fayette's talk of battle, the maid suspected the woman might have aspirations of her own in that direction. Fayette decided to be encouraging and told her how it didn't matter what one's class was, as long as you had proper fighting spirit you could manage. The laborer grew especially interested when Fayette told her about the quick levels she was getting. The woman didn't live in the worst part of the slums, but it was certainly not a luxurious place either. She led Fayette closer to the factories, and after a short walk they arrived at her humble abode, a simple one-story wooden house. The laborer opened the door. Hey everyone, I'm back with a guest. Wait, you already have a guest here. Who is this? Fayette followed Elise in and was surprised by what she saw within. Mire was sitting at a table with a woman who was probably an older sister of Elise's, drinking tea. The two locked eyes for a split second, before they both laughed. Elise looked at them, puzzled. Mire was the one who first managed to settle herself. Well, this is certainly a coincidence. What brought you here? She gestured at the woman who was seated with her. Angie here is a semstress, and she showed me around her workplace. The woman nodded at Fayette and Fayette nodded back. I managed to join the Hunters Guild, and I just happened to meet Elise while I was doing some slime hunting. She's got information on a rat hunting mission. Mire nodded at Elise. I see, how much is the pay? Fayette brought her finger to her face as she thought. I think, it was around one lever for every two rat corpses. Mire's eyes started gleaming. Tell me more. 29. Chapter 20 Pest Control Mire and Fayette took a moment to explain themselves to their bewildered hosts, and soon the whole group were sitting by the table, sipping on tea. Somehow, the roles had reversed, and Fayette had become the one serving the tea, fetching more, and ensuring everyone got their refills. Their hosts were a bit bewildered by the turn, but something about Fayette's professional bearing calmed them, and they began discussing things in earnest. It was a cramped room a shared kitchen in a house with many families in it. Right now, they had the room to themselves, as the other families seemed to be away. As Fayette had expected, the other woman, Angie, was Elise's older sister. She was apparently an acquaintance of their innkeepers, 
and had arranged for Mirai to be brought along to survey her workplace. So, how did you like the place? Do you think you want to work there? Fayette asked her after the explanation was finished. Well, Mirai turned a guilty expression to Angie. No offense to you, but I didn't really end up liking what I saw. Even were I given a chance, it's not something I'll be keen to try. She met Fayette's eyes and shook her head slightly. They would talk more on this later. Oh, don't worry about offending by speaking the truth. The older woman said, laughing. Circumstances are as they are, so I can definitely understand if you don't jump at the opportunity. Mire nodded back at the woman, then continued. It was much gloomier and denser than I had expected. I'm surprised the heat and steam don't ruin the fabrics. The foreman has skills that keep such ill environmental effects in check. It lets the production continue smoothly no matter the conditions. Angie explained. Fayette shuddered. That doesn't sound like a pleasant skill to be honest. If my old head maid had something like that, I shiver to imagine what she would have made us do. She turned to Mire. So, now you're interested in hunter jobs. The semstress nodded. At this point, becoming hunters with you doesn't seem like the worst option. If the pay is good, why not? Fayette's face beamed into a smile. You're becoming a hunter with me. I knew you would come around. I'm not becoming a hunter yet. I'm just giving this one job a try, all right? Wait, wait, wait. Elise interrupted. She turned a curious look to Mire. A semstress is becoming a hunter too. Can she also fight? Fayette, can she blast away cobalt hordes like you can? Mire looked between the two, narrowing her eyes. Fayette, what exactly have you been telling her? Nothing but the truth, Fayette said with a beaming smile. She nudged Elise at the side and pointed at Mire. And don't worry, she can handle herself well too. Why, just yesterday, she stitched a thug's arm to his. Hey, watch what you go blabbering about. Fayette brought her hands to cover her mouth. Oh, right. Don't talk about the incident. Right. I almost forgot. Still, it was too late. Elise's eyes were already shining. A, maid, and a, semstress, who can handle thugs with ease. Do you think a, laborer, could fight too? What? Mire stammered, surprised by the sudden look of admiration. I, guess, it depends on the skills. Elise was opening her mouth to ask more, when suddenly a severe glare from her sister shut her up. Elise, what on earth are you thinking up? Get such foolishness out of your head. She answered the glare with her own. Hey, you're not my mom. These two are admirable women, holding their own with nothing but cleverness. Fayette and Mire looked at each other, feeling a bit awkward at suddenly being put in the middle of a family spat. However, the argument didn't get much further before a door opened, and a woman dressed in black walked in. A stench of medicine came with the opening of the door, and the woman closed it behind her as soon as she had stepped through. The woman looked gloomy. Dark clothes, dark hair, and above all, dark eyes. Her eyes were ringed with black, seeming to sink down into her head. The woman looked like she hadn't properly slept for a good while. Ah, Doctor, Nightingale, you are finished with your checkup. Angie asked, rising up from her seat. The woman looked towards them, and Fayette shivered. Her expression was just as gloomy as the rest of her bearing. The situation was the same as it was the day before. Keep giving her the medicine, that's all I can do. Elise rose up too, and bowed together with her sister towards the doctor. Thank you for your time, we know how busy you've been. The woman said nothing more, and strode outside. A distinct smell of alcohol emanated out as she passed. Elise turned to Fayette. Right, you wanted to ask mother about the rat mission. Well, she fell ill a few days ago, but should be well enough to see visitors. Shall we go? Fayette briefly locked eyes with Mire, who looked thoughtful. Is it contagious? The semstress asked. No, at least the doctor didn't think so. Something else is spreading it, maybe even the rats we mentioned. Angie answered. Mire looked to Fayette, then shrugged. Well, guess there's no harm in it. Please lead the way. The two sisters rose up from the table to lead the group into an adjacent room. Fayette and Mire followed them in, and a strong stench of medicine instantly hit their noses. Fayette recoiled initially, but with the help of, maid's poise, 
she steadied herself and headed in. It was a cramped bedroom, but Fayette's I was not drawn to the clutter or disorder strewn about in the room. No, her gaze instantly went to the woman resting on the bed. She was an older woman, clearly a likeness to the two sisters. Her age was hard to gauge as her complexion looked very sickly, skin like yellowed paper and a body trembling with sweat. An orderly knot of brown hair and wise-ned features fought their way through the sickly complexion. She fell ill just a few days ago, a lot of folk have. Some have talked about an epidemic, but the doctor we had visit didn't think so, said it might be from the water or the rats. Elise walked to the side of the bed and softly spoke into the woman's ear. Hey, mom, are you awake? We have a guest, someone's here about the rat mission. The woman's eyes opened, and with labored breath, she slowly rose up from the bed. She took a moment to gather herself, and slowly looked over her visitors. Her eyebrows quirked a bit at their outfits, but she didn't ask any questions about it. A mark of experience. You two are here for the mission. I'm glad someone accepted it, hunters usually think pest control is beneath them. Fayette sniffed, then the lot of them are fools. Pest control is an important duty and its neglect really shows the depravity of a household. Not that your household is lacking or anything, of course. The woman chuckled. Now now, things are as they are, no need to sugarcoat it. You speak quite right. There have been some right nasty rats about, tearing into people's food. Nobody's managed to catch one of them, and some cats were even found dead. Mire walked forward quirking an eyebrow. These sound like some extraordinary rats. Are there any details? The woman looked at her daughters questioningly, but they shook their heads. She sighed. Doesn't seem like anybody's managed to catch hold of any. It's the reason the bounty is as high as it is and the danger rating. We don't really know what we're dealing with. Fayette clapped Mael on the shoulder and gave the old woman an encouraging look. Don't worry, this sounds like a job right up our alley. My friend is an experienced trapper, and I know my way around rat poison. I think we'll be able to handle this. The woman smiled. Well, I'm certainly glad someone's finally taking matters into hand. With any luck, the sickness will be gone with the rats too. The woman started to get out of bed, then grimaced. Ah, I'm afraid I'm still a bit too ill to host you further. My daughters should be able to tell you everything you need to know for the job. Don't worry mom, I'll help them out. Elise said. Then I think I'll get back to my rest. These old bones need a bit more sleep. Fayette and Mire thanked the older woman and stepped back into the kitchen. What do you think Mire? Do you want to do this? Sounds simple enough. I can make snares and traps, I could probably catch some rats. I've got some ideas of my own too. Let's do it. Below the city, far underneath the cobblestone roads and storm drains, a transformation was happening. The first was feasting. It thought of itself as the first, for it was the first of its kind the first to discover their treasure, that sweet ambrosia of power. It had not been a willing discovery, for like most living creatures, it had felt an instinctive revulsion for the substance. A crumbling bit of stone had done it, a trick of fate, and it had been dropped within the sickly. It drank deep, discovered the pleasure in it, and changed. It was no longer alone. Its kin had needed convincing, but eventually they drank too, and also began to change. The first was of course first among them in power too, and thus, it was the first to discover the next stage. It had feasted on dogs and cats from above, gorged itself full on its weaker kin, and drank, drank, drank of that ambrosia. It reached a new limit, and broke through. Once more its form began changing, and it could feel its power growing. This transformation would take some time, so it set down to rest. Once it awoke, it would be time to expand. 26. Chapter 21, Traps for Rats After getting some more details, Fayette and Mire decided they needed to go have a look at the places the rats had been found in, and Elise volunteered as a guide. Soon she was leading the two through the streets. Fayette walked just a bit behind her with Mire, and crept closer to talk quietly. Hey, what's the real reason you didn't like the job at Angie's workplace? Were the conditions really that bad? Well, it didn't look like a pleasant place to work, that's for sure. Still, that was not really what put me off the whole place. Mire looked around at the dilapidated streets they were walking and continued. Honestly, 
I could handle poor working conditions for a while as long as the pay made up for it. Fayette was a bit surprised. Really? Then what was the issue you had with the place? Mire sighed. Well, it's something rather obvious in hindsight, but I only realized when I saw Angie working there. She really handled that sewing machine well, even had skills for it, and her class upgrade specialized in that direction. Fayette nodded at that, it made sense. One should specialize in their work. Of course, what's the issue with that? Right, I can imagine it being a good for you, Mire said, but, it really unnerves me. The thing is, I won't ever be owning any of that factory machinery, will I? A normal, semstress, only needs her needle and thread, and she can use all her skills. But, if that normal, semstress, then starts taking skills that need a sewing machine to work, or other expensive things, they start relying on things they don't own themselves. You could get locked out of a big part of your skills. Having my class be tied in with something I can't hold, she shook her head. I don't like it. Fayette walked in silence for a moment, pondering the words. It wasn't something she had ever thought of, as a maid, the tools of her trade were rather simple to come by. But if one's class became highly specialized around some type of machinery, and they then lost access to that machinery, what could they do? Isn't that pretty similar to like, sailors, they don't own their boats either. Well, I wouldn't want to be a sailor, either, to be honest. Maybe I could be a captain, if I could own the whole boat too. Fayette nodded. Mireille's words were sensible, and she could see her point. All right, I understand now. What are you two whispering about back there? Elise asked, finally noticing their conversation. Oh, nothing much, Mire said, just thinking about how we'll be handling these rats. Fayette focused her mind on the task ahead. Right, pest control. The situation might have been bad for those living here, but Fayette could not hold back the bold smile that appeared on her face. Pest control, helping take out disease spreaders and doing something other than boring junior hunter missions, this was close to what she had been imagining in that sauna. A proper job for A made, helping clear the places around them. They arrived at their destination, a food warehouse, one of the places that had been seeing the most rat incidents. Elise helped explain the situation to the owners, and they were quickly let in. Everyone was happy that someone was finally taking on the situation. The rats seemed to be a persistent sort. Holes and cracks in the walls and ground had been boarded up, but the critters had not cared, the boards had been chewed right through. Some damage even seemed very recent, a bag of grains lay half emptied out on the floor. Are rats normally this fierce? Mire asked, looking over the damage. Fayette shook her head. No, I don't think so. These seem abnormal. I'll up the dosage in the poisons to make sure it works. Do you really know much about rat poison? I thought your alchemy skill was more about cleaning stuff. Well, it's not like the skill only give information on cleaning agents. That's just what the focus is on. Very basic alchemy knowledge applies similarly to everything, and I got some basic teaching on the subject. I should be able to make some workable stuff. Killing them is easy, getting them to eat the bait is the hard part. Fayette answered, pulling out a vial from her apron. Mire nodded, taking out her own tools. I'll work out some snares then. I wonder how big I should make these. They quickly got to work. Fayette began brewing some poison using her alchemy tools while Mire began rigging up some stealthy snares. Are you two really just a maid and a semstress? Elise asked. She had been watching their work diligently, twirling her braid around every now and then. Fayette finished applying the poison on a bit of stale bread chosen for bait, and quirked an eyebrow at her. Why wouldn't we be? It's just all this. The laborer vaguely gestured at the poison and snares. Like, isn't this like actual proper hunter stuff? Setting up traps and brewing poisons? Fayette almost looked offended. Well, I am an actual proper hunter, I'll have you know. I even have a license. Of course my methods would be proper. But didn't you want to do this under the table? Not through the hunter's guild. Well, well, that's just a whole separate matter, alright? I just have some disagreements with their paper pushers. They get all fussy about rules and whatnot. Elise slowly nodded her head. Hey, all right. I get what you're saying. You won't get in trouble for this, right? 
Fayette stopped. It'll probably be fine, I think. Mireille raised her head, away from the snare she had been making. She narrowed her eyes. What do you mean, probably? We are getting paid, right? Fayette shrugged her shoulders. Probably. Mireille sighed. I knew I should have come with you to the guild. Still, what they don't hear can't hurt them. If we quietly solve this issue, quietly get paid and the request quietly gets pulled at the guild, we should be fine. Fayette relaxed. I can do quiet. Hey, nobody from the Hunter's Guild had shown up for two weeks, but now you two did. I don't think people here are feeling too grateful for the guild. They'll help you out, Elise offered. Well, that sounds well and good, Mire said, rising up to stand from her snares. I think I'm done with snares for this place, how about you Faye? I've still got a one more to go, she answered, busy lathering more poison inside bait. It didn't take her long to finish, however, she was a bit surprised by the notification that followed. Wow, you're getting real experimental with the spices, keep up the good cooking, progress towards next level, 55%. Fayette stopped still in her tracks and narrowed her eyes. Hey, wait a minute here, I'm not cooking anything here, don't connect my spices to, this, are you implying my spices are, no, Faye, you are right, you froze up. The, maid, stumbled for a moment, then looked at her concerned friend. All right, I definitely can't mention this to Mireille, she'll never eat anything I cook again. Oh, it's nothing, just had an errand though. Mire looked doubtful but didn't push further. Fayette put her rat poison back inside a pouch. I think I'm done too. Mire nodded. All right, let's head out to the next spot then. Elise, lead the way if you would. Their group went through a few more places, placing traps and rat bait in strategic spots. Fish markets, houses in disrepair, food stalls, the rats had been in many places. Mire had been quiet for the last few spots seemingly lost in thought. Fayette poked her in the back. What's got you brooding all dark like? Gah, don't poke there. She glared at Fayette. For one thing, how much exactly did it cost you to make that rat poison? You are using it quite a lot. I don't really know to be honest, I haven't bought any new ingredients for a while. These were all from my stockpile, so I can't really estimate. You need to think of these things if you are going to be a real hunter. It's a job that costs money to do, so you need to keep track of your resource expenses. As far as I'm concerned, as long as I get my experience, I'm good. Mire did not look too pleased at the answer. I guess you really do need me around, don't you? If you go at this alone, you'll be bankrupt in a month. Fayette opened her mouth to protest, but Mire silenced her with a gesture. Enough, that's not the thing I'm really worried about. It's not. No, I've been thinking on our mission. All these spots, they cover quite the distance. How are these rats getting around? Elise perked up at the question. She had been silent as she listened to the pair's conversation and seemed eager to contribute. Oh, I forget you two are not from around here. The rats are probably moving through the Undercity. Two pairs of curious eyes turned to her. Undercity, they both asked at the same time. Yes, the Undercity, Elise answered. Fayette started staring at the ground and pointed at it. Like, there's a whole city under there. Elise laughed. Oh, no no, nothing grand like that. It's just some old mining tunnels and catacombs that run under the city. This place used to be a mining hotspot, but eventually the city expanded and the mines got left underneath. It's just called the Undercity because it's under the city. Fayette nodded. Under the city so it's the Undercity. That makes sense. Elise nodded back and continued. Some parts of it were used as catacombs some time back when the graveyards ran out of space, and other parts are used for all sorts of different things. I remember when I was a kid, there were always rumors going around about scary stuff being down there. Those were just rumors, right? Fayette asked, suddenly more alert as she looked at the ground. Oh, I don't know. I never went to check. Elise asked. She lowered her voice and looked at the maid conspiratorially. I still remember the tales of the Faces Natcher, a horrific beast that stalks the darkness with a bag full of heads. The creature has a pole that it puts the heads on, 
and if you see one of the heads peeking from behind a corner while you are down there dash. Fayette had started to get absorbed in the story, so she jumped up quite a distance when Mire suddenly poked her in the neck. Hey, what was that for? She's having you on, don't let some ghost stories scare you. Elise laughed. Hey, I think it's quite the good story. Mire turned to look at the ground below them. I hope our poison and snare tactic works out. Sounds like it would be very bothersome to head down there. The group went through a few more spots before they called it quits. Mire and Fayette said their goodbyes to Elise and promised to meet up the next day to check on things. The pair headed back to their inn, and after a hearty dinner, retired to sleep. Fayette woke up the next day to a slew of notifications. Efficient pest control. Good job. Level up. You have reached maid level 11. Congratulation. One skill point gained. You have gained a new skill. Spicy cooking. Progress towards next level. 15%. Nice. Looks like the trap worked. A new skill too. However, her thoughts continued on as she noticed a curious detail. Wait a minute. I've done pest control before. It was not this much. That is a lot of experience for some rats. What exactly are we dealing with here? 25. Chapter 22, Complications. Fayette shuffled off the bed and rushed to wake up Mire. The, semstress, groggily opened her eyes as the, maid, shook her. All right, all right, I'm waking up, what's the dash? Mire paused in the middle of her sentence, and Fayette smiled as she knew what Mire had paused for. You got them too, right? The notifications. Mire took a few more seconds to pass things, then smiled back at Fayette. All right, it looks like our ploy worked out. She hopped out of bed, then her face furrowed. Wait a minute, is this much experience normal for some rats? My traps don't usually give this much. Fayette nodded. I noticed it too, something's definitely weird about this, but whatever. I got a new skill. She rushed to make her bed and put on her uniform, managing it in record time. Soon the pair were out of the door. They chose to skip breakfast for today, as the excitement of their first successful job as hunters carrying them forward. Fayette still took some bread along though, she needed to experiment. Fayette checked on her new skill as she walked. Spicy cooking, a maid who specializes in cooking of the spicy variety, a most useful skill indeed. Spice up all your food easily, in one simple step. No more need for those bothersome spice merchants. Nice. This one will definitely push my cooking to the next level. Hey, Mire, check this out. Fayette took a piece of bread from her pockets, then held it out. She focused on her new skill, willing it to act on the bread. Spicy cooking. A flash went through the bread, but no visible change came to it. Fayette tore a piece off, and bit into it. Ooh, nice, it really did get spicy. How useful. She tore off another piece and offered it to Mire. Here, you can have one too. No, thank you but I'm fine. I ate already. No you didn't. Besides, don't you want to see how my new skill works? Mire looked at the piece of bread dubiously. You know, based on that skill name and your expression while eating that bread, I'm pretty sure I know exactly how it works. Oh, but you can't be sure, right? Well, fine, if you'll stop pestering me on it. Mire took a small bite, then threw the rest of the bread away, grimacing, exactly as I imagined. Hey, don't litter. Fayette stopped to pick up the piece of bread and stored it in one of her pockets. She would dispose of it properly later. So, how exactly is that going to help your hunting career? Mire asked. Ah, now that you say it, I'm not really sure. I'll figure out something though, don't you worry. Mire scoffed. Well, I'll look forward to it too, then. I didn't get any new ability yet, sadly. Maybe I need more fighting experience. I'm sure you'll get something good soon. Well, I hope so too. It was only a short walk to their first target, the food warehouse they had started off with. However, a concerning detail arose as they arrived to check their traps. The poisoned bits of bread were gone, and the snares had been used. There were even traces of blood on the floor. However, there was not one trace of the rats themselves. No corpses were where they were supposed to be. 
The pair stared at the conspicuously empty warehouse floor for a moment then turned to each other. There was a long bit of silence, which Mireille eventually broke. Hey, Fayette, we were going to get paid for every rat corpse we brought in, right? Yes, that is what they said. Mireille turned back to look at the triggered snares. Well, where are they? We got the notifications, right? Where are my rat bodies? Did they take them away? Eat them? Is that something that rats do? Do you think we'll be able to get paid anyways? We did kill rats, the notifications proved it. Fayette tried. Mire let loose a long sigh. I really don't think that's going to be good enough. They'll want assurances that the issue is actually being dealt with, the word of some dubious rookie hunters is hardly convincing. Fayette let her gaze wander through the warehouse, eventually landing at some cracks by a back wall. The cracks were large, deep and dark fissures, and Fayette knew where they led. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? She asked. Mire nodded. Those rats are not taking my money. I'll get them for this. It was time for a direct assault, it was time to head to the Undercity. Fayette and Mire immediately set off to Elise's house to discuss things further, they needed more information, and the girl seemed oddly knowledgeable about this stuff. It was still the early morning, so they hoped to catch her before her shift at work. Elise was a bit surprised to see the two knocking at her door so early in the morning, but she quickly hustled them inside. The woman tried to start brewing tea for the group, but somehow Fayette ended up taking over again. So, there are issues with this whole rat situation, I take it. She asked as she watched Fayette pour tea into three cups. Well, yeah. These are definitely not normal rats we are dealing with here. Mire said, a frown on her face. Oh, how so? Mire took up a cup of tea for herself. Well, we should have realized something was wrong right this morning when we got notifications for our kills. You got kill notifications, isn't that a good thing? Fayette took a long sip from her cup, then sighed. Yes, it is a good thing. We were both pretty happy at it, because we got a lot of experience. However, it was really too much experience. Elise seemed puzzled at that, and silently sipped at her own cup, waiting for an explanation. Mire continued. The thing is, normal rats shouldn't be giving that much experience, even with how many traps we had set. Fayette, you've done pest removal before, right? The maid nodded. Yeah, I've dealt with some moles and mice before, but the experience gain was nothing like it was today. It pushed me all the way from early level 10 to 11. Elise's eyes widened. That is a lot of experience. It would take me months of work at the mill to make similar progress. Mail nodded. Right, I got a level up too from it. Really the whole thing is. Did you get any cool new skills? Elise interrupted, eyes shining. I bet hunters get all sorts of cool abilities, right? Mire was struck silent by the sudden interruption, but Fayette took no notice. Oh yeah, I did get a skill, spicy cooking. Don't know how much use it'll be, but. Fayette, Mire shouted as she slammed her cup on the table. She gave the, maid, a severe glare. Don't just go blabbing about skills to everyone, okay? A hunter can't be doing things like that. The, maid's, eyes widened as she realized her mistake. She turned to Elise with an awkward smile. Ah, so, anyways I didn't get any new skill at all, nope. It was just. It's fine, sorry, Elise said, blushing slightly. I shouldn't have asked. It's just that, you know. You guys are actually like fighting stuff, doing real things, not just endless dull labor. Fayette looked at the earnest woman, then turned to Mireille. Hey, it should be fine to talk to her about this, right? Mire looked divided for a moment, but eventually relented. Fine, all right, it should be all right. But, she turned to Elise and pointed a decisive finger at her face. Elise, we need information on the Undercity. I am not letting those rats get away with my righteous pay. The, laborer, smiled. Thanks, I appreciate it. She went silent for a few seconds as she thought. As a kid, I wanted to be an, explorer. A childish dream, but I did end up snooping around a lot, learning a L.O.T. but, I'm not really sure I know how to explain it all. She turned away for a bit, fidgeting. She seemed to be gathering courage for something, and eventually turned a hesitant look to the two hunters. Do you think, I could come along as a guide? 
Fayette nodded. Sure, I suppose there's no harm in getting a gid. Now wait just a minute. Mire interrupted, blocking Fayette off with her hand. She carefully examined Elise, and the laborer began fidgeting under her eye. Elise, what level are you? Elise stopped fidgeting and slowly answered, Well, I just recently got to level 14. Mire slumped down, leaning on her hand. Oh, great. One of those cases. 24. Chapter 23 Down into the Undercity. Wait, what cases? Fayette asked, looking between the two. Class up anxiety, Mire replied, and Elise back winced from the words. What's that? Fayette asked, still not understanding. Mire sighed. Remember when, caretaker, Lavine started being super nice and active with everyone? Who? I remember that. She started making all sorts of new foods and taking us all out to play. Did it for a while, then suddenly stopped. Mire nodded. Right, I overheard later that she had just hit level 15, and only gotten common class options. Ouch, that's gotta hurt. Right, so she held back from class upping, tried for a while to be better, and to get something more. Didn't work, usually doesn't from what I hear. Got depressed afterwards. A common thing, apparently. Fayette turned to Elise. You're nervous about your class up. The woman had sat still, winding her braid up tight as she had listened to the two. Her expression had grown embarrassed. She looked at the two in front of her. You two don't get nervous. No, Fayette instantly answered. I have faith in myself. No point worrying about stuff like that. A bit, Mire admitted. Though I don't worry too much, something I'll deal with when it comes. Elise sighed, then slumped down onto the table. Well, I can't help it. She raised her head up, looking towards her bedroom. Angie tried for a few years to get an uncommon class, and never managed it. My time is coming up soon, but my life has been as common as can be. I like leveling fast, my progress slowing down so much from the penalty, I don't want it. Mother got a common class, and she's only barely reaching level 30 now. So, you think this would be special enough, uncommon enough to raise you up? Fayette asked. Elise pointed at her two guests. Look at you two. A, maid, and a, semstress, just doing this kind of stuff. Like it was natural. Why not a, laborer, too? Fayette frowned in thought. She didn't really know whether a, laborer, could do such things, she hadn't gone on her path for such reasons after all. She was first and foremost a, maid, and would always be so in the future. She was only going rat hunting in the Undercity because that was where her path as a, maid, had brought her. Would the path of a, laborer, lead there too? Or was that forcing things too much? I don't know. She finally said. What do you think, Mire? I think she might as well come along. Mire was still examining Elise quietly not saying a word. Look, it's not just about the levels, Elise finally said. I mean, it's about them too, but I just, I want to do something. Something to really help people. This is a real issue here. If you two can do something, why not me? Mire, Fayette said, turning to her friend. It's not like you've got a lot of experience on her either, right? We're all pretty new to this. Except me of course. Hardly the veteran yourself. Mire shot back. Two weeks ago I was listening to you mope about how stupid and mean your head maid was. Well, she's certainly not so anymore. The semstress sighed. Well, fine. I guess we could use an extra pair of hands. Yay. Thanks for having me. I'll try hard to be useful. Elise shouted out, jumping up from her seat. Fayette smiled too. She wasn't sure where this would lead but she would at least give this woman a chance. The group agreed to head out to the Undercity after Elise got done with her shift at work, which would give Fayette and Mire some time to make preparations of their own. They walked off towards the market district in search of supplies. So, are you sure this is a good idea? Mire asked as they walked. HM, is there an issue? Fayette answered. Well, this whole taking Elise a long thing. Will it really work out? Mire said, casting a glance backwards. That girl's head has been clearly filled with some foolish stories, so she's in a rush to try them out. This is proper hunter stuff, we can't just take anyone along. Well, 
She said her skills were good for endurance and carrying things around, so even if she can't fight much, she should be useful. Fayette pointed out. Mire sighed. Well, I guess you are right. So, do you have any special needs for going down there? We could split up for the supply shopping. Fayette thought for a moment. Hmm. I guess we'll need something to light the way. Maybe an oil lamp. A few of them. Other than that, I think I'm pretty much set. If you are adamant about going in that uniform, then I guess you really are, Mire said, looking over Fayette's clothes. She turned to look at herself. I think I'll need to prepare some clothing better suited for this stuff. If these rats are carrying diseases, I don't want them biting me. Something thick for the legs, probably. Fayette walked on silently for a moment, then turned to Mire with a curious expression. Say, I think we've been neglecting something obvious here. Mire turned from her clothes, curious about what the maid had noticed. Well, what is it? Fayette looked Mire in the eye. We're going to deal with rats, so why don't we like, get a cat? Mire missed a step. She managed to stop herself from stumbling, and steadied her walking. She turned away, seeming to give the idea serious consideration. You know Fayette, now that you say it, that is indeed something. Not sure what, but something. They walked in silence for a moment longer before Mire shook her head. All right, I don't think it'll work out. First, we would need to get a cooperative cat from somewhere. Second, I doubt a cat would be able to deal with these rats we have been handling. Wasn't there some talk of dogs being found dead? Fayette frowned. She had really hoped they could have gotten a cat. All right, fine, I guess. If it won't work, it won't work. Mire nodded. Okay. I will head out to buy some supplies of my own. I want to try using wire for this. We'll need to test things a bit. Can you handle the more general stuff? In addition to a lamp, could you get some rope? Always bring rope. I'm pretty sure that's a saying. Always bring rope, Fayette muttered to herself. I do think I've heard that somewhere. It is probably a saying. Mire tapped the maid on the back. Let's meet up at the inn later. Fayette nodded at her and they separated. The maid walked on silently as a lone thought remained in her mind. I really had hoped we could get the cat. Later in the evening, a party of three were standing by a busy street in front of an unassuming looking door, which led into a stone wall. Mire had put on thick hose and sturdy boots to stay the rodent bites. Elise had chosen to come in her work clothes, a simple but sturdy outfit with some light protective gear. Mire nodded approvingly at her thick leather gloves and sturdy boots. The laborer had also brought along a simple broom for a weapon. Fayette nodded approvingly at that. The maid, meanwhile, was of course wearing her maid uniform. She stood out quite a bit compared to the other two. It was difficult to picture her as part of the same adventurous group, despite her being arguably the most capable. Fayette took out a lantern from her apron of holding and lit it. It cast a light into the dark doorway, revealing the stairs that led downwards. Is this really the place? She asked, looking at the entrance doubtfully. It felt strange to her that such an entrance would just be in the middle of a busy street like this, under broad daylight. Elise nodded. It's no mistake, this is it. These were used as official catacombs for a while, you know. Of course the entrances would be easily accessible. Fayette handed the lantern to Elise. She took it in her hand, an ethereal hand spouted from her side, and took it, leaving her other two hands free. That extra hand of yours seems pretty useful, Mire said, studying it closely. Elise motioned at their packs. You can give me anything extra that needs carrying. My carrying capacity will help with that. I'll definitely be useful. Not much need for that. My apron of holding serves the same purpose. Thanks for the offer though. Fayette answered. Elise sighed. Not many of my skills are that useful here. Store sleep and energizer work wonders for shift work, but don't do too much on an undercity raid. We'll see. Let's proceed inside then. Mire said, beginning to direct the group. She motioned at Fayette. Fay, you stay in the front while I bring up the rear. Elise, could you stay in the middle and make sure to light our path? The three moved into the pattern and started descending down the stairs. It was a long, dreary and damp stairwell, and the little light they had did not reveal the end. 
It was a bit of a walk down them, the air steadily getting colder and more damp, but it wasn't too long. They soon reached the end of the stairwell, where a door opened into a sizable, dark stone room. Fayette could just barely make out the edges of the room, where bare stone walls were filled with worn engravings. She moved to step in, but Mira interrupted her. Hey, don't just go rushing in like that. We have to do this carefully. Fayette cast a glance backwards and shrugged. What? You expect the rats to have like an ambush right here or something? There's no way. She looked back towards the room and continued walking through the doorway. They would probably be guarding their nest or something. We'll really have to search for the... Fayette stopped as her, danger sense, flared. It took her half a second to make out the blurry, small shape rushing at her. She kicked at it, and felt her boot hitting soft fur, and the shape was thrown back away. Silence returned. Fayette watched the doorway carefully. These are some energetic rats. 23. Chapter 24 Whirlwind Battle Fayette peered into the doorway, looking for any sign of the creature she had just kicked away. That was a fast one, without my, danger sense, I would have been completely caught out. She eventually said, did you get a good look at it? Mire asked, eyes searching through the room, was it one of our targets? There was something strange about how it looked, it was kind of blurry, I couldn't really make it out at all. Mire thought for a moment, could it be, a monster, that sounds like some sort of skill, Elise, you didn't tell us anything about monsters being here. The, laborer, flinched, there's not supposed to be any monsters down here. We used to come here as kids, there wasn't anything like that. Mire frowned. I guess we should have expected something like this with how abnormal these rats have seemed. Do you see anything in their fay? The, maid, kept her eyes focused to the front. Nope, nothing. Should we go forward? I could maybe try something that should help clear the room. Do you think we can handle them? This might get dangerous. Fayette paused, considering. I think. I think we can handle them, it was fast and hard to spot, but didn't seem that strong. If we're alert, we should be able to do this. Elise, what do you think? You are the one new to this, ready to face some maybe monsters. If you two can, then I'll do it too. Elise replied, holding her broom ready. The, semstress, nodded. All right, these seem like troublesome sorts, so let's do this carefully, room by room. She gestured at the different exits from the room. I'll put up a grid of wire over each exit as we move, which should keep things contained. You'll need to do most of the clearing, while Elise supports you. All right? Elise nodded and gripped her broom tighter. All right. Fayette did not nod, but began activating an ability. This is my first try at this, so we'll see how it goes. Try not to get any of this on you. Fayette kept held her left hand out and began focusing on her, spicy cooking, skill, before, she had used it to spice up food directly, efficient, but not what she needed here, I want to spice things up more generally, just give me the stuff itself, the ability activated, going on cooldown for a while, and a handful of red spice appeared in her hand, Fayette tested it out with a lick and flinched back at the spiciness, this is like pure, concentrated spice, she looked at the powder with whole new eyes, so delicious, this is such a useful skill, she then looked at the dusty room around her and sighed, such a shame to waste good spice, but, well, here goes nothing, she threw the spice onto the ground in front of her and took hold of her broom with both hands, she activated, sweep dust, the spicy powder, along with a whole bunch of dust in the room, got sucked into a swirling vortex around her broom, Fayette focused on maintaining the vortex, not interrupting it for a release. She felt the ability losing power, so she knew that she couldn't tarry. All right, I'll clear out all the nooks and crannies here with this, should knock our friends out well enough. Elise, Mail, finish them off for me, would you? She didn't wait for a response, and moved into the room. She jumped out, running the red-tinged vortex of dust along the edges of the room. Mire and Elise followed behind her. It didn't take long for her to get her first catch. As she approached the first corner of the room, she again felt her, danger sense, flare up. The presence coming from the corner she was approaching, so she didn't slow down. No, she rushed in faster and pushed the broom. A shape tried to rush through it, 
but once it got mixed in with the dust and spice, it lost its bearing and crashed to the ground, disoriented. Fayette stomped on it, then continued moving. She trusted that Mireille and Elise could finish it off for her. Next, she had to move past a doorway, and her, danger sense, flared again. How smart exactly are these things? Now they're just rushing at me when I get close. Strange. Got two coming here. She shouted and swept out her broom through the doorway. She managed to hit one creature, but another one had ran along just beneath her cloud of spice. It moved in fast, closing in on Fayette's leg. However, just as it was about to reach her, a needle pierced its hide and hooked through, pulling it back. Watch out Faye, this one almost got you. Mire shouted as she tugged the creature back into Elise's waiting broom, which smacked it down on the ground. Fayette made sure the other creature got plenty of the spice on it and left it behind, disoriented. The maid kept moving, she could feel her hold on the ability fading, she would have to release it soon. She swept another corner and encountered no resistance. However, as she moved to run at the next doorway, she felt her danger sense flare up stronger than it had so far much stronger. She looked out, and saw that at least five of the creatures were rushing at their group from the other side of the room. Bloody hell, that's a bunch. Guess I angered them. Well, no time better I guess. She finally released her, sweep dust. She had managed to cover almost half of the room with it, so the amount of dust she had gathered into the vortex was quite significant. She swung her broom out in an arc and the spicy dust flew out, covering the whole other half of the room. The effect would be diluted with the thing spread out over such a large area, but at least she could ensure that she hit everything. We've got lots more incoming. Watch out, she shouted, as she turned her broom around in her hand. She cast a quick glance back and saw that Mire had managed to cover one of the entrances with her wire net, while Elise was finishing off one of the creatures Fayette had left behind. Best I give them a minute. Fayette turned back, and saw her cloud of dust sweep the room. Several blurry figures were revealed as they were coated in the stuff, making their blur effect useless. She could see them stumble around, disoriented by the assault on their senses. Fayette moved in. She ran in fast, and jumped on top of one creature, while at the same time batting at another with her broom. She felt the crunch under her boot at the same time as her broom splat the other one onto the floor. The creatures were confused, but recovering. She needed to act quick. She activated, cutlery control and let it pull knives from her pockets into her right hand, which she then threw out at the more distant foes. More were appearing, figures revealed by the dust. She managed to hit three, and the knives slid into the enemies smoothly, injuring, though not killing. Nice, at least they are easier than cobbled scales. However, by now the creatures had recovered from the spice, and three of them rushed at Fayette. She waited calmly, and batted at the centermost one with her broom. The one to the left was snared by a needle passing through it, while the rightmost one got smashed in by Elise's broom. Fayette's allies had also gotten time to move in for the support. The room was silent. Efficient pest control. Good job. Experience shared with party. Progress towards next level. 45%. Mire looked around warily. Was that all of them? What do you think, Fay? The maid thought for a moment. I've gotten my spice over every nook and cranny of this room, so we should have flushed them all out. I think this room is clear. The semstress nodded. All right, I'll move secure the entrances. Keep an eye out for trouble. As she rushed to rig up the next entrance, Elise slumped down, leaning on her broom. That was, is it always like this? It felt so close to going bad. I didn't manage to do much of anything at all. I guess it's tough for a beginner though you did carry the lantern, Fayette replied. Elise flinched and looked up at the maid. I guess I'm mostly good for carrying stuff then, not too surprising. Fayette thought for a moment. What type of advice would a proper veteran hunter give here? She smiled. Next time, just focus on hitting them with the broom. I think you got three, right? That's decent. Elise stood up and smacked her cheeks. Okay, I can do this. Just focus on the broom. All right. Fayette left the laborer to her mutterings and turned to examine the creatures they had just fought. The blur effect seemed to fade with their death, but curiously, the corpses were still remaining behind. Are they not monsters after all? I could have sworn. 
Fayette took a closer look and saw that they definitely looked like rats. Big rats, though, there was something wrong with the bodies. She felt an instinctual enmity with them, a distaste from deep within. Something was wrong here. She peered in for a closer look. 24. Chapter 25 Investigation Fayette poked one of the rats over with her broom, and saw that while the top of the rat thing was whole, its underside had begun to dissolve. Hey, Mireille, are you done? Soon, is something wrong? It's these rat, creatures, there's something wrong with them. Fayette waited for Mireille to finish, and when pointed out her finding when the woman joined her. Look, it's like, half dissolved or something, is that a thing, half monster or whatever? Mireille frowned, and sent out her needle to prod at the corpse. Strange, I haven't heard of anything like this before, could it be, oh? Fayette turned to her, did you find something? The, semstress, frowned in concentration, there's something, hard in here, wait just a moment. Fayette turned back to the rat creature and saw Mireille dig at it more with her needle. Eventually, after a bit more digging, she looped her thread around something and pulled it out. At first, Fayette thought it was a monster core. However, that thought was quickly dispelled as she saw the living matter melded with the gem-like stone. At some point, Elise had joined them in their examination. She was staring at the creature with fascination. Is that its heart? Look how it's melded with this. No. Is it turning into the gemstone? Fayette frowned. That seemed to be what was happening, but everyone knew that monsters were spat out from hell, deep underground to torment the world above. She had never heard of anything like this, creatures turning into monsters. Fayette, you have some monster cores, right? Mire asked. Can you bring one out? Let's compare. That seemed an alright idea, so Fayette brought out one from her pouch. It was a red-brown gemstone small enough to fit snugly into her hand. She placed it next to the heart gem thing, and examined the two. Everyone spent some time poking, prodding and looking hard at the things, but the conclusion was unmistakable. So, I think it's pretty clear that something here is slowly turning ordinary rats into monsters, Mireille said at last. Fayette slowly nodded, accepting the idea. It might go against common sense, but there was no denying what she saw in front of her eyes. She gripped her broom tighter. This job might be trickier than we expected. A silence fell over them, and the three women stared warily into the corridors that opened from their first room. They seemed more foreboding now. Dangerous. Something truly wrong was going on down here. The silence lingered for quite a while, as they all brooded on the situation. Are you sure we should be continuing with this? Mire eventually said, looking at Fayette. We could leave and alert people about what's going on. The, maid, thought for a moment. True, it was much more than she had signed up for. A higher level of danger. She might have agreed to leave, if she was a normal hunter. She only had the junior license, and she didn't think the guild would be too pleased about hearing what she had been doing here. Besides, even if she managed to get away with it, it would be back to slime extermination or something equally dull. She made her decision. No, I'm finishing what I started. I think we should at least find out what's causing this, she eventually said, turning to the other two. Do you have any idea on how we could track the source down? Elise frowned for a moment, before shaking her head. This place is pretty expansive, we might just have to do it the long way. Mire waited for her to finish, looking proud of herself. Don't worry, I've got a solution for us, she announced. Oh, really? Fayette gestured at her. Do tell. I've had the foresight to keep one of my free skill slots, well, free. I've been keeping a throwaway skill on it, just for situations like this. I've just swapped in, basic tracking, for it. Elise looked at her, surprised. You keep a slot open like that. Doesn't it feel really bad if you swap skills like that? And you'll never be able to get the previous skill back, doesn't that worry you? The, semstress, brushed her off. It's only painful if you let the skill integrate too much, as long as you don't use it much, don't hold it for long and don't put any skill points in it, the process isn't too bad, at least once you get used to it. But what about the lost potential? You'll never get the first skill back. Mire waved the concern away. Not really a problem, most people stick to only one skill anyway, leaving all the others off. 
There are so many free skills, it doesn't really matter if you lock out a few every now and then. Selections can be pretty versatile if you really get to it, I can think of three skills that I could use to locate these rats. Selecting one now and then switching it away isn't too bad. Really? Elise responded, eyes wide with a new type of respect. But how do you get so many different ones? My selections didn't feel that versatile. The, semstress, seemed to puff up, delighted to extol her wisdoms. It's simple really, just ask people how they think they unlock theirs. People are all hush-hush about class skills, but strangely, well, free about their free skills. Ask loads of people how it's done, then try to get the requirements. Works surprisingly well. Fayette rolled her eyes as Elise and Mire kept at it, falling deeper into the conversation. She wasn't too impressed with tricks like those. Might as well just get a proper good skill right away. Being skittish like that is bound to be trouble eventually. She clapped her broom on the floor twice, taking back the stage. Alright, you've got your new skill. Get to tracking now, would you? We've rats to catch. I will, I will. It's just, Mire closed her eyes for a moment. I need to get used to using this. It takes a bit of practice, okay? Fine, you do that. Fayette said, then looked through the room. Her spice dust mix had been sent all over, and it would be a waste to just leave it all behind. A proper, maid, was economical with things. She started gathering up all the dust in the room into one big pile. Mire was muttering to herself, staring at one of the corpses. Elise looked a bit lost for a moment, but eventually went to stand guard over the entrance. It didn't take long for Fayette to gather up all the dust on the floor, and it really made a difference. Elaborate stonework had been hiding under the dust, and now revealed, it really brightened up the place. Fayette took up a lantern and turned to examining the walls. This was only an entrance room, so it held no sarcophagi or skulls as the proper catacomb rooms no doubt did. The light from the lantern revealed worn walls, dirty with grime. A shame, this place could really look nice if someone actually maintained it. Fayette took out a rag and started polishing up the walls. It really was a shame that a place that had once been built with lots of effort had eventually been left to rot. Why, it wouldn't take me too much effort to really get this place down. I'll need some more water, maybe a bit of, all-purpose cleaner, and then. Fayette, we are not cleaning up the catacombs, do you hear? The, maid, turned to Mire, frowning. Why not? It would only be a bit. Besides, you needed some time right, I'll just fetch some. No, I'm done. I figured out the general direction they were moving in. We're not getting paid to clean this stuff up, so we're not doing it. Take it up with the, Lord, or something. HM, I guess that is true. I would be overstepping if I began to really clean up here. If I see that, Lord, I'll have to give him a piece of my mind about the state his left things in. He should really hire some catacomb dash, maids, to keep this place in order. I wonder, is there a, catacomb maid, class, that could be cool. She sighed. Fine, we're not doing it. Which way is our target? Mire pointed to the leftmost corridor from the entrance. Those creatures were moving mainly from that direction. Elise, do you know what's down there? The, laborer, thought for a moment. That takes us upriver, out of this district. I don't think the catacombs extend that far over there, it just becomes a tangle of abandoned mineshafts. Fayette slowly walked to the corridor, sweeping her pile of dust along with her. Mire went forward to clear the wires she had set up over the entrance, and Elise brought in the lantern. The three moved forward, now practiced and ready with their formation. 22. Chapter 26, Pollution. It was a short walk to the next room, and soon another chamber was revealed through the bare passage. This next room had skulls lining the walls, though they were so covered in grime a lot of the effect was lost. Nothing that Dusty could look too fearsome. Fayette only had a moment to contemplate polishing them up before her, danger sense, flared up again. Incoming, only two. Her pile of spicy dust was a lot bigger this time, so when she activated, sweep dust, and sent it into the room, it managed to blanket the whole space. Two blurry figures were revealed by the dust adhering to their forms. The group moved in. This time their teamwork was more practiced. Fayette moved forward and dealt with anything that got close, 
while Mirai followed up with ranged strikes which tied up the more difficult targets. Elise followed as Rigard, watching their back and finishing off the tied up and disoriented enemies. It didn't take them even half a minute to clear the room of all five rat monsters that had been hiding in it. Nice removal, keep it up, experience shared with party, progress towards next level, 60%. The three stopped to catch their breaths. There was only one corridor leading out from this room. Fayette looked to her companions. Are you ready to move on? The other two took a moment more to settle down, before nodding. Fayette took up the lead again. They proceeded forwards. The next room was cleared faster, and the one after that had no rodents in it at all. Mire debated setting up wires behind them so that they would be safe from ambushes, but that would have been risky if a retreat became necessary. After some discussion, they decided on a compromise. She would only set up wires low enough that they would be able to jump over them when escaping. Fayette threw more spice into her dust pile when, spicy cooking, came off cooldown, around seven rooms into their run. She learned a few of the limits of the skill while doing this, the spices couldn't be too far away from her, or they would disappear. She also felt like there was a time limit to it, though not one she had hit yet. The spice was more volatile on its own, the stuff she had added to her bread was still there, but she could already feel the pure spice nearing its end. They encountered nothing strange for a good while, just more and more rats. They never assembled in groups too big to handle, and only seemed to have rudimentary intelligence. The catacombs continued on and on, a vast labyrinth of stone and bone. Fayette really wished she could have cleaned the place more as they moved, but she knew it wouldn't be right. She would have to seek permission first. Still, her growing dust pile meant that the floors at least were much cleaner than before. I think I'll settle on polishing some skulls on our breaks. Things changed after the seventh room they cleared. Fayette stomped on one last rat and smiled at the notification she got. Good combo, don't stop. Experience shared with party. Level up, you have reached made level 12. Congratulation. One skill point gained. Progress towards next level, 10%. Good, this has been worthwhile just for the experience. I have two free skill points now, Mire always keeps one in reserve. Maybe I should do the same. I wonder what I should put it in. She was honestly really liking her, spicy cooking, skill. Yes, it may have been better to think things through more. But more spicy spice. More spice in general. Once the idea popped up in her head, she didn't hesitate. Best not mention this to Mire, or she's going to make it a whole difficult debate or something. Skill up. Spicy cooking has reached rank 2. She focused on the skill, and felt that her control over it was better, more precise. She could differentiate between levels of spice now. Naturally, she turned it on full throttle. Max spiciness, go. A new pile appeared in her hand, this one more red than before. She took a good lick at the pile, it would be going on the floor anyway, why couldn't she indulge a bit? Perfect hotness engulfed her tongue. So spicy, this is great. I knew putting the level in there would work out. Did you just lick that handful of spice? A voice asked beside her. Fayette looked over and saw Mireille's disgusted face. You're just seeing things. She replied and threw the spice onto her pile. She could feel the first bits disappearing already. It made her a bit sad. Such a waste. Is something going on? Elise said, rising up from her rest. The woman seemed winded from all the rest she was taking, but that wasn't strictly true. She just had some sort of stockpiling skill for her endurance, and took care to keep it topped off. No, nothing out of order. Fayette said. How are your levels doing by the way, Elise? The woman grimaced. Not as good as you probably, but not terrible either. Killing doesn't seem to do anything for me, something I suspected. At least carrying all this stuff in dangerous situations seems to be good for it. I'm getting a decent bunch of experience. Enough chatter. Let's get moving, don't want this taking too long, Mire said, motioning the group into action. They moved on, and kept clearing rooms of rats. Fayette found her improved spices even more effective, the rats seemed a lot more disoriented from it. Their pace increased, and she was halfway to her next level when their surroundings changed. She looked at the path in front of them, what is that? The catacombs came to an abrupt end, with an opening in the wall revealing a corridor of rough stone, sloping upwards gradually. Looks like we've reached the mines, Elise said, 
looking at the place thoughtfully. She sniffed at the air. But this smell, where do I know it from? Fayette felt it too. There was a distinct odor to the air, something that didn't feel like it belonged in the catacombs or the mines. It had a twinge to it. Fayette thought it resembled the smell of failed alchemies. A weird smell, from the direction the rats are coming from, Mire said, looking at the others meaningfully. We might be closing in on our target. Elise looked uneasy at the thought. This, I might have an idea. We've been heading upriver for a good while. Can we move along? I want to confirm this. Fayette quirked a brow but nodded slowly. If their local had some sort of clue on what was going on, she would welcome the info. Let's move on then. Do we go up or down the tunnel? Mirai turned to pat at the little paw prints on the ground, and her hand came off sticky. She rubbed her fingers together, looking at the sludge that had been on the floor. I think the scent is coming from this stuff. These creatures are treading it all over. She turned to look the tunnel up and down, focusing on her skill. I think, they're coming from up. Fayette walked to the front. Let's go. They crept up the tunnel, looking warily at their surroundings. However, no attacks came. No skittering shapes lunged at them, and Fayette's, danger sense, did not go off. It was eerie. Such peace after the constant attacks they had endured so far. The stench strengthened as they moved on, gradually becoming clearer and clearer. Elise was looking at their surroundings, deep in thought. Fayette thought she could recognize the alchemical feel of the scent more and more. Is some sinister, alchemist, concocting villainies here? That would be quite the story. Eventually, the shaft led to a larger room, a place that had once acted as storage. The rotted remains of shelves stood against the bare walls, while an underground stream flowed by the far wall. The scent was coming from there. The three looked at each other and nodded. They moved towards the stream, looking around carefully to make sure nothing was going to ambush them. As soon as they got close, Elise rushed forward for a closer look. It was a shallow and narrow thing, slowly flowing along through cracks in the wall. A groove had been worn into the ground by the flow, centuries of work. The water, it did not look normal. As they got their torches closer, they saw the black, tar-like substance coating it. It floated on the surface, with the idle shifts in the flow revealing the clear water beneath. Elise was staring at it furiously. She sniffed at the air carefully, then looked up the stream. Her expression was, complex. Hey, Elise, something you should be telling us, Mireille prodded. It's just, well, she looked up the stream again and pointed. I've been keeping track of where we're moving, I'm pretty confident in it. She pointed at the ceiling above. Right now, we should be around Montaigne Avenue, below the big road. Fayette looked at her blankly. So, doesn't say much to us. Oh, right. The thing is, I'm pretty sure that this stuff. She pointed at the oily coating, then up the stream. This direction. There's not much else that way other than the factory I work at. It's like this stuff is coming from there. Mire suddenly looked a lot more interested. So, do you know what this stuff is? Is it coming from the factory or something? Elise slowly nodded. I think I recognize this smell. It's from around the boilers, the ones which keep the big steam engines going. They burn the magic oil there, and this stuff. She poked at the surface of the water with her finger. I think it's the runoff from that. There's a pipe from the furnaces, and they smell just like this. Fayette's first instinct was to get angry. Wait, is the factory just letting this stuff go, without a care in the world? No, wait. It could be just a leak or something. Should we report this? She turned to speak to Mire when she saw it. It was pure luck, she almost missed it. Her, danger sense, was not flaring one bit, but still, a creature black as shadow was slowly rising up from the ground, right next to them. It looked like it was materializing out of the shadows. A dark shape, dripping oily tar onto the ground. Much, much larger than any rat had right to be. It got out completely, then jumped forward. Fayette's, danger sense, still wasn't sending any signal. Elise, watch out! Fayette shouted, bursting into action. Not fast enough. The, laborer, was turning around when the creature struck her. A blow to the side, a flash of blood, and the, laborer, was sent tumbling down into the murky water. 27. Chapter 27 Rat of Unusual Size Mire acted fast. 
she threw out threads at Elise's struggling figure and started wrangling her out of the water. Fayette, take care of that thing. Fayette already had her broom out and was ready to take on it, but the creature, it had disappeared. She had only lost sight of it for a moment, and it had somehow managed to vanish. That thing, did it just appear out of the shadows? Troublesome. She scanned the dim room, but couldn't see it anywhere. She kept her broom at the ready, alert for any sudden movements. Maybe a similar strategy will work here. Those other rat creatures were also of the disappearing type. Sweep dust. As her broom touched the floor, a swirling vortex of dust gathered around it. Fayette removed her left hand from the broom, and activated, spicy cooking, cranking up the spice to max hotness. She felt the spice conjure into her hand and threw it into the mix. She kept her back to Mireille, ready to cover any approach the enemy. No, the monster took. This was definitely no half-breed. Fayette kept her broom held out, and she waited. She could be patient. Her patience was rewarded. She saw the creature peek its head out from behind a rotted wooden plank and instantly sent her spicy dust towards it. The dust cloud flew, and she saw it impact the creature, revealing its full outline. It was a monstrous rat, the size of a dog. A long tail swished out behind it, and its limbs were unnaturally long, more joints than she could count. Just as Fayette got a proper look at it, it disappeared again. The dust that had adhered to it was left behind on the ground as it slid down into the shadows, fading away. Fayette cursed, bloody hell, that had been my way of revealing these sneaks so far. Is this not going to work out? How exactly does that thing's ability work? She slowly backed away, stepping towards Mirai. The, Semstress, had used the fibers in Elise's clothes to thicken her thread into a proper rope and was helping the girl back on shore. It was troublesome going as she kept slipping on the tar. Fayette needed just a bit more time. She crouched down, keeping her eyes up to peer at the shadows. This monster was sneaky and vicious, it would strike if it saw an opportunity. I'll just need to give it one. She very consciously looked away, towards the oil lantern that had been left on the floor. She picked it up, making sure to be just that one bit too slow in the action. She had seen how fast the monster could move. She had also seen how her, danger sense, had not been enough before. Luckily, she had an extra point to spare. Skill up, danger sense has reached rank 2. A simple plan. If the current circumstances are not enough, change them. Her prediction proved true. This time, she felt her, danger sense, flaring. It was only a dim thing but it was still something, so she snapped to motion like a tight wound cord. She brought her broom out for a sweeping blow and felt the impact hit the thing. Tar sloshed out, and her broom end came back wet as a shape was sent flying back into the wall. Wet from Tar, sadly. No blood, yet. Then Fayette moved even faster. She picked up the lantern, and flung it out, right at the monster. The lantern smashed on it, cracked open, and burning oil was released on top of it, lighting up the surroundings. And the monster. Fayette felt herself grin. Let's see you fade into shadows with that. She quickly glanced back at Mire and saw that she had gotten Elise on shore. The, laborer, looked pale, caked in tar, and was breathing heavily. The, semstress, was crouched by her side, needle in hand. Fayette quickly felt inside her, apron of holding, and pulled out one of the health potions she had. Mirai catch, she shouted and tossed it back. Then she ran for the monster, she needed to finish it, quick. It was roaring out from the pain of the burns, a roar no rat should be making. However, just as Fayette got close, she saw the monster begin fading down into the ground again. It had rolled over to a spot free of burning oil, but still lit bright by it. Wait, how can it fade away there? There are no shadows there. She tried to rush forward faster and jumped in an attempt to stomp on the thing but her foot only hit the ground. Wait, where? She began to rush back, when she felt something. Her foot came off the ground, sticky. She looked down quickly and saw why this spot on the floor was still clear of burning oil, despite the flames right next to it. There was some sort of black tar on the ground, right by the spot where the creature had disappeared. Is it? She whirled around, looking back at the spot where she had first seen the monster. Now that she knew what she was looking for, she could spot it right away, a spot of sludge exactly where it had appeared. She had thought the ability was fading into shadows, but that had been wrong. It's moving from tarry sludge spot to tarry sludge spot. Fayette smiled. The fight had just been simplified at L.O.T. A monster challenging a, 
made, to a fight of cleaning, this, she could handle, she now knew what she needed to do, so she didn't hesitate, she threw her broom away and took her mop and, all-purpose cleaner, out, in barely two seconds, she was armed properly, mop dripping with the hissing acid, she started cleaning, first, she handled the spot right below her, the tar sizzled as her cleaner hit it, and she saw it come off the floor, leaving the ground spotless, excellent, she then ran to the other side of the room and started clearing up the various spots of sludge, slowly moving away from Mire. Now that she knew her targets, she could see the tar everywhere in the room. It was in all sorts of nooks and crannies, hidden in the shadows. It didn't seem natural, the splotches were too even, too identical. They were clearly the result of some ability. If it's an ability, there has to be a limit. She moved forward to the next spot and finally saw the creature make another move. It was running away now, spitting out globs of tar as it scurried towards the other side of the room. Whenever a glob landed, it would meld away to the ground and emerge from the new spot. Pathetic. As soon as you are figured out, you try to run. This is already over. Fayette chased it, clearing away all the spots as she moved, and it became a test of speed. Fayette's mop against the monster's tar, and, well, Fayette's cleaning didn't require ability use at this point. The monster's tar did. The speed difference was evident. It had to wait 10 seconds between each glob, while Fayette could clean away things as fast as her feet could move. She inevitably gained on the creature, just a bit more between every glob, and soon it was within her sights. It spun around and spit out one last glob, this time right at Fayette's face. She intercepted with her mop. The glob sizzled against her mop, vanishing away, and she kept her mop moving forward, right to the monster. It connected, a sizzling sounded out, and she pushed, pinning the creature down on the floor. She held the acidic mop against the creature, slowly but surely letting it melt down. The creature screamed out in pain and tried to struggle, tarry limbs writhing to get a grip on the floor, but it didn't work. Fayette's hold was too strong. She relished in the sound of it sizzling away, as she slowly pushed her mop further down. Then, there was a sudden moment when the sound stopped. The resistance under her mop faded away, and it hit the ground as the creature melted down into blood. A stark black monster core was left behind. That was a big piece of trash, nice. Progress towards next level, 90%. Fayette took a careful look around to make sure the matter was settled, properly. She saw no further sludge in the room, nor any other moving rats. Seems we're clear. She then moved back towards Mire. The, Semstress, was supporting Elise by the back, holding her steady. Elise looked W.A.N. and wilted, shaking as if struck by frost. The rags tied by her waist were red from blood, and black from something worse. Muriel had gotten a lot of the sludge off, but Elise was still far from cleared. Fayette winced internally at the mess. As Fayette approached, Mire shook her head and handed the potion back. Fayette felt the thrill of battle fade as she realized the situation was not quite clear. Not yet. This looks bad, we'll have to see a, doctor, dot. 22. Chapter 28, The, Doctor. Elise looked ragged, her gown had been torn at the thigh, and the wound she bore there looked nasty. Mire seemed to have managed to stop the bleeding, but the larger issue may have been the tar the woman had been dropped in. Fayette wasn't too keen on finding out what it would do to a human after seeing the rats. She accepted the healing potion from Mire and saw that the level of the fluid had not dropped at all. She turned to Mire, frowning. You didn't use the potion. The, Semstress, shook her head. No, we can't risk using it with who knows what getting in her body. It might enhance whatever she's been infected with. Elise, can you walk? The, Laborer, was breathing heavily and winced as she took a step forward. She almost stumbled down, but Mire held her up. The woman gritted her teeth. If you can support me just a bit, I think I should be able to move. Fayette nodded, then picked up their remaining lantern and began leading the group forward, back the way they had come. You said something about seeing a, doctor, where are we headed? Elise coughed into her hand, and after a quick struggle managed to speak up. Doctor, Nightingale, she's the one who's been looking after mother, and a lot of the other sick folk in our district. You saw her before for just a moment at least. She looked nervously between her escorts. She might be a bit eccentric, but she has a good heart. 
she really does know what she's doing, I think. Well, this doctor of yours sounds like quite the character, Mire said as she supported Elise's walk down the mineshaft. Fayette stopped to pick up the monster core left by the rat monster, and put it in her bag, among her other shiny treasures. Her collection had been growing a lot recently, but thankfully her, apron of holding, was making it a lot easier to carry around. They were soon back in the catacombs and speeding back down the way they had come. Fayette kept a watchful eye out, but no enemies made an appearance. She wasn't sure what she thought of that. Did we get enough of them, or did getting the big one do something, or are they just now wary of us? I wonder. I would like to make sure they are actually cleared out. Never let the rats spread. Their path back was an easy one, though they had to hop over the odd wire here and there. Traps Mire had set for the rats if any tried to circle back on them. Fayette was just a tad happy that the rooms were noticeably cleaner than on their arrival. She would have liked to stay behind and do a proper deep clean, but, well, some things could wait. She felt a bit of guilt as she observed Elise's hobbling gait. I don't think she would have come here if I didn't want to do this rat clearing mission, and I had a large part in making sure she came along. If Mire alone could have decided, would she have left her behind? Well, whatever. What's done is done, it would be better to channel my energy into more useful things. She gripped her broom tighter. Like this damn factory situation. Seriously, what are they thinking? Is this an accidental thing, or do they know? This has to have been going on for a while, right? Fayette began growing more and more annoyed at the textile mill, which was behind this whole affair, and barely noticed the rest of their trip out the catacombs. It was just such a stupid thing, even level 1, maids, knew to not dump trash in the neighborhood. They were soon standing back above the streets, and Elise began guiding them to their destination. It was late evening, and their group drew quite a few stairs. A, maid, and, semstress, with blood and signs of fighting on their clothes, and the injured, tar-covered woman they were helping along. It made for quite the unusual group. Fayette had, maid's poise, to compose herself against the stairs, but the others did not. Mire visibly grew skittish, keeping her head down while occasionally casting quick glances around. Elise meanwhile began groaning, not in pain, well, not in any physical pain at least. Oh, no, this is going to be the talk of town for months. For her, many of the stairs were familiar faces. This was her district, and she visibly grimaced at every familiar face. Fayette felt reassured by that, if the woman had the energy to be annoyed by something so mundane, and was hearty enough to get some blush on her cheeks, her injury couldn't be that bad, right? Their path through the streets only took them a bit under ten minutes, mainly due to Elise's slow pace. Soon they were standing by an unassuming house. Fayette had expected some sort of more official place, one with a plaque proudly saying, Dr. Nightingale, on the front. This house, however, was downright decrepit. It looked like it had been abandoned to the winds for a good while, before someone had moved in and began fixing things up. Flaky paint revealed the rotted wood under it, and the window was a cracked mess, still somehow intact. It wasn't exactly the type of place Fayette had pictured for their, doctor, of choice. Mire looked at Elise, a disbelieving look on her face. The, laborer, only shrugged. Look, I know what it looks like, but this is the place. She does really know what she's doing. The more, official types don't come down here. All right, Mire said, looking apprehensive. Still, they had a patient in need of treatment, and Elise's face had been growing more pale as they had walked. They couldn't waste any more time, so the, semstress, knocked on the door. At first there was no response, but soon sounds of clattering could be heard from inside. The crashing came closer, and the door opened. Fayette's nose was overwhelmed by a strong smell of alcohol. She had briefly seen her before, but this was the first time Fayette got a proper look at the, doctor. The woman who looked at them from the doorway looked young, but Fayette's first impression was just how, dark she seemed. Oh, she was rather pale truth be told, but she was wearing a stark all-black dress, and the gloom from inside the house almost made her fade into the shadows. Her dark hair was tied up in a tangled mess, but Fayette felt the most notable features were her eyes. Her eyes were sunken, surrounded by deep rings of dark, they hinted at many restless nights. Those eyes took in the scene quickly, and the woman's face instantly turned serious when she saw Elise. You brought a patient, all right, inside, don't touch anything. 
Her speech had just a hint of an Albion accent to it, which Fayette had expected based on her name. Nightingale, not a surname from this side of the channel. Still, Fayette felt reassured at the curt, professional tone. As a very professional, maid, she could of course recognize the tone of a professional. Her relief did not last long. As she stepped through the dark doorway, it was like she was stepping into her worst nightmare. Everything was splayed out everywhere, with no rhyme or reason to the order. Plates with half-eaten food left on them were on the floor, and bottles filled with dubious liquids were strewn all about. She was pretty sure half of the cutlery in use here were actual surgery instruments, and not proper knives. Worst of all, the doctor had just instructed her to not touch anything. A messy place she was not allowed to clean up at all. Fayette stepped further into her own personal hell. This is for Elise, I will bear with this. She focused on using maid's poise to its fullest extent and took care to keep her gaze forward. The less she saw, the better. Focus on Elise, focus on Elise, focus on Elise. The mantra she ran through her mind helped her calm down a bit. Just being aware of the mess all around made her skin crawl and prickle. She was only dimly aware of them being led into a dim room that was marginally clearer than the others, where Elise was laid down on a bed. Fayette felt like she was in a trance as she watched the doctor start undressing the wound. She carefully opened up the stitches Mire had made, then peered in. Her grimace was answer enough as to the state of things. She took up a clear bottle and splashed some of the liquid within on the wound. Elise flinched slightly at the stinging but did not cry out. The doctor then took out some measuring instruments, tried Elise's pulse, listened to her breathing using some queer instrument, took a swig from the clear bottle. Wait, what? Fayette's trance was broken as she doubted what she had just seen. Did that woman just drink from, no, it must have been my imagination. Fayette almost fell back into the trance, before Mire tapped her on the shoulder. Did you see that? Did she just drink from that? The same thing she put on the wound. Fayette blinked her eyes, slowly regaining focus. Oh, I thought I saw something like that. It smells like alcohol in here, do you think she? The doctor whirled around from Elise and gave the two a glare. No backchat in my clinic. I'm the professional here. I need to focus. Fayette and Mire nodded silently at her, and after looking at them for a few seconds, the woman turned back to her examinations. She took another swig from the bottle. Mire could not stay her tongue. She leaned over and kept her voice quiet and low. There, you saw it too, right? She really did drink from that. Fayette slowly nodded, then whispered back, even quieter. Is she really a doctor? I've seen a few. They visited the old lord, and they were very different. All fancy talk and noses held up. Do you think she's really licensed? The word license seemed to trigger some deep instinctive reaction in the dark-clad doctor, and she again whirled to look back at them. Fayette and Mire both did their best to look innocent, and after a few moments the woman turned back. Fayette and Mire looked at each other and nodded. Yep, definitely not. Still, they didn't talk more. The woman was evidently sharper than she looked. Despite the disorder in the room, she never hesitated in her movements. She walked in one corner, grabbed an instrument off the floor made some measurement with it, grabbed some cylindrical tube on the way. Her motion was practiced and efficient, and Fayette could recognize that the woman did really seem to have not just skills, but also actual, genuine skill. She has to be above level 15, or at least very close to it. License or not, she is no novice. Suddenly, the doctor stopped her measurements, stood up and looked around the room with a grave expression. Her voice was ice cold. Looks like a bad case of mana corruption, blood poisoning and various other nasty afflictions. Fayette shivered as she met the gloomy woman's eyes. It starts off mild, then growing fever followed by internal bleeding, eventually causing massive hemorrhage. Death in around 36 hours. Fayette felt a shock go through her. Elise didn't look that bad, is she going to die or something? That can't be. She started standing up. What can we do? Shush, the doctor hissed as she whirled at Fayette. Fayette shut her mouth. Do not interrupt me, the doctor said, maintaining the stare. After a moment, the doctor nodded. I can of course cure it. 
Fayette felt herself slip back down to her seat. She slowly drew her gaze back up to the stoic, Doctor. Why didn't she open with that? She made it sound so ominous. Probably, the doctor added, returning to work. Elise met Fayette's eyes and shrugged. For a moment they shared that silent connection of workers, and the maid could almost read her thoughts. It is what it is, but she does usually do good work. 22. Chapter 29 Let's Burn Down the Factory Fayette had been curious about how a doctor would cure such a thing, especially as she had made it sound so fatal. She was however not quite ready for the gloomy woman to cut up a new wound right next to the infected one, releasing a stream of blood. Elise however didn't even cry out, and seemed to treat the act as normal, so the maid held back her impulse. Right, don't hit the doctor with a broom to the head. I guess this is normal. Dee do you really need to cut her up like that? She's lost blood already. Stop prattling about, or I'll clear you out of my clinic. The doctor said, not moving her gaze from the flow of blood. It's just some bloodletting. I'm getting the poisons and infections out. Fayette slowly sat down and decided to empty her mind for the rest of this doctor visit. It was evidently all a bit too much to take in. The rest of the treatment didn't take long, and soon Fayette and Mireille were sitting by Elise's bedside, as the doctor cleaned her implements nearby. Elise still looked weak, but her breathing had steadied, and a healthier color had returned to her cheeks. With the injuries handled for now, they finally had time to discuss the matters they had found out. So, Fayette began, you're sure that it was runoff from your factory that you fell into? That stuff is turning rats into monsters. Elise was quiet for a moment, and the only sound in the room was the steady clanging of the doctor handling her gear. Eventually, the laborer spoke up. I'm relatively certain. I work near the boilers often, and the smell is unmistakable. I haven't encountered anything similar elsewhere. And the location, it was just in the right place. That can't be a coincidence. Do you think it's a leak in the machinery? Mire asked, gaze hard. Or, is this something? intentional, do they know what that stuff is doing? We would have to ask around, I'm not sure, Elise answered, though, seeing how the upper management acts, I wouldn't be too surprised, the factory is actually a bit up on the higher ground, on the other side of the ridge, getting that stuff over to this side would take some effort, or a really unlucky accident. Can it be a coincidence that it all flows right into the poorer districts? Mire asked, looking at Elise meaningfully. Fayette felt her emotions flaring the more she learned. Could someone really be so careless, so thoughtless, care so little for their workers? Fayette however knew. She had felt how a lord had gripped her soul and tossed it away like trash. She knew what these people were capable of. This couldn't continue. She began running through her options. Can we tell someone about this? This can't be allowed to continue. Who is in charge of the city? If we let them know, maybe this can be resolved. They'll put a stop to it. Elise shook her head, eyes listless. Fayette, the owner of the factory is the lord of the city, Lord Ormont. He owns almost all the factories in the city. A year back, there was some talk of workers walking out because he cut pay, but they were all let off, some even imprisoned. He doesn't take half measures. Fayette grinded her teeth. Why did things have to be so complicated? A silence fell to the group. As they mulled over the issue, it was too silent though. The three soon realized that a sound had stopped, the doctor was no longer clinking about with her tools or walking through the room. Fayette turned to look her way, and saw the woman was frozen in place, trembling slightly. The dark-clad woman slowly turned around, revealing a grim expression. She was not blinking at all, eyes bloodshot. Please do continue, do tell me more, she said, voice biting as winter frost. She began stomping closer. Tell me more about how this factory of yours is pouring this poisonous filth right into this district. She said voice rising with every step. This district where I've tirelessly been fighting the sickness, helping people withstand it. She got to the group and stopped right by Elise's bedside. Her voice fell back down in intensity, a calm river once more. Go on, I've half a mind to burn down that factory myself. Mire gulped. The intense glare was worse than anything she had faced at the orphanage. Um, well, we discovered some stuff being put into the water around here, 
it was down in the catacombs, and maybe it's from the factory, and maybe. Is that what did her in? The doctor asked, pointing at Elise. Mire nodded. Yes, she fell into a stream of that stuff with an open wound. The doctor's brow grew more furrowed, and her eyes seemed to sink deepen inside their sockets. It was almost like a dark aura had begun emanating from her. She looked to Fayette. The symptoms match up quite well with what's been going around in this district. A milder version though, the one people here have been catching isn't deadly, at least in the short run. We're still not sure it's intentional, Mire tried, shrinking under the doctor's intense glare. It could be an accident. The doctor scoffed. HMPH, a foolish hope. It wouldn't be the first time I've seen something similar to this, but feel free to entertain your fancies. She pointed at Elise. You, girl, you work at that place, right? Surely you can manage something to figure it out. The source of all this. Um, my sister's husband, Antoine, is a builder. Didn't work on my factory, but he might know someone who did. The doctor nodded and went to take up a paper and pen. She handed them to the laborer. All right, write out your request. I'll make sure it's sent out, and we'd better have answers within the hour. Elise took the pen into her shaking hand and began scribbling a quick message on it. She then handed it to the doctor. The gloomy woman picked it up, passed through it quick, then nodded. All right, this should go to your house, right? I remember it. Yes, my sister should be home by now, she'll know what to do. The doctor nodded then walked off outside the room. A tense silence fell as the group waited for her to get back, but she was only gone a few minutes. She returned soon, carrying some notes. All right, I've sent a street runner. They work fast for me. I made sure he understood the urgency, we'll know soon. Are you really sure we should get involved in this, Faye? Mire asked, biting her lip. This is serious. Big, noble business, city business. We signed up to deal with some rats. Not whatever this is. Fayette closed her eyes to think. It was true, dealing with this was not what she had signed up for initially, and certainly not hunter business. But, was this not what she had been planning all along? She had wanted to be a maid, who would not settle for just cleaning up a lonely mansion, but one who would pursue something grander. Wouldn't something like this fit that bill exactly? A huge factory, polluting a whole district, certainly work worth a maid, of her ambitions. Just how much experience could I gain from something like this, especially if I solved it directly? Should we even tell others? She opened her eyes, then met Mireille's. I want to do this. I think this type of thing was what I wanted, in that talk we had in the sauna. Besides, we are already plenty involved. The semstress sighed. I'm not surprised to be honest, but I do think this is rash. We might end up in real trouble here. If we do something, we only do it with a good plan. So you'll also help? Fayette asked, smile peeking through her lips. What? Were I to leave you, you'd be sure to do something proper rash and unthought, and probably get killed doing it. Can't leave you alone, can I? I do wish I was getting paid for this, though. I'm sure you'll get the rat money, Elise offered. Mire raised an eyebrow. Hardly enough to compensate this. Well, whatever. Let's see what the truth of matters is first. Just then, as if on call, a knock sounded out from the door. Fayette was impressed. Did the message get sent out and received that quickly? Can word travel that fast in cities? The doctor walked off to open the door, and soon led a gruff-looking man back. Broad shoulders, a thick mustache and worn workers' overalls, the very image of a typical builder. The man's brow quirked up when he saw the injured laborer laying on the bed. Elise, the message didn't say anything about an injury. What's happened? That's irrelevant, the doctor said, cutting him off with a wave of her hand. Her condition is stable, and we need information. The man looked a bit confused, but slowly nodded. All right, does her family know about this? What did you call me here for? Were you one of the builders who worked on the factory where Elise works? Mire asked. Is that the one by Castagnari Crossing? The textile works, or something of the sort? Yes, I was there for the whole time. Mire turned to Elise. I don't know the specifics well enough. 
you ask the rest. Elise thought for a moment, then started speaking slowly. You know that one pipe in the boiler room, which the runoff travels through, where does it lead? The builder thought for a moment, then shook his head. I don't know about that one. They had two teams building stuff there. One was locals doing most stuff. Then there was a group brought in, apparently some personal group of the lords, out of town people. They handled more sensitive stuff. We weren't allowed to see much of that. The doctor slowly looked at the other three women, meeting each of their eyes. So, does this not sound very convenient? Huh? What's this about? The man asked. Nothing you need to worry about. The doctor answered, then waved her hand towards the door. Off with you now. We have things to discuss. What? But Elise. When I say off, I mean off. The man squirmed under the doctor's gaze, then slowly slunk out of the room and out of the house. The doctor waited for him to go, then took out a flask of clear liquid from a pocket and took a good drink from it. Fayette turned to the doctor. So, we're definitely doing something. You in, Miss Nightingale? The doctor grimaced. Please don't be so formal with me. But yes, I am in. Call me Olivia. Fayette nodded, then began to think through the options. A factory was not handling its trash properly, and she could think of one simple solution. All right, that settles it. Let's burn down the factory. Three silent gazes answered her. New party member acquired, Olivia Nightingale. Class, doctor, level, skills. Surgery, forward slash, bloodletting, rank. Medicine, forward slash. Capstone skills, forward slash. Free skills, forward slash. 23. Chapter 30 Fayette, you can't just burn down the factory. Fayette liked direct methods. A factory was doing nasty stuff. Simple, get rid of it. Need to get rid of something. Simple, fire. However, the reaction from the others was not quite what she had been expecting. Three silent stares were all she got for her proposal. Eventually, Mire sighed deeply. Faye, we can't just burn down the factory. What? Why not? Fayette shut her eyes, thought for a moment, then snapped her fingers. Oh, right, of course. Because it's made of brick, right? I don't think you can burn brick. No, that's not the issue here. It would be like, a really big deal. Smashing the whole place up would have us all caught in moments. How would we even do that? Well, something has to be done to stop this. You have a better idea. Maybe a bomb. Elise slowly raised her hand, a nervous look on her face. Excuse me, stupid question. She flinched back a bit, gulping under Fayette's enthusiastic stare. I, if you bomb, burn, whatever else to destroy the factory, where am I going to work? Fayette blinked her eyes, disbelieving. Your own mother is sick, probably because of that stuff your factory is pumping out. Are you seriously saying that? The laborer shifted uncomfortably on her bed, gripped her braid, pulled it taut, and lowered her gaze. Well, yeah, I know. It's frustrating, but it's also true. Work is short out here, and we really do need it. A lot of people will end up on the streets if it shuts down. What if we just spread the word? If people knew, we could make them stop. Olivia scoffed. A risky effort, that. I've dealt with Highborn. A, eh, Lord, as high up as ours here can't have news getting out that his factory would do something like this. Once his people get one whiff of word spreading, the hammer gets brought down, hard. Can he really do something like that? Mire asked. Workers from his own factory are being affected, right? Surely he can't brush off poisoning them. HM, you would have a point with a situation more acute, but right now it's not serious enough for that. Olivia answered. What do you mean? Two factors. One, the illness is not that severe in the short term. People fall sick for a few weeks, then eventually get better, building a tolerance. The young and hearty don't get affected much at all. This type of thing doesn't really get nasty until the long term. Mire nodded. All right, that makes sense. The second reason? Olivia gestured outside her window. It's only affecting one segment of this one district. Patients are found on a long, but narrow tract, which expands as it nears the river. 
if it comes to it, the factory can just fire everyone from here, and hire from elsewhere, there are lots of people in need of work, it would hurt for a bit, but their machines don't really need high levels to work. Fayette frowned, it sounded like all their problems were coming from one source, isn't this simple, she asked, the others turned to look at her, and she raised her hand in a lecturing manner, we have a bad boss here, causing trouble and doing bad things, I've been in that situation before, just kill them and get some new work, it's worked well enough for me. Elise gasped in horror, kill him, you can't just kill a, lord. Fayette shook her head, actually, you can, it's not really that difficult, much easier than monsters to be honest, just take a blunt object and. Fay, Muriel interrupted, she had a palm to her face and was frowning deep. We really don't want to make murdering, lords, a habit, all right? Out in the countryside with a minor, lord, there were less eyes and such, but this is a big city, and the man probably has a formidable defense. Also, if he just went and died, you can bet all possible measures would be taken, we would have a lot of people after us. Fayette frowned, things were getting a bit too complicated and weird again. She hummed for a moment, so, I guess it's back to burning down the factory then. No, we are not doing that. Enough with the fire. Olivia slammed her fist on the table, getting everyone's attention. If not fire, what? Something has to be done. Something immediate. I'm done letting this fester now that I know the cause. She turned her gaze around the room, meeting everyone's eyes. It will stop. Mire shut up for a moment, then slowly nodded. All right, you are right. We're just going in circles right now. We need to plan. Whatever we are going to do, it's not going to be simple. She looked around the room. Do you have drawing supplies somewhere? Ink and a board, or something else? Olivia frowned but did not rebuke the question. She walked off, shifted through a few piles of junk, then came back with a wooden board, a quill, and some ink. Mire accepted them, propped up the board on a table against the wall, and started drawing. She first drew a fat man with a top hat sitting atop a factory, then a pipe leading out of the factory, then a district at the end of the pipe. Fayette thought the drawings were just a bit too cute for a serious planning session like this. Mire trailed her quill on the pipe from the factory to the district. So, we need to stop this whole process at some point here. Do you have any ideas? You sure we can't just sabotage the factory directly? The doctor asked. Mire sighed. We've been over this. Whatever we do, it can't be too obvious. Then do you have something better to offer? A longer pipe. You know that's stupid. It's hard, all right? A good answer won't come immediately. Olivia and Mire fell into a debate, thinking on the merits of various plans, while Elise interjected here and there. Fayette really didn't care for it. It was all getting so complicated. Why does this have to be such a pain? They're trashing the place, but we can't stop them because people need to work on their trash the place machines so they can live in the trashed place. What the hell is this? No sense at all. She started to get angry. When things at the mansion started getting bad, the solution had been simple. Get rid of the man in charge and ditch the place. But now, all of a sudden she wasn't being allowed to go give the, Lord, a good brimful of justice. Stupid city. Stupid. Lord, and stupid factories. This is what happens when people don't hire enough. Maids, trash just piles up and nobody takes care of it. Irritated, she slammed her fist on the wall, interrupting the debate the others were having. I wish we could just make the, Lord, and his ilk take care of it. If only we could, like, move the trash to those who are making it. I bet that would have them thinking twice. Mire looked at Fayette, amused. Fay you know we can't just. Wait, Elise interrupted, her face was thoughtful, measuring. Mire turned to her, quirking a brow. What, does that plan actually make sense to you? Don't be silly. The, laborer, shook her head. No, it's, you remember, the factory is high up on the ridge, right? It's actually located just slightly on the other side, the rich side. She pointed at the image of the pipe on the board. That's why they need that whole pipe set up. If they just let that stuff off right there, on site, it would naturally flow down, towards the better folk's side. Mire tapped her quill on the board. 
So, you're saying that if we just, say, punch a hole in the pipe somewhere, she crossed out a segment, our problem would be solved. It would flow away down from here, to the other side. Elise nodded. Hey, at least I think so. It would make sense. Things flow down, right? Fayette smiled. This was more like it. Let the ones responsible deal with it. I like this plan. Is this okay with you, doctor? Or is it bad to let the factory run and keep polluting? It would be going in a better direction. The doctor wasn't quite smiling, but the savage gleam in her eye was answer enough. I have no opposition to something like this. And please, call me Olivia. Mire still looked skeptical. All right, so we do something to change where all that nastiness goes. Fine. Won't someone notice? Also, how will we be doing this? Get some workers to sabotage it. Olivia shook her head. Risky letting word of our operation spread too much, especially to workers at the factory. Their foreman might have some loyalty check skill. Those are not uncommon. We might be discovered. Elise raised her hand. What about me then? I know about this stuff now. Olivia looked at her and poked at the laborer's injury, causing her to wince. You're not going to directly participate in this with injuries like that. By the time you're back to work, it should have been long enough. You should be distanced from whatever has happened. Mire grimaced, then drew three stick figures at the bottom of the board. One with a frilly apron and broom, one with a surgeon's knife, and one with a long, pointy needle. So it's going to be us three who do this then. Any ideas on execution? Fayette first looked around the supplies strewn throughout the room, then turned to the doctor. Olivia, do you have any alchemy supplies? I have an alchemy skill, maybe we could make a bomb, and clear out a new path for the runoff. Like, blast a hole into the pipe and ground. Hmm, yes, I do have supplies, and an alchemy skill of my own. That sounds, difficult, Elise said. It's going to make noise, doing something like that. Won't people want to investigate such a thing, and then discover what you've done? Everyone turned silent for a moment, pondering over the issue. Finally, Mire spoke up. I think we'll need a distraction. People will know that something has happened, but if we fool them into thinking we're after something completely different, they might overlook everything else. Especially if we mask our tracks carefully, and make sure the breach in the pipe doesn't get noticed. Olivia frowned. How would that work, in practice? Mire drew an explosion over a segment of a pipe, then tapped at it. As you said, this is going to make noise. People will notice something has happened. So, she moved her quill towards the factory, to a corner as far from the pipe as possible, then drew a plume of smoke. We make them think something completely different is happening. Fayette suddenly grew more enthusiastic. Where there's smoke, there's fire. I think that's a saying. Are we back to the burn things down plan? Mire nodded. Well, yeah, a bit at least. So, an explosion happens in one place, makes a bunch of noise, then smoke starts coming from somewhere else. A simple misdirect. Then we, I don't know, steal some important looking papers or something like that. They'll think that's what it's all about, then we take care, and cover our actual tracks carefully. Fayette started taking out her alchemy supplies, ready to get to work. This sounds good, let's do it. Olivia, can I see what you have? Elise tried to stand up on the bed but winced back down from the pain. Sorry for not being of help here. Relax, Fayette said, standing up and placing a comforting arm on the woman's shoulder. She pointed at herself. I'm a professional, I'll make sure this will get handled. Elise first looked doubtful. But, she ran her eyes over the group. A, maid, A, semstress, and A, doctor. A motley party that really didn't look like it belonged together, but there was something there. Some type of strength she didn't believe she yet had. I, guess you really will do this. It's actually going to happen. For some reason, she believed. 23. Chapter 31 How does A, maid, sneak? It was the morning of the big day. The operation was due to start in 16 hours, and Fayette was feeling grumpy. There were many reasons for her grumpiness, the first of which was perhaps rather typical, the weather. Something had changed in the wind overnight, and the smoke from the factories had been blown downwards, enveloping the district in a thick smog. 
Normally she may have overlooked it, but after last night's events, Fayette could not help noticing that the wind from the sea was blowing the smog distinctly northwards, away from the richer southern district, and right into the poorer, worker, districts. Was that an accident, or perhaps also by design? After waking up and seeing the smog, Fayette had felt like it was an omen for the day, though she didn't know if it was good or bad. The second, and more active source of annoyance, was that their operation was to be a stealthy one. She could handle a bit of sneaking about, but a whole mission of it, it really wasn't her style. Her preferred method was more, run in and hit things in the face with a broom. How was a, maid, supposed to be properly stealthy? Well, not however she was currently trying to be. This is hopeless. The way you move about, it brings in too much attention. Keep your head down low. Fayette winced back from the, doctor's, harsh words and slowly rose up to her full posture. She brushed some dirt off from her uniform, and tried to explain herself. Look, I can't just go crawling and creeping all over, my uniform would get much too dirty. Shoes were invented for a reason, you know. Olivia looked at the stubborn, maid, blankly for a moment, then took out her pocket flask, drank deeply from it, and said some inventive curses Fayette made sure to memorize for later. She had already learned many phrases from this training session. Yes, training session. It was an idea Mireille had put forward on hearing that Fayette was close to leveling up. It was a simple plan, perhaps if she focused herself on sneaking about for a bit and tried to get some experience while at it, she would get some type of stealth skill on her level up. Olivia had seconded the motion, and offered to act as teacher, the woman apparently had some experience sneaking about. Fayette wasn't sure where exactly a, doctor, would get such experience, but she did seem to know her stuff. As far as Fayette could judge, her advice was solid. Fayette just had a hard time putting it into practice, and Olivia was losing her patience. How do you expect to sneak around if you have to stay on your feet the whole time? Some things require getting down and dirty. Fayette felt her temper flare up just a bit, and gestured around the dilapidated warehouse they were practicing in. This place is absolutely covered in filth. A. Maid, is someone who clears such things away, not someone who rolls around in it. She pointed at the, doctor. Besides, aren't you a, doctor? Doctors, should also stay like, clean and stuff, right? You shouldn't be getting dirty either. Olivia quirked a brow and lowered her voice. Don't call me a, doctor, when we are out in public, especially in a loud voice like that. Now, do you think it's easy to procure fresh corpses from a graveyard? People keep a watch on those. A real, doctor, has to get down and dirty. Fayette clamped down, silenced by the words. Yes, she was learning. Not much about being sneaky, but very much about this strange, doctor. First of all, the woman seemed to have many talents unbefitting of a, doctor. She had brought Fayette into this dilapidated warehouse in the slums without any hesitation, as if such places were natural to her. Second, she seemed to be very testy about things said out in public. At times, the word, doctor, seemed almost like a curse to her, one she avoided with all her might. However, when she spoke the word herself, there was a strange pride to it, a contrast. The, doctor, ran her eyes over Fayette, and did not seem to approve. She shook her head and took another swig from her pocket flask. I honestly don't know what to do about you. First of all, all that white on your uniform brings too much attention. How do you expect to blend into the shadows if you are plastered with white all over? Fayette sighed and leaned down on her broom. It's true, I'm not being a very good student here. A stealth mission, and I'm failing at the very first step. Is there anything I can do to remedy this? She looked at her teacher, but the, doctor, seemed to be lost deep in her mind, trying to think of some way to figure things out. Fayette felt like just standing around would be wasting time, so she took out her broom and started sweeping the place. Maybe if I clean this place up a bit, I'll be able to focus better and figure out some way. Some time passed like that, with Fayette sweeping away through the warehouse and the, doctor, lost in her thoughts. The sound of her broom sweeping back and forth became steady and rhythmic, echoing through the dim room like a steady drum. Eventually, the, doctor's, head jerked back up, and she looked towards Fayette. Her face turned thoughtful. For a moment, there I almost forgot you were here. That sweeping, it lulls into you. 
Fayette nodded, and kept at it. It is pretty relaxing in a way. After I get into it, other thoughts fade away and I can just focus on my broom. I barely even realize what's happening around me. Olivia nodded slowly, then looked at the maid, again, this time with measuring eyes. I think, this might be an answer. She turned around, and started walking towards the exit. Follow me, we need to test this out somewhere with more people. Test what out? How a, maid, goes unnoticed. A quick walk later, the pair were standing in the busy market district. Guild halls, large shops, and provincial offices lined the street. Olivia strode through rapidly, peeking through windows and then moving to the next building. Fayette followed along, confused about what was going on. What exactly are you looking for? A place with many people, but few servants. The larger that gap, the better. Fayette didn't quite get what the idea was, but still followed along. Eventually, the doctor stopped in front of a guild hall, a guild for spice merchants. She gestured Fayette next to her and pointed at the door. All right, this place seems like a good target for testing. I want you to go inside and just start cleaning. Fayette nodded slowly. Just clean, all right. I can do that. What for? Just do it and try to walk through that door there. Olivia pointed at a door through the window and try to circle around, coming out that door there. She pointed at another door on the opposite side of the room. Fayette felt a bit leery of just walking into a place and acting as if she belonged there, but she was not one to ever back down from any cleaning work. She nodded, gripped her broom, then walked through the door. A bell rang by the door to announce her coming, and a few clerks looked her way. Fayette moved into the room, took one look at the state of things, and started cleaning. The place really did need it, bits of dirt had been tracked inside on dirty shoes, leaving the wooden floor a right mess. Fayette's broom made quick work of that issue. Nobody took issue with her presence. The few workers who had noticed her coming had looked away as soon as she started cleaning. Nobody stopped her, so Fayette kept at it. She swept all the loose dirt into a neat pile, then whisked it off outside through the door. She then slowly, naturally, walked through the door that Olivia had indicated. It led to a meeting room, with a meeting in progress. Fayette almost winced when eyes turned to her, but they turned away as fast as they had come. Again, nobody opposed her entry, so she walked inside and started sweeping this room too. Fayette was starting to understand. Is this, really working? I guess most people really don't take notice of a servant doing their duty, they just fade into the background of a scene, unnoticed. It was similar at the Hunter's Guild now that I think about it. That, maid, cleaning there, Nobody took a second look at her. A proper, maid, is someone who does what's needed to be done, without anyone realizing she's done it after all. Now more confident, Fayette increased her pace. She no longer hesitated, and truly let herself fall into her cleaning work. She barely noticed finishing the meeting room, and naturally moved to the next one, a hallway lined with marble statues. She took out her feather duster for those and made sure they were as good as new. With them done, she took care of the floor, and then moved along. The next door led back to the main room, and Fayette ended up sweeping the place again as more dirt had already gotten tracked in. She finished, walked outside, and gave the waiting, doctor, a confident smile. That's how a, maid, sneaks. Well done being a discreet maid, that's the sign of a pro. Level up, you have reached maid level 13. Congratulations. Progress towards next level. 0%. One skill point gained. You have gained a new skill, unseen attendant. Fayette's smile grew wider. Oh, how convenient. It was time to begin the operation. 22. Chapter 32 Operation Start. Later in the day, it was finally time to go. After succeeding at the level up, Fayette and Olivia had spent the rest of their remaining time concocting alchemical mixtures, mixtures with oomph for themselves and mixtures with flair for Mireille, who would be on distraction duty. Mireille had been making her own preparations during the day, gathering up various things necessary for their plan. The sun had set long since, but the smog still clung to the ground as they met up at a street corner near their target factory. The three were all wearing cloths masks over their faces which helped against it, at least a bit. The masks fit the other two rather well, 
Olivia and Mireille had chosen similar outfits, loose, all-black garments that hid the form, a good match for the masks. Like thieves straight out of a story, Fayette looked a bit more out of place. A pristine, made, outfit, fully decked out with a white apron, white cuffs and a white collar, it didn't really match the mask. She tugged at the thing with annoyance, it didn't feel good to be ruining her coordinated outfit like this. Why am I even wearing this stupid mask? We all agreed that I wouldn't be sneaking in with you too, my style is going to be more forward. Ah, well, that's true, Mire admitted, it's just that I didn't know that beforehand, so I got three masks for us, feel free to toss yours. Wait, you made these yourself, oh, I won't toss it then, I'll find a use for it later. Are you sure you don't want any disguise at all? Just going in your normal outfit feels, risky. Fayette flashed a smug smile and began digging through her pockets. Oh, don't worry about that. I actually came up with a countermeasure of my own. Just a second. She found her target, and pulled her arm out of the pocket, holding a pair of glasses. She carefully placed them on her face. There we go. This should work as a disguise, right? Mireille frowned. Well, maybe. I guess people would remember you as a, maid with glasses, but isn't that a bit too obvious of a disguise? Those don't even have any lenses on them. Well, I couldn't find any better on this short notice, okay. Besides, lenses would just mess with my sight, right? Can we get to business? Olivia said, I seeming to sink further inside her head with every inane word said. She had been with Fayette most the day, and Fayette had noted with concern that her alcohol intake had not stopped at any point, the gloomy woman had been drinking all the way until the operation. Fayette had made a few inquiries about whether she was truly fine, but the doctor had assured that she knew what she was doing. Fayette would have believed it too, if not for the slight sway her steps held now. Yes, let's get to business. Mire readily agreed, holding out a large bag. I made this for the last part of our plan, I'm relatively sure it will work. Fayette took it then handed the woman a bag of her own. It was full of bottles, which clinked against each other. All right, these are the mixtures you'll need for the distraction. Should make a lot of smoke. Mire nodded, then carefully accepted the items, making sure to keep her hands steady. She looked them over quickly, then nodded. All right, that should be everything. Are you two ready to go? Been ready since yesterday, the doctor said. I've been ready since, well, right now I guess, the maid said. Mire nodded. Let's head in then. We'll wait for you to distract the guard, Fayette. Anything goes wrong, run away and get back to that warehouse we gathered in. Fayette nodded, then started walking directly to the front gate of the compound. Mire and Olivia headed to the fence nearby. Their approach would be less direct. Alone, guard, was posted by the entrance, lazily leaning on his spear. Fayette felt a bit nervous at approaching him, but resolved herself. She was doing a, maid's, duty today, a good act for the people. She would not fail. She got closer to the guard, started sweeping away with her broom and activated, unseen attendant, hoping the guard would take no notice of her passing. It failed. The, guard's, eyes had began to glaze over her, but approaching the gate seemed to be too direct, his eyes snapped back to Fayette. She cursed silently. Hell, I guess it really doesn't quite work if I'm not doing natural, maid stuff, or I need more skill points in it, well, we still have plan B, Fayette stopped cleaning, dug out a paper slip from her pocket and showed it to the, guard, as she got to the gate, hello, I was sent for some cleaning work, late night order, the, guard, looked over the slip, then nodded, all right, head on in, Fayette nodded and walked past, yes, in a rather rare turn, Plan B was not in fact the, hit them with a broom, plan, that had been plan C. Well, I guess I don't always have to face things broom first. Convenient that the, doctor, had a skill for this. Fayette had been a bit surprised by Olivia whipping out a, forged documentation, skill, a skill that really made her doubt the woman's, doctor, qualifications. Well, it did help us out. Maybe she has a good reason to have such a skill. She walked further into the courtyard and reunited with the other two, who were already waiting there. They had slipped over the fence while she was interacting with the guard. Mire was glaring at the doctor, who had taken out her flask for yet another drink. 
Fayette started to get worried for the operation. Hello again. I got through. The card worked. I said it would, slurred the, doctor. That it did, Mire said, sighing deeply. She looked over at Olivia, shook her head, and spoke again. I guess we're now doing this. I'll head out to the administrative sector, you two keep out of trouble. If I don't hear an explosion in say, half an hour, I'll leave, and come look for you. Fayette nodded. If we don't see smoke after the explosion, we'll come look for you. You stay careful too, alright? You're the one going solo here. I'm the best out of us for heading out alone, don't worry yourself. Mire seemed sure of her chances, but Fayette knew she wasn't keen on showing any weakness, especially when important matters were at stake. She stepped closer and smoothed out the, semstresses, hair, the mask seemed to have gotten it all messed up again. Just be careful, you are new to this as well after all. Can you two stop the farewells? Olivia said, finally putting her flask away. We've got to get going, and time increases risk. They may have noticed us already, and sent word to fetch an elite capture squad. That type would annihilate us, and we could be behind bars getting our nails pulled off one by one within an hour. Two silent gazes turned to her, just a bit horrified. The, doctor, shrugged her shoulders. Hey, it's just a possibility, alright? I didn't say it's actually going to happen. That wasn't even the worst possibility. Mire looked at her for a moment, then sighed, stepping away from Fayette. All right, let's get to business. See you later. She waved a quick goodbye, and slinked off into the night, form blending into the shadows. Fayette took a look at her partner for this mission, a doctor, who seemed to be having trouble staying on her feet. She did not feel that reassured. I guess we'll head out too. She finally said and started walking to the main factory halls. Olivia silently followed her. The building they approached was a looming giant of red brick, with an array of tall chimneys breaking up the blocky shape. No new smog was being pushed out at this hour, but enough had been made during the day, the environment was still clotted by a black haze. The pair got closer, and soon saw their first roadblock, a large door. A large, locked door. Fayette looked at the iron padlock hanging from it with disappointment. As a non-official night cleaning crew, they sadly lacked the actual keys to the place. Do you think we could convince a guard to let me in? Fayette asked. I don't know, maybe. Olivia answered. To be honest, I don't want them having too many eyes on us. Harder to take them out with surprise then. I say we just nab a key from a loan, guard, dot. What? Are we taking one out already? Won't that make lots of noise? Not with my methods. This should work. Come, I think I see the light of a guard post over there. Fayette was leery of whatever this woman was planning, and only got leerier once she followed. Alone, guard, was walking the grounds with a lantern in hand, lazily looking over the premises. The, doctor, looked at the man thoughtfully, then turned to Fayette. I think your new skill could help here. Use your skill, approach, then once I'm in position, release it. That's when I'll strike. Fayette nodded slowly, it seemed the woman had a plan, so she would trust it. She took out her broom, started sweeping the ground, walked out to the open, and activated, unseen attendant. Unseen attendant, a proper maid goes unnoticed at work, a natural thing with this handy skill. Non-worker classes will have a hard time noticing you while you are attending to your maid duties. Clean inconspicuously, the guard took no notice of her as she swept away at the ground and walked closer. Fayette saw Olivia activating an ability of her own, one that made her seemingly blend into the shadows. It almost reassured her, but the sway she detected in the motion of the shadow did unsettle her for a bit. Well, if she fails, I guess plan C always exists. Fayette almost lost the last bits of trust she had when she saw what the doctor did next. She took out her flask and took a long, deep swig from it. Is she insane? She's almost to the guard. Olivia however didn't act like she had done anything unusual and just gestured for Fayette to make her move. The, maid, sighed silently. Well, I guess here goes nothing. She had gotten close enough, almost two brim measures away, and deactivated, unseen attendant. The, guard, jumped, noticed her at once. His eyes widened, and his spear shifted towards her. But then the, doctor, jumped forward. The gloomy woman moved with grace, 
slipping behind the man touching the back of his head. Fayette could just barely make out the words she said, transfer condition. Instantly, the guard swayed on his feet, then collapsed on the ground. The doctor, meanwhile lost the sway to her step and the flush that had begun creeping to her face, seeming to sober up completely. Fayette warily walked closer, and saw that the guard was already snoring on the ground. Olivia was busy digging through his pockets with one hand, while the other was holding her head. Ah, this guy was already nursing a hangover. Fucking great. Now I don't get to be buzzed, and have to deal with this. She finally found a keychain in the man's pockets and took them out. All right, found it. Fayette only had one thought, just what kind of doctor is she supposed to be, and how much had she really drunk? 20. Chapter 33 Sneaking in Fayette slowly backed away from the doctor and held up her broom between them. You, you're not using that ability on me. I won't get mixed up with any of that. Olivia didn't look at her, instead continuing to search through the guard's belongings for anything else of interest. Relax, it will be a good while before I can use that one again, she said. Wait, does she mean she would use it if she could? Only relaxing slightly, Fayette lowered her broom a bit. She would have to discreetly inquire just how long that good while would be, but for now she should be safe. Though, this really did not seem like, doctor, behavior to Fayette. Are you really a, doctor? This time the woman turned to look at her, thunder gathering on her face. Really a, doctor? Of course I am, I've got my license, I've done my apprenticeship. But you also had that, falsified documents, skill. Fayette held her tongue. She did not need to argue with Olivia more during this mission. All right, does he have anything more? Should we move on? Olivia rose up, still cradling her head. Yeah, he only really had the keys. Damn, how much did he drink yesterday? I can usually handle quite a bit. Fayette refrained from commenting and started silently leading them back towards the door. The padlock greeted them once again, but after a bit of fiddling about with keys, it was open and the factory was theirs to explore. Elise had made an effort at hammering the layout into Fayette's head, but the inside of the place still disoriented her. It was just all so big. She had seen big houses before, the manor had not spared expenses in that regard, but the enormous hall that spread out in front of her was something else entirely. It was by far the biggest room she had ever been in. The general principle for finding their target, the boiler room, was to follow the pipes that led there. The only issue was that the room was absolutely covered in pipes, they were everywhere. Fayette had trouble tracing them through the room as they went through. It all just sort of melded into one big pipe in her mind. She decided to leave navigating to Olivia, and focus on cleaning. There should, guards, inside the place too, so Fayette started sweeping the floors while under the effect of, unseen attendant. Olivia slinked forward ahead of her, flitting from shadow to shadow while under her stealth skill. Fayette moved too, but, well, her progress was a lot slower. There was a lot to clean with all the machinery in the place after all, and if she started cleaning, she couldn't leave things half done. How much dust do the tops of these pipes gather? Has nobody wiped these? She saw the glow of a lantern near, a guard, circling the premises on his night shift, but the man took no notice of her. Unseen attendant, was doing its job well, she was just a part of the scenery. She started getting really into it, there was just so much to do in this big hall. A bit of dust on the pipes here, wiping off some grease stains there, clearing the dirt off the floor, it was a veritable trove of cleaning work for her. Just as she was hitting her stride, the maid felt a tap on her back. Will you come along already? Olivia said, voice twinged with annoyance. You're not even going forward, you've circled back to clean the same place again twice. I found the boiler room already that way. She finished and pointed the way. Fayette blinked her eyes, noticing she had indeed been very thorough. Oh, yeah, the whole point was to discreetly move in that direction. This skill is more difficult to use than I thought. How am I supposed to only clean a bit? I'll try and start cleaning my way in that direction. Should we do something about the guard? There's only one circling around here. She whispered back. The doctor was silent for a moment mulling over the facts. Eventually she came to a decision. We'll have to take him out. He's too close. Our distraction wouldn't work. 
No way they would confuse the smoke source. Fayette nodded and started cleaning her way to the more open pathways, away from the forest of machinery and pipes. It rankled her a bit, leaving the big room only one third finished, but she could take others into account too. Sometimes, especially if that someone was Mire. Hopefully she's doing fine over on her part. I really shouldn't keep her waiting, this whole thing hinges on us as much as her. Can't have one group lounging about. She was starting to get close to the, guard, by now and could make out a tired looking man carrying a spear in one hand and a lantern in the other. He didn't seem to be paying much attention to his surroundings and didn't even look in her direction. I wonder if I could take him out on my own. Though, what exactly did, taking out, mean here? The, guard, didn't feel to Fayette like her other targets had. He wasn't really an obstruction to things working, just a man doing his normal job. The issue here was what he was guarding, not the man himself. What did that mean? So, someone has received orders to do something bad, but they themselves do not know it. What exactly should I do about them? Hmm, wish he was a kobold or rat or something. Why can't I just whack that, Lord? Would be so much simpler. A sudden moral quandary was really not what Fayette needed right now, so she decided to just ignore it and think things through later. For now, she would get rid of him, whatever that entailed. There were no guarantees in combat after all. I'll just do my best. Whatever will be, will be. She was quite close to the man by now, and he still hadn't taken any notice of her. Was this another invitation? She would take it. She slowly moved onward, careful to keep sweeping up the dust. Just a few feet away from him, she suddenly stopped, and thrust her broom forward at the, guard, aiming right at his head. For a moment, Fayette thought she would get him, but suddenly the man perked up, falling into a proper stance. His face showed some surprise, but that didn't slow his reaction, and his spear came to block the broom in a practiced, instinctual motion. Her broom was swatted away, and Fayette took a step back, frowning. Damn, guess this isn't going to be quite that easy. The, guard, also took a step back, keeping his spear pointed at Fayette. His face no longer looked distracted, only focused. What do you think you're doing here, girl? A broom, really? He warily looked around, then started advancing, slowly walking forward, bringing his spear tip ever closer to the, maid. Lay down that thing, don't think of trying anything foolish. Fayette started backing away too, though not because she feared the spear. The man's words hadn't pleased her. Want to make fun of my broom, huh? I'll show you. She kept backing up, all the way to the point where she had stopped cleaning. The point where her big pile of dust was lying in wait. She took one more step back, then thrust her broom behind, activating, sweep dust, at the same time. Like a painter using their brush, she swept her broom back around and sent the cloud of dust at the man. He pulled back. Iron wall. A grey barrier appeared at his front, and blocked the cloud of dust completely. It faded away after a second, revealing an unharmed, guard, spear ready for a thrust. He advanced, thrusting forward. Fayette silently cursed to herself. Fighting a proper, fighter, one-on-one -on -one seemed to be a bit harder than she had hoped. Luckily, she was actually not fighting one-on-one. -on -one. Olivia finally chose to make her appearance. The, doctor, was suddenly there right behind the, guard. Fayette was shocked too, she had also forgotten her backup. The gloomy, doctor, had a surgical knife in hand and struck it at the man's back. Blood started pouring out in a steady stream, and the, doctor, stepped back before the, guard, could react. Fayette recognized the skill, bloodletting. So it's useful for something like this too. The, guard, didn't yell out or panic, he simply turned and backed away to the wall so that nobody could get at his back again. That, however lost him the imitative. He tried to reach around with his left, an attempt to try to plug the leak, but it didn't work. The blood flow didn't stop. Fayette heard him mutter a quiet curse. I give him a minute before he's out, Olivia said, joining Fayette's side. She looked at ease, as if a spear wasn't pointed her way just a few paces away. Fayette was warier, still keeping her broom pointed at the man. You took your sweet time. She said, a bit irritated at the woman, needed to have him distracted, and having just used a skill, ideally, Olivia responded. The, guard, seemed to realize that the blood flow wasn't stopping, and made a decision. He suddenly sprang forward, abandoned his defense. You bastards, 
I'll take you with me, he shouted as he rushed forward, aiming to skewer Olivia. The doctor instantly backed away to the side, leaving Fayette in his path. The maid didn't have another pile of dust at the ready, but she had other ways. The guard didn't seem too poised anymore, bleeding and panicked. Don't think you can manage another block like that. She used spicy cooking, conjuring up some spice in her right hand. She kept the hand closed and on her broom, not revealing her ploy. The guard got closer. Once the man was almost at her, she sprang back and threw the spice right at his face. This time, he had no shield skill. The spices landed true, and the man lost his vision, yelling out in frustration. A blinded, bleeding and frustrated opponent. This was something Fayette had more experience and confidence with. She sidestepped the charge, stayed in brooming range, and swung her broom at the man's helmeted head. It rang like a bell, and he fell down, needing no more. This time, Fayette stayed her hand. She didn't think the man would be getting back up any time soon, especially judging by the bloody trail he had left behind. He wasn't bleeding any more tough. Olivia seemed to have stopped the skill. The doctor reappeared next to Fayette, stepping out of the shadows once more, and inspected the man. Fayette felt a bit frustrated that the woman had run off again, leaving her to deal with the man, but she stayed her tongue. Now was the time for work. She looked at the man, and noted he was still breathing. Is he going to be all right? She asked the doctor. Olivia shrugged. Maybe. Probably. I don't know. No time to check. Fayette wasn't sure whether that was really an attitude befitting a doctor, but she didn't really care that much. Well, whatever. Onwards it is. I wonder how Mire is handling her end. 22. Chapter 34 Mire's Distraction A while earlier, after the group had separated into two, near the administrative building of the factory, a semstress was looking at the place from outside, debating how she should head in. The sloshing bottles she was carrying unnerved her a bit, but she trusted Fayette enough. They shouldn't explode on her without warning. Hopefully, she was feeling a bit nervous. Sure, she had talked big game earlier and reassured Fayette that she could handle things on her own, but she was still very new to all this. Going from orphanage girl to would-be industrial saboteur in a matter of days was quite the career change. Not the career change she had been hoping for, really. Hunter, all right, maybe, there could be a career in that. The pay was decent, the rules lax, and schedules free. One had to have some initiative, but Mire had never lacked for that. This, on the other hand, she wasn't being paid at all. It was practically philanthropy, something that was generally the purview of the wealthy. Why did I let myself get talked into this? Oh well, I guess I couldn't have released Faye to wreak havoc on her own. At least I managed to get the pay for the rat job. While Fayette and Olivia had been busy with their own tasks, Mire had spent the time negotiating payment for all the rat corpses, with an added hefty bonus for the danger factor. Still, that bounty wasn't really for monster rat things. Only double the pay hardly feels sufficient. I really should have negotiated harder. Gah. I need to focus. She was walking the outside of the building, peering inside windows set between brick. Finding a proper entry point took some time and some circling, but soon she found a target. A window with a latch, above which was a narrow ventilation hole. Much too narrow for even a hand to fit through, but a semstress had her ways. Mire focused herself and prepared to act. I better get some good experience for this one. She took out her thread and needle and sent them through the ventilation hole with needle control. She had originally put a whole lot of points in the skill as a childish whim, it had felt the most magical out of all her skills at that time. A 15-year-old was liable to partake in some matters like that. She no longer regretted the childish fancy, for the ability was proving very handy in her current line of work. She carefully watched as the needle passed through to the other side, then guided it towards the window's latch. The next bit would take some fine control, but she was practiced at this. She wound the thread around the latch for a few loops, then tied it off with a simple knot. She tugged at it to make sure it was secure, then pulled at the line. The latch was pulled up, and the window opened. Mire let herself feel some pride. It was one thing to plan something, another to actually pull it off. Nice, I had hoped it would work this well. She carefully lowered her bags through, making sure to not knock the bottles around too much, then followed. 
It was a dark room full of chairs and tables, many still holding important-looking paperwork. Mire looked around, searching for the most important-looking door. A proper distraction needed impact, a factor which generally depended on two things, how valuable the thing under threat was, and how important the person it belonged to was. Ideally, I want to find, like, the owner's room. I bet it's high up. If I was big and important and rich, I would definitely want to look down on the people under me. There was one promising candidate, a stairwell. Her instincts told her to go up, so up she would go. First, she would however take a moment to look through this room. Unattended paperwork could hold surprisingly juicy tidbits. She took off her shoes, as she didn't want to be clacking about on flooring like this. Silence was paramount. Her soft steps made no sound as she padded on the mats, making her way through the room. She gave up on trying to decipher the paperwork after the first few files she perused. Efficiency throughput flowcharts, SWOT analysis diagrams, what is all this nonsense? I'm not educated for this. She changed her tactic and started scanning for monetary symbols, ideally she would find some financial spreadsheets. Stealing some of those would really make this look like a case of industrial sabotage. She didn't have much luck finding any though. This seemed to be the wrong office for that type of stuff. I guess I do have to head upstairs. Bet they don't let the lowly grunts get their hands on anything too compromising. Just in case, she snatched the most important looking papers she could find before heading forward. She walked over to the stairwell and started climbing the stairs. She took care to step carefully, stories always ended with the sneak getting caught by a creaky plank. Atop the stairs, she met her first true obstacle, people. Well, a person. She carefully peeked around a bend in the stairs, and saw that a man was posted up top, leaning against large curtains, nodding off, but still awake. Mire backed off downwards until she was sure there was no possibility of him noticing her. Alright. How do I want to handle this? Someone guarding the way should mean that the way is important somehow. Heading through seems the best option if I want the most impact. However, removing the guard might be difficult. Mire had acquired a new skill recently, durable threads, which should help. It was still risky though, there was no telling what abilities others possessed, nor how they would be able to react to her. She needed to take the man out, without him having any chance for a counterattack. Difficult. She ran the scene through her mind. I think I can reach him with my abilities from behind the corner, but he would notice anything too direct. I need to tie him down somehow. Alter garments, to restrain him and threads around him to make sure he can't move. Too slow. How would I get them on him in time? My threads don't work that fast, and, quick stitch, only has a limited range. Then, an audacious idea came to her mind. The curtain the man was leaning against. It was big, seemed sturdy, and was attached to the wall above through many links. It was also made of fabric. Could she attach him to it somehow? What exactly counts as clothing? Could I use, alter garments? on it. That would make things easier. She had seen Fayette's creative interpretations of cleaning, what was stopping her from doing the same. She tried to imagine it. Can I really count curtains as clothing somehow? I could certainly make clothing out of a curtain, but, alter garments, only works on actual ready, wearable clothing. How could I see this? Could you wear a curtain as like, a rope? She tried to run her mind through different options but came out empty. She just couldn't picture herself wearing a curtain as some sort of crude toga. I have to think like Fayette would, simpler, more direct, often more effective. What could I? Then the answer hit her. A cape. That's it. A curtain could totally be just a really big cape, one that is just being hung up on the wall for some reason. Yes, this should work. Her answer found, she snuck back to the bend in the stairs, made sure the man was still leaning against the curtain, then sent out a needle and thread. They snaked along the wood flooring, barely fitting into the crevices between the boards, just out of sight. It was at the edge of her range, but she could just barely make it. Good, no need to put extra skill points into that for the range. She felt her needle connect to the curtains. She focused her mind on imagining the curtain as a cape, and felt her ability work. Take measurements, alter garments. She got a picture of the curtains, and how the man leaning against them pushed against the fabric. She began to mold it, shaping it to fit against his back, careful to keep him from noticing. Soon there was a man-shaped depression in the curtains. With the curtain in place, 
She started stitching it to his clothes, attaching them together. She only made quick, rushed stitches, and then started using, mend, to meld the fabrics together, truly making them one. It was quick work, taking only another minute. The man was now firmly attached to the curtain, like a fly caught in a web. None the wiser of it too, his nodding head had not moved one bit. Now she only had to finish the job. She started walking up the stairs, poised to rush out as soon as she was noticed. She held her breath with each step, hoping things would be easy, that she would not be noted at all. It took until the last stair. The treacherous step creaked at her passing, finally alerting the man. His head bopped up, turned to her and his eyes widened in alarm. It's always a creaky step, isn't it? Mire rushed forward. The man tried to move his right arm down to his sheath to draw his weapon, but found it stuck. The arm wouldn't budge, the clothes were sewn onto the curtain too firmly. He opened his mouth, and only the beginning of a shout got out before Mire reached him, and sent out her needle at his face. Quick stitch. His lips were sealed, sewed closed, and the shout stopped before it could begin. Judging by his expression though, he would have liked to shout a lot more, least of all from the pain. Mire saw his muscles bulge out, some sort of strength ability, and moved to restrain him further. Threads enhanced by, durable threads, were wound around him, restraining movements. His garments were shrunk and melded together, stopping the last of his squirming. Mire looked at her work, satisfied. Sorry about that. The man did not answer. Good job with the innovative clothing. Keep it up. Progress towards next level, 45%. Hmm, looks like getting inventive is appreciated. I'll have to think on stuff like this more. Mire focused back to the task at hand, finding an important looking place, and then throwing the mixtures she was carrying inside. The corridor had doors to the sides, but those were not what Mire was drawn to. At the very end, there was an ornate door. An important and expensive looking door. She was sure that just that door cost more money than she had seen in her life. Whatever is behind there, it has to be valuable. And besides, it's not like we're getting paid for this. Might as well help myself to something proper. She walked forward, and carefully tried the handle. She didn't touch it herself, rather using her durable threads to pull at it from a distance. Never could be too careful. It didn't open, and Mire grimaced. There was a keyhole on it, but she had hoped she would be lucky. She looked closer and peered through the keyhole, trying to think of some way to bypass it. Maybe I could stuff it really full of thread, and try to force it somehow. Could the fishing line work here? Hmm. Maybe I need to take up a, lockpicking, skill. I do have one free slot now. Her thoughts were interrupted as she heard an explosion run through the building, shaking things about here and there. She leaned against the wall for support, but it was over fast, the shockwave passing as fast as it had come. Guess Fayette managed it. Mire looked at the bag full of bottles by her side. Drat. I'll have to hurry. I only have a few seconds before I really need to throw these. As an experiment, she decided to try sending her needle through the keyhole, to the other side of the door. As she sent it through, she felt some sort of barrier break, and a shiver ran through her as she felt something settle on her. An ability, not one of hers. A voice drolled out inside her head. Trespasser Ward, Mark Trespasser, dot. There was an unoppressive feeling to the ability, like an unseen eye staring at you. She could guess what it did based on what she had just heard. Okay, that can't be good. She felt the beginnings of panic start up inside her, but she squashed it down. Her friends had managed their part, she would have to manage hers. She took the first of the bottles out of the bag, threw them, and saw smoke and fire spread. Then the alarm bells started ringing. Mire. Class, Semstress, Tier 1. Level, 10. Skills. Needlecraft, 3 quarters. Quick stitch, rank 2. Needle control, rank 4. Durable threads, rank 3. Tailoring, 3 quarters. Adjust garments, rank 3. Mend, rank I. Take measurements, rank I. Capstone skills, 0, 0. Not applicable free skills, 2 thirds. Basic trap setting, rank I. Basic tracking, rank I free slot unspent skill points, 1. 19. Chapter 35 Let them drown in their own filth. A bit earlier, after Fayette and Olivia had finished dealing with their one, guard, they were nearing their target. 
The factory lay silent around them, no more, guards, walking the grounds. The silence grated on Fayette. She was getting more and more curious about the doctor, she was working with every moment, and after they stepped into a long corridor she could no longer hold it in. Should a doctor be doing stuff like this anyways? You really got that guy good. Isn't there like a do no harm oath or something? Olivia spared her a small glance but kept her focus forward. HMPH. Maybe for those university pissants, always so high and haughty, doesn't stop them from focusing on greed instead of their work. Have you done stuff like this before then? The woman slumped down a bit. No, I haven't, to be honest. I wish I had. Hearing you lot plotting something like it was natural, I wanted in. I need this. Need it? What makes it so important? Olivia's sunken eyes turned to her, and she sighed. Being a proper doctor is not that pleasant, you know. It's very frustrating. Really? Isn't helping people nice? I always feel good after cleaning. Bringing things to order feels nice. Well, maybe. But for me, it's just always felt so futile. The woman looked up at the pipes running above the corridor, reminiscing. As a doctor, you are always behind the curve, reacting, desperately trying to stay the symptoms. She turned back to Fayette, and this time there was anger in her gaze. It's frustrating, you know, treating people, trying to help them, and knowing that you can't get at the true cause, and it will bring more patients. Once, I was working at a village which had a bandit problem. There were frequent clashes, injured people coming in, missing legs, arms, eyes. She turned back forward. I treated them, but new ones didn't stop coming in. The bandits were still out there after all. It felt futile, no matter what I did, more people would keep coming, injured. Then, some hunters came through and dealt with the bandits. It was done, the town threw a party for them. Know what happened to me? They thanked you for your services. Fayette tried. Olivia laughed, a bitter angry laugh. Ah, if only it was so. No, I failed to treat a few people, people that mattered, important ones. Folk got angry, blamed it on me, because they didn't think I was a proper doctor. I had to run away from there. She gestured at the room around them. This, it's finally cutting directly at the source, treating the cause, not the effect. It's nice, something I needed. Fayette nodded, mulling over the words. She understood, in a way. She had thought many similar things before. A, maids, work was also about dealing with effects, and she had only recently moved to causes. Killing the rats lurking beneath the city was one thing, getting rid of their source another. But, she couldn't help feeling she was missing something. She looked at the pipes running above her her, one single component of this giant factory, which was one factory in a giant city, a small speck in the grand scheme of things. Was even this enough? How much was she really doing with something like this? She shook the thoughts out of her head. She could think on it later. Now, she had a task to complete, and complete it she would. They stepped out of the corridor, finally arriving at their target the boiler room. Huge metal tanks were lined in rows, with a locked storage container that reeked of magical in one corner. Below the tanks were the furnaces, vast things below which a channel ran, a channel then ended in coppery pipe, low on the ground. No fires burned at this hour, but a black, oily sludge was still steadily dripping down from the furnaces, down into the channel where it mixed with the water flowing within, then being carried into the pipe. Fayette could smell the same acrid scent she had felt down in the undercity. There was no doubt about it, this was the source. It felt odd. This one little pipe, in this one big room was causing so much harm to people. In a way, it reassured Fayette. If such an insignificant thing could cause harm, why couldn't a humble, maid, put a stop to it as well? She looked at Olivia and nodded. This is it. It's the same smell. The doctor frowned and went to inspect the furnaces, as well as the channel leading out of them. She took out a test tube, collected some residue into it, then sealed it. She nodded at Fayette. All right, I've got some samples for myself. Let's see where this pipe leads. Fayette traced it through the room, and saw it lead forward, down another corridor. This one had a locked door safeguarding it. Luckily, the guard had been kind enough to provide a key. She walked to the door and tested the key on it, and it slid right in, 
clinking in a satisfying manner, the door swung open, and the pair headed further in. How far in do you think we should make the breach? Fayette asked, examining the corridor around them. Olivia hummed in thought, I think, we'll need to head out forward at least a bit more. I would like to have a more open space somewhere, where it would feel natural for something important to be. I think our decoy has the best chance working in a place like that. Makes sense, let's move on then, though we can't go too far. Have to stay on this side of the hill so it all runs off into the correct direction. They walked a bit further, diligently following the pipe, and the corridor opened up, widening for a bit. Is this our spot? Fayette asked, already lowering her bags to the ground. I think it should work. Olivia answered. She bent down to examine the ground below the pipe and wiped off some dust. The corridor steadily descended down, and the brick flooring had been replaced with bare stone. It didn't look too tough, Fayette estimated. She pulled out a canister from her bag. No point waiting around. Let's do it. Olivia thought for a moment, then walked back from the pipe, slowly backing away behind a bend. All yours. Fayette smiled. She rather liked the current plan to be honest. Blow up a little hole into the ground and pipe, cover it up, and let the factory runoff go where it really deserved to. She marked a proper spot, then placed a canister of explosive by the pipe. It wasn't that deadly of a concoction, but should work well enough to get them started here. With the explosive in place, she then took out a cloth pouch filled with reagent. She uncorked the canister, threw the cloth pouch inside, then bolted, running back behind the bend as fast as her legs took her. She made it just in time and managed to cover her ears before an explosion sounded out, filling the corridor with loose dust. Fayette coughed in the haze for a bit, then took out her broom and activated, sweep dust, nothing like a proper, made, to clean up after an explosion. She swept the loose dust up, then walked back to the explosion site, collecting the dust along the way. It took her a bit of time to get it all collected into a pile and visibility restored into the passage. Olivia crept up from behind her, coming to inspect their work. The pipe had been burst open along a segment, and the runoff was gushing down from it, making the acrid stench even more prominent. It was running right into the hole they had just made into the ground. To be honest, it felt underwhelming. All this work, for the sake of one burst pipe. To be fair, their strategy was reliant on things not being too noticeable. It would take time for the runoff to really seep into the ground, and start bringing joy to those deserving. Fayette could almost imagine it. Let the nobles deal with the rats next time. Enjoy your own filth. Is it good enough? Do we have to blow the ground open more? Fayette asked, walking beside the doctor. She had a few more canisters of the explosive with her, just in case the first bunch didn't do the job. I think this should work well enough, Olivia answered, then pointed down their fresh hole. See that? It's not bare stone there, that's dirt. See how the runoff is already seeping into it, it's going right into the ground. Fayette squinted down the hole and saw it was true. The runoff wasn't pooling up, so their task should be a success. At least the first part. Next, the cover-up. Mire should be acting now. Better hurry up. Can you get the top out? She asked. I need to clean up the remnants of the explosion. Still a lot of traces remaining. We can't have that. The doctor nodded and started opening up the top Mire had made for them. Fayette, meanwhile, got to cleaning. It was a pretty quick job. Gather up the dust in the room, then wipe off any visible stains and burns with a bit of her, all-purpose cleaner. Once she was finished, Olivia threw the top over the break in the pipe, and then they secured it over the hole together, covering up all of their work. Fayette took a step back to examine their finished work. She wasn't honestly sure whether this was a stroke of genius or complete foolishness, but it was the best ploy that Mire could come up with. There was no visible sign of their sabotage visible, just a segment of the pipe covered by a large top. A top with, do not remove, important maintenance, written on it. Does this type of stuff really work? Fayette asked. It felt too, blatant. You would be surprised. Olivia answered. People like to have simple days at work, and follow instructions. I doubt anyone will be removing this for quite some time. I don't think anyone who would dare would even be allowed down here. Fayette nodded, still feeling nervous. She however wasn't feeling that nervous about the talk ploy to be honest, she trusted Mireille's judgment enough for that. 
What she was really nervous about was a deeper feeling within, that soundless calculation she could sense. She had not gotten an experience notification yet. She could, however, feel it. It was connected to her class, so it was like an itch just outside her reach, intensifying. It had never taken this long before. She had done all this because it felt like the right thing to do, the right thing on her, made, path. But was it really so? The message would reveal it. Not seeing it filled her with anxiety. Olivia was already jogging away, so Fayette turned to follow. They couldn't tarry. However, Fayette's mind was not with the operation at the moment. The calculation was still going on, measuring, judging, weighing. The sound of the runoff flowing through the pipe was clearer to her now. The sludge was seeping down into the ground, away from the undeserving district of before. A proper household took care of their own filth. No proper, maid, should accept irresponsible waste dumping, Fayette was sure of that. She clamped down on her nervousness. I am not wrong. This is the correct thing to do, and even if the system disagrees, I won't. Put that trash where it really belongs. Darn, that's going to end up being a lot, won't it? Level up. You have reached made level 15. Congratulation. Two skill points gained. Progress towards next level. 10%. Fayette stumbled on her feet. Two whole levels. It had really liked that. L level 15. But doesn't that mean? Tier 2 class upgrade unlocked. Five different options available. 16. Chapter 36. Made. Class up. Fayette almost completely lost her balance when she saw her class options. Out of her five options, she sensed only one common one, leaving the rest as uncommon. All right, she had been fairly certain that she would receive an uncommon option, but four, that was more than she had dared hope. She decided to look over the common one first, just so she could gloat her superiority over it. Made adept, after gaining proficiency in the basics of your craft, you are ready to tackle greater responsibilities. A natural next step for all maids. One can always count on a maid adept to handle the housekeeping and attend to their master. Expand attendant and housekeeping domains. Ham, this is indeed the common one. I think most of the maids back at the manor took this one. Had I continued there as one among them, that might have been me. Ha, take that, Clara. Bet you didn't get four uncommon options. Oh, right, she died. Shouldn't gloat over the dead. Bad luck, I think. Hey, what are you blanking out for? We need to move. Fayette raised her head to meet an annoyed Olivia. Right, there was a bit of a situation going on. Mire might be in trouble. Need to hurry. Sorry, she answered, then continued moving along the corridor. Class upgrade. Nice options. Look over them as you move. You might need one soon. I think I can hear alarm bells. It's too fast. Fayette nodded, quickened her pace to a brisk jog, then moved to the next class option. Perfectionist maid, after taking extra care to handle all tasks thoroughly with a perfectionist's eye, you will be ready to take perfection to greater heights. A class for maids not satisfied with handling tasks just well enough, a perfectionist maid will ensure her work is thorough. Unlock pursuit of perfection domain. She knew she wouldn't pick it, but seeing the option did fill her with happiness regardless. Her method of work at the manor had not been for naught, she had been on the correct track for something better, an option she would have been happy to choose in a more peaceful future. Sadly, I don't think it'll help me out much in these circumstances. Maybe it could have combat applications. I could notice errors enemies are making or something like that. Feels like a long shot. I guess if the other options don't work, I can return to this. She shelved the option right as she burst out of the corridor, back into the main boiler room. The noise of the alarm bells was louder now. She shut and locked the door behind her and continued on. The next class made her raise an eyebrow. Treacherous maid, you've used the innocent guise of a maid to take your unaware master down. Tired of working for some lousy boss who could really use a dagger between the ribs. Thrilled at the thought of slipping into a retinue unaware of your true nature, then taking them apart. If so, this is the class for you. Unlock treachery domain. Hey. Who are you calling treacherous? I'm a very trustworthy person. All right, my one and only boss may have ended up with a case of melted face, but you can't draw conclusions from such a small selection. Besides, it doesn't count as treachery or betrayal if they deserved it, right? 
Although she felt an instinctual dislike for the class, she forced herself to consider it further. It hinted at subterfuge, deception and assassination, which might prove useful fields. For example, having the class might have made her current mission a lot easier. Sneaking into places and sabotaging them seemed to fit the options purview very well indeed. Still, that wasn't really the type of person Fayette wanted to be. She liked more direct approaches, ones which had her facing enemies directly. She didn't really want stealth to be her main thing. Besides, the class just reeked of trouble. It was just the sort that the church preached against, whisperings of the devil. It did seem suspect, not a class for a virtuous person. Getting inspected with that class would be sure to lead to trouble. Fayette quickly traced a box over her heart, just so the saints above would know she wasn't really considering this one. Hey, I'm not falling to temptation, all right? I'm pious and proper. No sins here. She got to the main factory halls, and onto the next class option. Made of cleansing flames, you've realized that some things can only be truly cleaned through the power of fire. Does the world seem too dirty and debased? in need of a proper cleansing. Do you feel the urge to just torch it all down? Expand your embers to a roaring inferno with this class. Unlock cleansing flames domain. Fayette had to pause for a good moment to consider this one. It felt just as sinful as the last one, maybe even more so. More worryingly, Fayette felt this one actually calling to her. Burning down that mansion had been a lot of fun, to be honest. So had rigging up the bomb here. Wait wait wait, am I actually considering this? I mean, it might actually have some decent combat options, burning foes down into ashes should be effective, right? Could I even unlock the power to burn brick? That would have made this whole factory sabotage thing a lot easier. Besides, was this really another offering of the devil, a temptation she would have to resist? Fayette began searching through her mind. She had not actually paid that close attention to her lessons, the priests, had always tended to drone on in that boring way, so she wasn't too certain whether pyromania even was a sin. Weren't, fire mags, virtuous heroes in the stories? Like, what if I only burned down bad people, and bad buildings? Surely that would be fine. The church wouldn't oppose, right? Hmm, I might need to consult someone on this one. It was the most tempting one so far, so the choice would go to a comparison with the final. Olivia had stopped to return their key to the unconscious, guards, pouch, and rejoined Fayette right as they ran out of the main factory hall, back outside. She had grabbed some papers and other materials to her pouch, things to make their deception more convincing. The hazy smog had cleared a bit, and the outside was now lit clear by moonlight. Fayette felt her heart calm when she saw a plume of smoke coming from the administrative building, just as planned. Mire had succeeded. However, she tensed again when she noticed another plume, this one from further away. Not something they had agreed on. There's no reason she would start another unplanned fire, not unless she's in trouble. Maybe it's a signal for us. She didn't tarry and began running in that direction. Olivia took only a moment to follow. It wasn't a long distance, so Fayette looked over her last option. Combat made, you've found that some trash fights back against attempts to be cleaned, an issue you have found a solution for. Who says a frilly apron and sturdy broom can't efficiently dish out violence? A class for those who know better and want to take their fighting prowess to the next level. Perfect the arts of made combat using this class. Unlock made combat domain. It felt like a good choice, a class that really described her aspirations, and seemed safe. Reliable. It didn't seem dubious like the two before, and seemed to pack enough punch to help her in this career path. No reason anyone should oppose her having this one either. If anything, it might make things easier. I bet they would even let me become a proper hunter at the guild if I picked this one. If that stupid book of theirs doesn't have a combat made as a fighter class, I will tear it in two. Damned book. Still, it was a bit of a more boring option, more conventional. Would she be willing to give up on her dreams of fire for the sake of powering up her physical fighting? Fayette rounded a corner around the building and finally saw the source of the smoke plume. Mire did indeed seem to be in a spot of trouble. She was standing with her back to a storage shed, a squad of guards surrounding her. The semstress was holding a smoking bottle in her hand and waving it at her pursuers. I'm warning you, if you try something, I'll drop this and we'll all be blown to smithereens. You all heard the explosion before, 
but took only one of these, no rash movements. It seemed a clever bluff, but not a decisive one. Fayette knew this situation would need a direct hand, her friend was in trouble, and force was needed. In the end, it was no choice at all. Class upgrade chosen, combat made. Fayette felt her class expanding, strengthening as its potency moved up a tier. It was like an old, ill-fitting garment finally expanding to fit her grown form. You have unlocked the made combat domain. You have gained a new skill, made armor, conditions met, cleaning tool proficiency and maid's poise can be merged into made martial arts. Fayette. Class, combat made, tier 2. Level, 15. Skills. Housekeeping, 3 quarters. Sweep dust, rank 3. Cleaning tool proficiency, rank 3. Spicy cooking, rank 2 attendant, 4 fourths. Maid's poise, rank 3. Cutlery control, rank I. Disarming smile, rank I. Unseen attendant, rank I. Maid combat, 1 quarter. Times, maid armor, rank I. Capstone skills, 0, 1. Not applicable free skills, 3 thirds. Eavesdrop, rank 2, basic alchemy, cleaning agents, rank 2, danger sense, rank 2 unspent skill points, 4. 19. Chapter 37 MMA Brawl. It was a tense standoff. The brick facade guarded Mire's back, but also blocked off any routes of escape, letting her chasers box the Semstress, in. The smog still made the air a tad hazy, but not enough to markedly affect visibility. The plume of smoke let off by the bottle in Mireille's hand snaked off into the sky like a threatening viper, keeping the guards cowed. For now, Fayette knew it wouldn't last. The situation had a certain balance right now, the guards quietly and slowly advancing forward, and Mireille threatening them back. A balance the guards did not mind and Mire could not change. However, the balance was already broken, reinforcements had arrived, the guards just hadn't noticed it quite yet. Once they properly took her and Olivia in, Fayette knew the guards would act. She had one option, act first. A few heads had turned her way already, but it would take a few moments for her entry to properly register. There was no time for an elegant or thought-out plan, leaving only one simple option. Breakthrough. Well, Time for something simple then. She started running forwards, dealing with her leave up as she ran. Skill merges were generally a good opportunity. Merging slots left one free, while still holding the functions of both old skills. She mentally accepted the skill merge. Cleaning tool proficiency 3 and maids poise 3 have been merged into maid martial arts I. Maid martial arts, a broom and skirt are no impediment to battle. Master the many techniques of MMA and prove your superiority over foes. Her steps felt firmer, and her poise grew more ready. Her apron and skirt moved with her legs now, not impeding her steps. She adjusted her broom grip, moving to something more appropriate for a quarterstaff. Good, should make this next part easier. She drew her broom behind herself, ready for a swing. Just like the games she and Mire had used to play, all she was missing was a ball. Mire, throw. By now, the guards, had noticed her, but they were facing the wrong way. Mire was not. It took the, semstress, but a heartbeat to register the command, and act. She didn't hesitate, she trusted Fayette enough. She moved the smoking bottle to her right hand, read it for a proper pitch, and threw, sending the projectile flying over the, guards. Fayette braced for a home run. She wasn't quite sure whether her current skill ranks would be enough for what she was attempting, so she decided to splurge a bit. Skill up, sweep dust has reached rank 4. A, might as well be thorough. Skill up, sweep dust has reached rank 5. HM, no offer for an upgrade to uncommon tier. Guess I'm missing a condition. Fayette didn't really mind, as more important matters were at hand. Mire's throw finally reached her, and her broom hit the bottle, smashing it open, and smoke billowed out. Fayette activated, sweep dust. Smoke is just dust in the air, right? With her added level to the skill, Fayette had felt her control grow. She adjusted her handling on the skill, holding it in a constant sweep-out mode. The smoke that had begun to gather was suddenly thrust away from the broom. The maid swept her broom out in a wide arc, and like a 
painter, with her brush, started working on her canvas. The, guards, that was. The smoke went out in a wide screen, covering the formation wholesale. Coughs and curses sounded out, and visibility for those within was reduced to nil. Fayette grinned. Excellent, part one, the distraction, is complete. Now, for the action. She kept running forward, then checked beside her and saw that Olivia was still with her, following her closely. Fayette had just the right job in mind for her. Olivia, you watch the outside, keep them in the smoke. Olivia nodded, took out her surgeon's knife, then slowed her run. What will you be doing? Fayette shifted her gaze back forward and continued her run straight at the cloud of smoke, extracting Mire. She held out her broom, and prepared for another swipe. Just as she reached the cloud of smoke, she swept from bottom to top, and, sweep dust, did its work. Feeling like the legendary saint, she parted the ocean, and a corridor free of smoke was swept up, revealing Mire. And three, guards. One was blocking off the passage, back to Fayette, while the other two were in the center, advancing on Mire. All right, a simple one, two, three. Let's go. The first, guard, blocking her path took a heartbeat to process the clearing of the smoke, and then began to turn towards the approaching, maid, spear sweeping out towards her. HMPH, too fast for a nice back brooming. Well, Fayette had options. The, guard's, expression bore no nervousness at facing a, maid, armed with a broom. A beginner's mistake. Fayette turned her broom around in her hand, pointing the blunt end at the man, as if preparing for a forward thrust. The man smirked, confident he could block. Fayette did not smirk, though for some reason she felt an urge to do so. The, guard, was preparing for a direct fight, but he did not take note of how the other end of Fayette's broom was subtly trailing the smoke. Here amidst the smoke, she was not just a combatant, she was a painter, and the smoke all around was her palette. Sweep dust. Instead of thrusting forward with her broom, Fayette swept it out sideways, dragging a mote of smoke right into the, guard's, face. His spear jerked, the prepared block skill falling to waste, and his defensive posture broke. Fayette moved closer. Unlocking, made martial arts, had taught her much, and she felt an instinctual knowledge of hand-to-hand -hand combat. She was eager to try it out. Fayette dodged the wildly the swishing spear, thrust her broom between the man's legs, and pushed his upper body forward with her full momentum. A simple lever action, and the man was sent tumbling into the smoke, with a slightly twisted leg. Fayette had not slowed one bit with the encounter, and continued onwards towards Mire. I think I'll call that one the, take out the trash. With one obstacle out the way, she got a better look at Mire's situation. One, guard, was writhing in pain on the ground, while the other was advancing. Somehow, Mire was managing to dodge and weave out of his spear's path. Despite her running start, the, maid, knew every moment of a prolonged fight would also prolong the risks. I need to help Mire now, not when I finally reach her. Luckily, she had a ranged option ready at hand. Cutlery control, rang out, a knife was pulled into her arm, and in one fluid motion, she flicked it at the, guard. The throw flew steady and true, clanging against the man's helmet. No damage, but a distraction at least. The sound made the man twitch, and he turned his head back to find the source just in time for Fayette's second knife to take him in the cheek. It wasn't much in terms of stopping power or damage, but it was enough. A chance, a distraction. As the man shouted out in pain and gritted his teeth, he failed to stop the needle that flashed towards him from the other direction, borrowing into his clothes. The, guards, clothes started to constrict around him, threads winding around in tightening motions, but not quite strong enough. He bent to cut at the threads, to free herself, and sliced apart the seams with his spear. Right in time for Fayette to arrive, he was already bent over, giving Fayette a nice invitation for a brooming. She was getting quite adept at the art. With her, made martial arts, unlocked, her blows carried more weight with them too. She swung her broom, mimicking her earlier home run. His helmet rang out like a bell, and the man crumpled onto the ground. Fayette took a second to stop, breathe, and take in the situation. The last, guard, had been handled by Mire and was not getting up. Fayette did not know quite what had been done to the man, but it did seem rather painful. She raised her gaze and met her friend's eyes, eyes that shone with relief. Mire raised her hand for a greeting. Faye. 
Fayette grabbed it, shifted around, then bolted into a run. Mirai, we need to go. With the other assailants in the smoke, we should be clear for a getaway. She pulled her friend with her, steps synchronizing, and got to the passage in the smoke. She took a breath of relief once inside it, as it took her a step closer to real escape. Fay, one of them can still. Just as Fayette began to register Mireille's words, the smoke shifted right next to her, revealing a sword headed right at her head. Wait, how can he see me? The position was awkward, and she could not bring her broom up in time. In a desperate block, she brought her arm up, bracing for the sword's blow. The sword hit her, made uniform sleeve and then glanced off, as if hitting hard armor. Fayette felt herself smile. Her new skill was better than she had expected. Maid armor, a maid's uniform is her armor. Gain defense proportional to how clean, prim and proper your uniform is. With this skill, you are set for an elegant battle. She had been very careful throughout the engagement, taking care to not touch the smoke at all herself or get any other traces of grime on her uniform. Her uniform had not a spot of dirt on it. Well, except for a trail of smoky black the sword had left on it. Fayette could already feel her defense weakening from it. Better than I expected. Guess it's worth some investment. Skill up, maid armor has reached rank 2. Mireille's eyes widened, and Fayette kept running, dragging the woman along. She hoped the confusion of the smoke would last for a bit longer, enough to make a clean getaway. She heard footsteps as someone stepped out of the smoke, into the passage cleared by her. The one who had just almost gotten her. She got out of the smoke, passage closing behind her, and saw that Olivia had not been idle. The, doctor, was standing guard outside, two heavily bleeding men crumpled by her feet. They were not moving at all. The, doctor, quirked an eye at Fayette. You really managed to get her out of that. Formidable. Fayette intended to keep running, but Mireille, at last, made her stop, tugging the, maid, to a standstill. Faye, we can't run quite yet. Fayette turned back, confused. What do you mean? Mire pointed behind her, at the man who had appeared amidst the smoke. He was tall and built like a bull, heavy armor clanking with every move, and a feathery cap swishing with his head. No ordinary, guard. Fayette knew only important people wore hats with as many feathers on them as this man. She felt her class instinctively bristle, some hollow, missing part reacting to the man. A noble. That guy, he's got some tracking skill on me. I've tried hiding and running but he keeps finding me again and again, probably how he just almost got you to. Fayette tensed, this was getting difficult again, how do we solve that? Olivia can you do that swap thing? Only if we want to move the mark to me instead, the, doctor, said as she stepped beside them, examining the man with a, surgeon's, eye. There is however always one easy way to remove a skill, remove the skill user, you could try to break the limit of the skill otherwise too. Bet this one's distance. Fayette thought for a moment. Their party really was not built for rapid escapes, and she did not see their chance at that as good. She made her decision, nodded, and started digging through her apron of holding. She had just made a fresh batch of all purpose cleaner for this operation, and still had a bomb left too. All right, then we face him. Surely this counts as a situation where it's all right to kill a noble. 20. Chapter 38 No Trash Talk It was a simple task, eliminate one enemy, and Mire would be freed from his ability. Fayette felt annoyed, to be honest. It was like her class was itching just from the presence of a noble. Is being a, maid, with no master really that bad? I should hurry this up. Mire was looking over the scene, and her eyes stopped at the warehouse wall beside them. Faye, did you have an extra explosive left over? I do the one. Can you give it to me? You have an idea? The start of one at least. Fayette quickly dug through her apron of holding, with one hand, while keeping an eye to the situation in front. Their feather-capped pursuer was not making any moves. He seemed happy to let the smoke around his allies dissipate before making any advances on them. He had all the time in the world with his ability after all. Finally, Fayette got her hands on the bottle, and handed it to Mirai. Here, the activation reagents are in the attached pouch. The, Semstress, took the bottled bomb, and began fiddling with it. Three, guards, 
managed to step out of the smoke, coming to stand next to the leading one. He seemed satisfied with his group and took a step forward, sneering at Fayette and the others. What kind of sorry lot is this? A. Eh? Maid, and a few lost girls. You are brave to waste my night with this. Fayette quirked an eyebrow at the man. I'm surprised you are resorting to trash talk, she shouted back. The man smoothed one of the feathers on his helmet as he frowned. What do you mean? Usually, trash can't talk at all, frankly I'm impressed with you. His face reddened, and he took a step forward, gripping his sword tighter. You. That was when Mire threw the bottle. It smoked as it flew in a clear arc, and an explosion blasted out right in the leading, guard's, face, strong enough to crack a hole into the warehouse wall. The other nearby, guards, were lucky to be just a few steps away, and only got thrown onto their backs as, shield, skills activated and broke. The main target though, he just stepped out of the smoke as if nothing had happened, the feathers on his helmet not even one bit scorched. You dare. You dare lay a hand on I, Florinandia, third, guard captain, of Pallone, and grandson of, Lord, Ormont himself. Fayette felt a few jitters at how nonchalant the man was about an explosion right by his face, but kept it from showing on her face. You can't be that important if you're a third, guard captain, she shouted back. Strange, I feel like shouting snide remarks a lot more. Is this part of my, made martial arts? Why you? Fayette tuned out the rest of his yells and turned to Mire. You saw that, right? He took it like it was nothing. Do we have a plan? I'm not sure. I can try something, but you'll have to keep him and the others occupied for a few moments. Think you can manage? Fayette took a quick look at their rapidly reddening target, then turned to Olivia. Can you keep the, guards, off my back for a minute? I'll try to handle him one on one. The, doctor, nodded. That blast got the lot concussed, I should manage. Be careful with the man. My, diagnosis, is not showing many signs of old injuries or ailments on him. He hasn't lost many fights. Fayette turned to eye him again. That just means he lacks experience. She took a step forward, then she started running. The man finally quieted and braced for a defense, sword in hand. A foolish effort, Fayette thought. After all, who would willingly bring a sword to a brim fight? The advantage of long range was quite clear. She used, spicy cooking, as she ran, through the conjured pile of red at her brim head, and activated, sweep dust, at the same time. It was time to give her spice while well mix another try. A vortex formed, and Fayette shifted her broom so it touched the ground, allowing her to gather more and more dust as she approached her target. Two more, guards, stepped free of the smoke, still disoriented by the blast. Fayette didn't look at them, or check her sides to see that her companions were following, she trusted Olivia and Mire enough. Instead, she kept her eyes steadily on her own target, who she decided to name Featherhat for the sake of brevity. Featherhat did not seem nervous, the only emotion he betrayed was scorn, the expression of someone looking at his inherent lessors. Fayette felt just a bit offended, to be honest. As she got closer, she got a closer look at him. The man had a scraggly, unkempt beard, and a uniform stained by spilled ale. His black trousers may have fooled the less keen of eye, but as an experienced, maid, she could see the signs of how long it had gone unwashed. Was he drinking somewhere? And our stunt interrupt his night. Such a man could look at her with scorn, could claim birthright for status, and live a life of debauchery off it. Fayette could not let him win, her pride as a, maid, alone demanded she beat him down. She got close, and flung her spice dust vortex at him, hoping to wipe the sneer of his face. He stepped right through the attack, as if it couldn't touch him one bit. Fayette followed up with a strike at his face, but the man stepped through that too, broom passing through him as if he were a ghost, and raised his sword for a thrust. What kind of ability is this supposed to be? Having stepped through her broom, Featherhat's sword was very close to Fayette's face, but she managed to twist her broom up into a block. The sword however just phased right through it again, continuing at the arm that was now in the way. How am I supposed to fight this? Fayette let it hit her arm, and felt a sting as the blow struck her. Ha! Made armor, held, just barely, and she didn't take a cut. The impact was painful enough on its own. Her sleeve frayed, weakening her defense further, but she managed to hold on to her broom. 
she removed her left hand from the broom, used cutlery control to call a knife into it, and stabbed it at her foe's face. If he decided to get this close to her, she would take the opportunity. The knife neared his face, but then he just stepped right through Fayette altogether. It felt very uncomfortable. Before, the distances had been smaller, so she hadn't really gotten a proper good look at the process, but now she was certain. Movement was the key somehow. He had never just sat still to take a hit, and always moved forward when the blow came. Was it a movement skill then? Not a fast one certainly. It took him a full second to pass through Fayette and emerge on her other side, enough time for Fayette to turn around. He was stepping forward again, this time swinging his sword towards Mire, who had been right behind Fayette. Oh no you don't. He had given Fayette enough time to turn around, and with Fayette came her broom. She hit him on the back, and this time there was no phasing through it, she struck true, and his armor clanged. He shuddered forward for a second, his sword blow went off course, and Mire managed to dive past him, and get through the cracked wall to inside the warehouse. That was what she was after. Feather hat spun around, but Fayette moved over to block the passage into the warehouse. Hey, I'm your opponent here. He snorted. You think your skills can block my relentless pursuit? Fool. Fayette's eyes widened. Did this guy just tell me his ability's name? How dumb is he? Fayette swatted her broom at him in a low blow, careful to keep out of his range, but he didn't advance this time, and only seemed to be playing for time, waiting. Waiting for what? Fayette took a quick glance to the side, and saw that while Olivia had managed to get a few guards to the ground, many more were still on their feet and advancing on her. She would be overwhelmed soon. Feather Hat noticed Fayette's glance and grinned. Getting worried, are you? Throw down your arms and I may let you live. Fayette forced all her growing panic down, and crushed it down into resolve. She could not lose faith now. She felt tempted to run her mouth, but kept quiet. No need to ruin a good surprise. If the man failed to see the significance of letting Mire inside the warehouse that was fine with her. Warehouses in textile mills tended to store one type of thing, and a certain, semstress, had recently received enlightenment on the topic of capes. A cape just like that one that suddenly flew out of the hole, right at the, guard captain's, face. He activated his ability and stepped through it, of course, but it was the thought that counted. Mire. That won't do any good against him. Go help Olivia. I've got this. You sure? All right. Mire crawled back out the hole, this time carrying a veritable trove of different clogs. She took one look at the scene outside, then ran to help Olivia, another piece of cloth flying out to tie down. Guards. Fayette let a bit of smirk show on her face, just enough to rile up her opponent even more. His face was dark, and Fayette could already see him preparing his ability for a dash forward. Fayette obliged, and thrust forward with an easily predictable brim hit. He began phasing through it, appeared on Fayette's other side, then began dashing for Mire at full speed. A bit too fast for Fayette to catch up, which was why she had already gotten out a bottle full of her, all-purpose cleaner. She threw the small bottle at him, praying that her deduction was right. He's already moving towards Mire his target. If I oppose his pursuit, he can phase through. What about if I help him along? He didn't phase through this time either. The bottle struck true, hit him on the head, burst open, and the all-purpose cleaner was sent spraying out, a good bit dripping on his exposed nape. It began sizzling, and he screamed, stopping his mad dash. Fayette went for the chase, already gathering a new vortex of spice and dust on her broom. Sadly, he only slowed a bit. He had already gotten some bottle of his own out, and he threw a dash of the red liquid on his nape, healing the injuries. Fayette cursed. Potions, of course. Damned rich folk. He took a look behind him, frowned at Fayette's approach, and began circling to the side. Is he trying to put Mire behind me again? No no, not a chance at that. Mire, stay behind this guy. We need to keep him between us. The, semstress, was rather busy tying up guards, with a fluttering of capes, but did manage to move in the direction Fayette indicated. Enough targets in that direction too. A flash of indecision went through Featherhat's face, as he looked between the semstress, who was rapidly tying down his guards, and the maid, who was approaching him. He gritted his teeth, then turned fully to Fayette. 
Fayette felt a barrier break with her next step, and a force set over her. Trespasser Ward, Mark Trespasser, dot. Oh, he's abandoning Mireille and targeting me now, fine with me. Fayette held her broom low, kept running at him, and kept expanding her spice dust vortex. Feather Hat took up his sword for a guard pose, and readied himself. Fayette got close, thrust the vortex at him, and he began phasing through it. Then Fayette pulled the vortex back to right in front of her, and held it in place. Previously, she had thrown it, letting Feather Hat pass right through, but now she made a gamble. The spice and dust was striking her too, and her, made armor, disappeared in an instant, as the grime took to her apron. What's your play now then? Can't exactly pass through this if you aim to pursue me. His play turned out to be, well, nothing. He materialized back fully, right in the middle of the vortex, and struck his sword forward. The sword grazed Fayette's thigh, cutting through cloth to draw a deep line of blood. Fayette winced at the pain, but then Feather had started to scream. His nape had been healing from the all-purpose cleaner, but blisters still remained, which made the spice getting into them hurt quite a bit. Well, so did the eyes, nose and other spots too. He was stuck there now, right in the center of the dust and spice as it roiled and raged against his skin. Fayette smiled, then threw a fork at his eye. He roared out in pain, and collapsed to his knees, bringing up his hands to shield his face. His sword clattered down to the ground. Him kneeling had brought his face temptingly low, and it had been some time since Fayette had felt noble face on her boots. She held the broom and vortex in place, braced her bleeding thigh, loaded up a kick with her right foot, and smashed it right at his head. He collapsed down. Fayette moved the broom down, letting the spices grind against his exposed skin, then kept stomping on his he, heedless of the sting she felt on her own wound. His struggling didn't last long, and when he fell limp, Fayette stopped her, sweep dust. She bent down, taking a knife out of her apron. Surprisingly, he was still conscious. One eye blinked open, taking in Fayette's approach. His raspy voice had none of the earlier sneer to it now. It was a quiet, strenuous thing. P please, I can pay dash. Fayette blocked his mouth with a finger and bent down lower, kneeling on top of him. Shush, quiet now. Thanks for giving away the details of your ability, fool. You should have heeded my words, trash has no place talking. She plunged the knife in his neck, one final finishing strike, and pleading turned to gargles of blood. One piece of trash cleared, nice job. Progress towards next level, 40%. She spent a second enjoying the sensation of knife-splitting flesh, then realized the outside world had gotten quite quiet. Oh, right, there was a whole other fight going on. She raised her head up, and saw a field full of collapsed and struggling, guards, bound in thread or cloth. She also saw the stares she was receiving from Mirai and Olivia, who were standing right by her side. She carefully turned to them, this was a situation where it was all right to kill a noble, right? Two sighs answered her. Well, it depends. Olivia asked. How fast can you run? 18. Chapter 39 The Doctor Smiles Next. Olivia Nightingale had been living a relatively repetitive life for a good while. There was a flow to it, she would move to a new place, establish her practice in a place she could find patience, aid people for a while and earn a modest living, make attempts at furthering her knowledge through any means necessary, then run once authorities started to get wind of her, or when public sentiment started to turn. One had to be observant with such things, being chased out of a village by a pitchfork-wielding mob was not the most pleasant thing. Thus, one could call her rather experienced in the art of making a quick getaway. Six years of experience had made it routine. She hadn't stayed in one place for over three months since she was sixteen. Thus, as she looked on her current circumstances, Olivia was not at all surprised to once again find herself running as fast as her feet could take her, hopping over fences and ducking behind alleyways peering behind to see whether any, guards, were on her track. It hadn't taken her long to organize her allies for a quick getaway. She had helped douse Fayette's wound with a healing potion, knocked the more awake, guards, on the head a bit to help them forget, then spotted a nice out-of-the-way fence corner, beside which some handy crates had been placed. It was a quick up and over, and then they were in the streets. Moving through them was easier, 
she had the experience of many different escapades to lean back on. This time, however, things were different. First, she was not only keeping track of herself as she slowly made her way through the city, but she was also guiding her compatriots along. Compatriots, she could scarcely believe it. How long has it been since I've worked with somebody else? Ever since the old man got himself killed, it's just been me all alone, and my patients. Those don't tend to stick around, though. Maybe finding company was part of why she felt herself smiling. That was the second surprising thing about this getaway. Usually her getaways were a melancholy, sad thing, heavy steps weighed down by her work's futility, just another inevitable part of life's cycle. Now though, her steps had a spring to them. She felt she had finally accomplished something worthwhile, something concrete. Olivia was practiced at stealth and escape, so she only had to devote half her mind to it. She dipped behind cover, checked corners, motioned her comrades forward, all almost purely by instinct. Her actual thoughts were focused inwards, on contemplation. These strange circumstances she found herself in gave her a lot to ponder. She didn't know the two women she was leading through the city that well to be honest, they had scarcely known each other longer than a day and a night. Still, she felt a new kind of connection there. The bonds of teammates, forged through trials of blood. Together, they had plotted an audacious plan, had the courage to attempt it, and so far, they had actually succeeded. As they made their way through the city, Olivia kept glancing behind her, eyes wandering to her new comrades. Yes, she had to make sure they were keeping up with her practice techniques of urban escape, but in truth, her eye was on them much more than it needed to be. She wanted to know, were they feeling the same elation she was? What emotions hid under those facades? The, semstress, was somewhat hard to judge. Her face didn't betray much expression, as her eyes and mouth were stretched to a grim countenance, hiding what was really going on behind them. However, as Olivia tracked her more minute movements, she could sense some of the hidden emotion. The way the woman's head kept glancing this way and that, nervousness. The way her hands were tightly wound into fists, excitement. The way her steps carried her, confident and head held high, triumph. The, maid, seemed a simpler sort, one more concerned with the moment than the big picture. She grimaced at the dirt on her uniform, she smirked at the factory behind them, and she frowned at the grimy streets she was running through. Above it all though were those moments when her gaze would focus on something intangible and far away, and a savage grin would overtake her face. Evidently, the, maid, was feeling it too, the thrill of success. What are you spacing out for? Are we getting close? Olivia snapped back to reality, and focused back on the, semstress, who was huffing at her. Right, they had achieved most of their goals, and now came the other critical part of every plot, getting away with it. We're almost there, it seems like we've lost them. She replied and moved forward, ducking behind the next street corner. That was close. They almost saw me smiling like a silly fool. Focus, Olivia. The operation isn't finished before the patient is safely back at home. She peeked behind the next street corner, then ducked back behind a box, motioning for her allies to hide. They joined her as she silently counted to five, after which a procession of guards rushed through the street, past them. Seems like word is finally starting to get out. We need to hurry. Won't be long now. She looked behind her, saw Mireille and Fayette obediently huddled down, and signaled for them to wait. She then crept back to the corner, peeked over, and this time motioned for the others to follow. It was only a few blocks more to her clinic, and she felt her steps being pushed forward by her team, growing faster, firmer and above all, more confident. Usually, scurrying away would have her feeling like a cornered rat, but now she too strutted with pride. Perhaps still somewhat like a rat, but this time like one who had managed to eat her way through a cheese storage. A soldier returning from victory. She got to the final stretch, saw it was free of watches, saw her clinic, then rushed for the final bit. Mireille and Fayette also sped up, now sprinting by her side as if it was a race. Olivia almost laughed. She got to the door first, burst through, and then things got hectic. A nervous Elise bounded out of her bed seeming a lot healthier already. Good, looks like she's healthy enough to move. Fayette ran to the, laborers, side, and evolved into an excited chatter, while Mireille collapsed onto the floor, panting with exhaustion. Elise, we did it. Really, are you? 
Olivia tuned out the chatter and got to packing. She had a lot of tools and would not leave anything behind. To an outside observer, her clinic may have looked like a cluttered mess, which was because it really was a cluttered mess. Somehow Olivia still had a knack for finding everything she needed, when she needed it. She moved like a whirlwind, taking out bags and filling them with her tools and tonics, slowly working her way through the room. Her packing was so furious and efficient that it took the others out of their stupor too, and three gazes turned to her. Ah, uh, Olivia, Mireille carefully asked, why are you packing in such a hurry? Olivia stopped for a brief second, and turned to her. What, did you think we were in the clear already? We aren't, we run quite a bit didn't we? Fayette asked, you killed a noble, apparently a grandson of the big, lord, himself. Do you think he'll let that pass in his own city? What's he going to do about it? Olivia gave the, maid, a blank stare. Lord, Ormont is supposedly over level 50, and we are all still inside the bounds of his city. Do you know what kinds of abilities a high level, lord, and his, investigators, and what not have? Fayette shook her head. Do you want to find out? She shook her head again. Then trust me, we do not want to be anywhere near here when they finally wake him up. Before you know it, we'll be down in the dungeon, drugged, get our nails pulled off, interrogated. All right, all right, point taken, Mire said, rising up back to her feet. So, we have to get out of here, fast as possible. Faye, you've got our stuff in that bag of holding, right? It's an apron of holding, but yes. But, what about the guild, do we need to tell them about the quest? What guild quest? Mire shouted. You're not even doing any guild quests. There's a citywide search for us, why are you thinking about some guild quest? Oh, yeah, I suppose you're right. W will I be alright? Elise asked, clutching her side as she paced. Will they come after me and my family? Olivia went back to packing. You should get out of this clinic as fast as possible at least. If you lay low at your home for a few weeks, you'll probably be fine. Maybe. Hopefully. Olivia finished putting away the lasts of her tonics, hefted her bags up, then turned to look at her new allies. Fayette had somehow managed to get her uniform almost clean, some bits of spice still stuck and a cut at the side, and Mire was busy checking through the, maid's, apron to see that everything was with them. Olivia took a deep breath. She had never gotten into a situation like this before, so she really wasn't sure how to phrase her question. Well, I guess I'll just be direct. Hey, you two. This whole factory operation, I like doing it. I think we did a good job here. Are you two going to do more things like this in the future? Mire frowned and began to open her mouth, but Fayette made it first. Of course we are, she shouted, raising her brim up. How could I become the ultimate, maid, if I ignored things like this? Though, mainly we're going to be hunters, but if a situation comes up, she whirled her brim around, switching it to a combat pose. I'll beat any enemies of, maids, down, right, Mire? The Semstress, sighed. Well, I guess we are then. I doubt I could stop her if I tried. Olivia closed her eyes for a moment, and gathered her resolve. A career as a hunter, huh? I guess that could be nice for a change. This country could use a more direct hand to guide these things, enough with being reactive. She grabbed her flask, took a swig, opened her eyes, then looked into Fayette's. They were outwardly a cool emerald green, but deeper within, she saw a fire. A fire burning with indignity, ready to lash out at the wrongs of the world. Oliva felt her own heart stirring, rising up from the gloom it had been stuck in for so long. Well, would you like to take a, doctor, along? Two's hardly a party, right? Fayette's eyes widened, and a smile returned to her lips. Olivia realized that she too was smiling. New party member gained, Olivia Nightingale. Class, gutter doctor. Level. 17. Skills. Medicine, 3 quarters. Comprehensive diagnosis, rank I, basic alchemy, remedies, rank 3, basic herbology, rank 3 surgery, 4 fourths. Bloodletting, rank 4, sterile touch, rank 3, numb pain, rank I, bone cutter, rank I hypocritical oath, 1 quarter. Transfer condition, 
Rank 2 Capstone Skills, 0, 0. Not Applicable Free Skills, 3 thirds. Sneak, Rank 3, Forge Documents, Rank 2, Resist Poison, Rank I. 15.